Good morning. Before we get started, due to unforeseen circumstances, Dr. Al notified us that he cannot participate in today's advisory committee meeting. Dr. Carvalho will be the acting chairperson for today's meeting. I will now turn it over to Dr. Carvalho. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, I would first like to remind everyone to please mute your line when you're not speaking. Slide two, please. For media and press, the FDA press contact is April Grant, and her email is currently displayed. Slide three, please. My name is Dr. Paula Carvalho, and I'll be chairing this meeting, and I will now call the November 17th, 2023 Pulmonary Allergy Drugs Advisory Committee meeting to order. Dr. Takia Stevenson is the designated federal officer for this meeting, and we'll be begin with introductions. Good morning. My name is Takia Stevenson, and I'm the designated federal officer for this meeting. When I call your name, please turn on your camera, unmute, and introduce yourself by saying your name and affiliation for the record. We will first start with the standing committee members. Dr. Bakaria. Good morning, Dr. Leonard Bakaria, Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Dr. D'Agostino. Good morning, Dr. D'Agostino, the consumer representative. I am a patient advocate with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and a medical writer with Bold Science. Dr. Evans. Good morning. Um, this is Scott Evans from uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Dr. Garibaldi. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Brian Garibaldi from Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Dr. Hamblett. Good morning, Nicole Hamblett from the University of Washington and Seattle Children's Hospital. Dr. Kim. Good morning, Edwin Kim from the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. Dr. Rank. Morning, Matt Rank from Mayo Clinic in Arizona. I will now introduce our non-voting industry representative, Dr. Carlson. Hi, I'm Don Carlson, industry representative, Abby. Thank you. I will now move on to our temporary voting members, Dr. Carvalho. I'm Paula Carvalho, University of Washington. Dr. Kuhn. Good morning, I'm Cheryl Kuhn. I'm a clinical outcome assessment researcher and psychometrician at Critical Path Institute. Dr. Corey. Good morning, I'm Mark Corey. I am an otolaryngologist from Mount Sinai Health System. Dr. Hansberger. Sally Hansberger, I'm a biostatistician at NIAD, NIH. Dr. Kelso. Good morning, I'm uh, John Kelso. I'm an allergist at Scripps Clinic in San Diego. Ms. Schwarzat. Hello, I'm Jennifer Schwarzat and I'm your patient representative. Thank you. I will now continue to the FDA participants. Dr. Seymour. Good morning. My name is Sally Seymour. I'm the director of the Division of Pulmonology, Allergy, and Critical Care in the Office of Immunology and Inflammation at the FDA. Dr. Karimi Shaw. Good morning. Uh, my name is Banu Karimi Shah, and I'm the deputy director of the same division as Dr. Seymour. Dr. Chin. Good morning. My name is Stacey Chin. I'm a clinical team leader in the same division. Dr. Bean. 
Good morning. My name is Rachel Bean. I'm a medical officer in the same division. Dr. Zhang. Good morning. My name is Weiya Zhang, um, supervisory mathematical statistician from the Division of Biometric 3, Office of Biostatistics, CDER FDA. Dr. Kim. Good morning, my name is Yang Lian Kim. I'm a statistical team leader in the same division. Dr. Maya. Good morning, I am Susan Mayo, a statistical, um, uh, a mathematical statistician in the same division. Thank you, I will hand it back to the chairperson. Thank you. Uh, for the topics such as those being discussed at this meeting, there are often a variety of opinions, some of which are quite strongly held. Our goal is that this meeting will be a fair and open forum for discussion of these issues and that individuals can express their views without interruption. Thus, as a general reminder, individuals will be allowed to speak into the record only if recognized by the chairperson, and we look forward to a productive meeting. In the spirit of the Federal Advisory Committee Act and the Government of the Sunshine Act, we ask that the advisory committee members take care that their conversations about the topic at hand take place in the open forum of the meeting. We are aware that members of the media are anxious to speak with the FDA about these proceedings. However, the FDA will refrain from discussing, discussing the details of this meeting with the media until its conclusion. Also, the committee is reminded to please refrain from discussing the meeting topic during breaks or lunch. Thank you. Dr. Stevenson will now read the conflict of interest statement for the meeting. The Food and Drug Administration, FDA, is convening today's meeting of the Pulmonary Allergy Drugs Advisory Committee under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA of 1972. With the exception of the industry representative, all members and temporary voting members of the committee are special government employees or regular federal employees from other agencies and are subject to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of, of interest laws covered by, but not limited to those found at 18 USC section 208 is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. FDA has determined that members and temporary voting members of this committee are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 USC section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant waivers to special government employees and regular federal employees who have potential financial conflicts when it is determined that the agency's need for a special government employee's services outweighs their potential Conflict of a financial conflict of interest or when the interest of a regular federal employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Related to the discussions of today's meeting, members and temporary voting members of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflicts of interest of their own as well as those imputed to them including those of their spouse or minor children, and for purposes of 18 USC section 208, their employers. These interests may include investments, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts, grants, credas, teaching, speaking, writing, patents and royalties, and primary employment. Today's agenda involves a discussion of new drug application NDA 215010 for gapropixin oral tablets submitted by Merck Sharp and Dome Corp for the proposed indication of treatment of adults with refractory or unexplained chronic cough. This is a particular matters meeting during which specific matters related to Merck Sharp and Dome's NDA will be discussed. Based on the agenda for today's meeting and all financial interests reported by the committee members and temporary voting members, no conflict of interest waivers have been issued in connection with this meeting. To ensure transparency, we encourage all standing committee members and temporary voting members to disclose any public statements that they have made concerning the product at issue. With respect to FDA's invited industry representative, we would like to disclose that Dr. Dawn Carlson is participating as a non-voting industry representative acting on behalf of regulated industry. 
Uh, the Carlson's role at this meeting is to represent industry in general and not any particular company. Uh, the Carlson is employed by AbbVie. We would like to remind members and temporary voting members that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already on the agenda for which an FDA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to exclude themselves from such involvement and their exclusion will be noted for the record. FDA encourages all participants to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with the firm at issue. Thank you, and I will turn it back to the chairperson. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. And we will now proceed with the FDA opening remarks from Dr. Stacy Chin. Good morning and welcome to the FDA Pulmonary Allergy Drugs Advisory Committee meeting. My name is Stacy Chin. I am a clinical team leader in the Division of Pulmonology, Allergy and Critical Care within the Office of New Drugs. Thank you to members of the committee, the public and the applicant for taking the time to discuss the new drug application for gefepixant for the treatment of refractory or unexplained chronic cough. Next. Gefepixant is an oral P2X3 antagonist that is a new molecular entity. The proposed indication is for the treatment of adults with refractory or unexplained chronic cough at a dosage of 45 milligrams twice daily. Next. This simplified diagram depicts the cough reflex arc. Although cough can be volitional under cognitive control, cough is typically a protective reflex initiated by various stimuli, such as mechanical or chemical, that activate sensory vagal nerve fibers in the airway mucosa, which convey the information to the brainstem. The brain then generates an efferent signal to motor nerves in the expiratory musculature to produce cough. The underlying pathophysiology of refractory or unexplained chronic cough is still being investigated, but is thought to be related to the heightened sensitivity of the cough reflex that is triggered by low levels of stimulation. P2X3 is one of many types of sensory receptors on the vagus nerve that respond to noxious stimuli, and thus antagonism with a product such as gefepixant may potentially suppress cough. Next. Chronic cough is typically distinguished from acute and subacute cough by a duration lasting greater than eight weeks. It is a common condition primarily affecting older adult females. The natural history isn't well characterized, but symptoms often persist for years and some patients have relapsing remitting symptoms. Next. While chronic cough is often associated with an underlying condition, the proposed indication is targeting patients who have cough that is refractory to treatment or cough that has no obvious cause. Both fall under the umbrella of chronic cough, a term that FDA will use for simplicity. Unfortunately, chronic cough has limited treatment options, none of which are approved. FDA recognizes that chronic cough is a condition that can have substantial impacts on quality of life and that there's an unmet need for safe and effective therapies. Gefepixant is the first application to be reviewed by FDA for this indication. As such, there is no established precedent for study design or study endpoints, nor prior experience with interpreting efficacy results. Next. The sources of clinical data in the Gefepixant program are shown here. Next. The 52-week randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled pivotal trials, P30 and P27, shown in the red box, will be the focus of the presentations and discussion today. The trials evaluated approximately 2,000 adults with refractory or unexplained chronic cough and included three treatment arms, gefepixant 45 milligrams, 15 milligrams, and placebo, all administered twice daily. The primary endpoints were 24-hour cough frequency assessed by the Vitalijak cough counting system at week 24 in P30 and week 12 in P27. Next. As will be discussed in later presentations, 
FDA considers the validated recount costs to be the appropriate data for the primary efficacy analysis, and that is the data shown here. The primary endpoint results highlighted in the shaded blue rows and red boxes demonstrated a relative reduction in the geometric mean ratio of 24-hour cough frequency with gefepixant. While the point estimate is similar, only one of the two trials reaches statistical significance. Next. However, a relative reduction in a geometric mean ratio is inherently difficult to understand, and the large placebo response resulted in a small treatment difference in coughs per hour. Next. This small treatment difference becomes more apparent when looking at the absolute cough frequency, which is more intuitive. Next. Here, we note the high baseline variability in coughs per hour, and again, the large placebo response. Next. And this translates to a small reduction in absolute cough frequency in the gefepixant group compared to placebo, with a difference in the change from baseline of only one to two coughs per hour based on descriptive statistics. Next. For the multiplicity-controlled secondary endpoints, awake cough frequency results mirror those of the primary endpoint. The only patient-reported outcome endpoint in the hierarchy was a responder analysis of the Lester Cough Questionnaire, or LCQ, total score in trial P30. Although this result was statistically significant, there are concerns about the meaningfulness of the 1.3 point or more threshold and concerns about the LCQ instrument itself. With a large placebo response, the remaining endpoints failed to reach statistical significance. Next. The applicant captured additional PRO secondary endpoints that were not controlled for multiplicity. As such, these endpoints are considered exploratory in nature. Even though there appear to be small differences between treatment groups, there are limitations to the interpretability of these results. This topic will be discussed further in the presentations you'll hear later today. Next. Regarding safety, the main risk identified with the proposed 45 milligram dose of gefepixant are disturbances in taste. This adverse reaction was common with a rapid onset. While generally mild and reversible, taste disturbances did impact tolerability in the trial, leading to early treatment discontinuation. This is a fact that must be considered for a chronically dosed drug. Next. In summary, the key findings observed in the pivotal trials were a wide variability in baseline cough, a high placebo response, this led to a small reduction in the primary endpoint of cough frequency relative to placebo with a statistically significant result in one of the two trials. There was a small effect on some PRO endpoints, and the safety profile is notable for frequent but reversible disturbances in taste. Next. Acknowledging that the pivotal trial results show small treatment differences in cough frequency reduction and PRO endpoints, the main issue for discussion by the committee today is whether these results are clinically meaningful. We are uncertain if patients will perceive such a small reduction in coughs per hour, and the interpretation is further complicated by the lack of an established threshold for what is considered a meaningful reduction in cough to patients. Next. Looking to the other efficacy endpoints, it's unclear that the PROs provide compelling evidence that the small reduction in cough is meaningful. We note that the treatment differences are small, that the clinically meaningful improvements in score for each PRO have not been established. There are concerns about the LCQ instrument and that this is the only PRO endpoint that this was statistically significant. And finally, that none of the other PRO endpoints were controlled for multiplicity in the statistical testing hierarchy and are therefore exploratory. Next. Finally, given the common and rapid occurrence of taste disturbances with gefepixant, we are concerned that this could be a potential source of unblinding 
introducing additional uncertainty to the small treatment effect. Next. With those issues in mind, I'd like to review the statute and regulations that apply to FDA's approval process. The regulations require there to be substantial evidence of a drug's effectiveness to support an approval as shown here. We note that totality of evidence does not appear in regulations. Next. Substantial evidence of effectiveness is generally interpreted as requiring two or more adequate and well-controlled clinical investigations, each convincing on its own to establish effectiveness, or in other words, independent substantiation. It is well established that the effects must be clinically meaningful and that statistical significance alone will not suffice. This is the standard expectation for chronic cough development programs. Next. One of the issues we will be asking the committee to consider and discuss later on this afternoon is the benefit risk assessment for gefepixant. In this slide, we provide a diagram of how FDA approaches the benefit risk framework. We acknowledge that at times there may be a tension between the FDA's benefit risk assessment, which takes into account the intended patient population as a whole versus the individual assessment that a healthcare provider and a patient may make. In this framework, we consider the therapeutic context, such as the rarity and severity of the condition, the landscape of available therapies, approved and off-label, and the evidence submitted in a marketing application to assess the benefits and the risks. Next. In the benefit risk assessment, we must first start with benefit. We consider the nature of the benefit, is it curative or disease altering, or is it symptomatic improvement? We must also consider the magnitude and the persuasiveness of the evidence supporting a benefit. Finally, and most importantly, we must ask ourselves if the benefit is clinically meaningful. Next. If the answer is yes, we then turn to an assessment of the risks and uncertainties, factoring in the severity of the risks and what amount of risk and uncertainty are acceptable based on the therapeutic context. Based on this, we determine if the demonstrated benefit outweighs the risks and any residual uncertainty about those benefits and risks. If this is the case, our assessment of benefit risk is favorable. However, if it's determined that there's not a clinically meaningful benefit, a product can only confer risks, even if the risks are mild in severity leading to an unfavorable benefit risk assessment. Next. I will now conclude the opening remarks with a preview of the discussion points and voting question that we would like the committee to keep in mind as we hear the presentations this morning. Discussion point one, discuss the evidence of effectiveness for gefepixant for the treatment of refractory or unexplained chronic cough in adults. Specifically address the following the small reduction in cough frequency compared to placebo and the clinical meaningfulness of the reduction in cough frequency, the observed results from PROs, and whether these results provide compelling evidence to inform the clinical meaningfulness of the reduction in cough frequency, potential and blinding of patients due to taste disturbance and its impact on interpretation of cough frequency and PRO results. Next. Discussion point two, discuss, discuss the overall benefit risk assessment of gefepixant for the treatment of adults with refractory or unexplained chronic cough, a symptomatic condition. Next. And the final voting question, does the evidence demonstrate that gefepixant provides a clinically meaningful benefit to adult patients with refractory or unexplained chronic cough given the small reduction in cough frequency and results from PROs. We ask that you provide a rationale for your vote. If you conclude that there is insufficient evidence of a clinically meaningful benefit, describe the evidence that could be collected to show a benefit that is clinically meaningful. Next. This concludes the FDA opening remarks. Thank you for your attention. I will now hand the meeting back over to the chair, Dr. Carvalho. Thank you, Dr. Chen.
Both the Food and Drug Administration and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the advisory committee meeting, the FDA believes that it's important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, the FDA encourages all participants, including the applicant's non-employee presenters, to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with the applicant, such as consulting fees, travel expenses, honoraria, and interests in the applicant, including equity interests and those based upon the outcome of the meeting. Likewise, the FDA encourages you at the beginning of your presentation to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address the, this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your presentation, it will not preclude you from speaking. And now we will proceed with the Merck Sharp and Domes LLC's presentation. Good morning, members of the Pulmonary Allergy Drugs Advisory Committee and members of the FDA. I'm Lisa Bollinger, Vice President, Global Regulatory Affairs at Merck. I will be introducing Merck's presentation on our new molecular entity, Jeffapixent. Jeffapixent is a P2X3 receptor antagonist developed by Merck for the treatment of refractory and unexplained chronic cough. For much of the presentation, we will refer to refractory chronic cough as RCC and unexplained chronic cough as UCC. RCC is defined as a chronic cough lasting for longer than eight weeks that persists despite optimal treatment of any underlying conditions. And UCC is a cough that persists for longer than eight weeks for which no underlying etiology has been identified despite a complete medical evaluation. RCC and UCC are serious diseases. Chronic cough has a prevalence of approximately 5% in the US adult population and a subset of approximately 5 to 10% of those patients presenting for care have RCC, UCC. Most patients are women over the age of 50 and these patients suffer a high disease burden with impact on their physical, social and psychological well-being. Female patients may have the added burden of cough-induced stress urinary incontinence. There are no FDA-approved treatments. I'd like to take a minute to walk you through the regulatory timeline leading up to today's meeting. In June of 2017, Merck had an end of phase two meeting to reach agreement with the FDA on our phase three development program. In March of 2018, two pivotal studies, Protocols 27 and 30, were initiated. These are the first large randomized controlled studies ever conducted in RCC-UCC. In July of 2020, Merck had a pre-NDA meeting where we were informed that the development program appeared adequate to support a new drug application, or NDA, for Jeffapixent. And in December of 2020, Merck submitted that application for review. In January of 2022, Merck received a complete response letter or CRL from the FDA. The CRL was based on the FDA's assessment that the cough counting system required additional validation. Merck addressed these concerns regarding the cough counting system and also performed additional analysis for the Lester Cough Questionnaire, or LCQ. You'll hear more about this in a following presentation. In the intervening period, Jeffapixent was approved in Japan, Switzerland, and Europe. Merck has resubmitted the application and did that in June of 2023. The Vitalijack system consists of a digital sound recording device, a compression algorithm, and trained cough analysts. The recording device captures sound from two different microphones. One is a lapel microphone, like the type you might see a TV reporter wearing, and the other is a contact microphone that is like the head of a stethoscope attached to the chest wall. 
The compression algorithm can operate in one of two ways. First, it compresses by removing non-cough sounds using both microphones, also called dual channel. And the second way uses just the chest wall microphone, which is called single channel. You can see in the middle box on the right, an illustration showing portions of an audio file that could be removed or compressed, resulting in a shorter file for counting. The cough analysts use these compressed recordings to determine the 24 hour cough counts. Regardless of which compression method is used, the cough analysts use both of the files from both microphones to do this count. The development program for Jeffapixin included 19 phase one studies, three phase two studies, and two pivotal phase three studies. Merck also completed two phase three B studies shown here in pink. The results of this extensive clinical development program that included over 3,000 patients has demonstrated the clinically meaningful treatment effect greater than placebo and the safety of Jeffapixin. This is the agenda for the rest of Merck's presentation today. And here are the subject matter experts that are available to answer your questions. And now I'll hand it over to Dr. Dispenengaitis. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Dispengaitis. I'm a professor of medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and a pulmonary critical care physician at Montefiore Medical Center in New York. I'm also the, the director of the Montefiore Cough Center, one of the few specialty cough centers in the United States. For over 25 years, I've been very active in both treating patients with chronic cough and in doing cough-related clinical research. Today, I'm pleased to discuss chronic cough as a distinct condition and to describe the unmet need of our patients with RCCUCC. I'm a paid consultant of the sponsor, but I have no financial interest in the outcome of this meeting. Cough is an important protective airway defense mechanism that's initiated by sensory nerve activation in the airway. Cough helps remove mucus from the airway and prevents foreign material from entering the lungs. Cough is also stimulated by inhaled chemical irritants. Importantly, cough can present as a key symptom of many acute and chronic conditions. Unfortunately, in some people, the cough reflex itself becomes dysregulated, causing cough to be triggered by low-level or inoculous stimuli that should not normally induce cough. Over the last decade, we've learned a lot about the neurophysiology of cough. We know that there are two main types of sensory nerve fibers involved in the cough reflex, the A-delta fibers and the C-fibers. A-delta fibers are responsive to mechanical stimulation of the airway surface, including by mucus or by inhaled foreign material. C fibers are responsive to chemical stimuli, with, including signaling molecules or inflammatory mediators within the airway, or by other irritant agents such as capsaicin, which we stimulate, use to stimulate cough in our laboratory studies. C fibers can sense many types of chemical stimuli by a number of receptors, as shown here in the figure, including P2X3. Within the airway, in situations of stress, inflammation, or injury, ATP is released from bronchial epithelial cells. Extracellular ATP can then bind to pure energic receptors known as P2X recept P2X3 receptors. These P2X receptors are ion channels that are found selectively on C fibers and not on the mechanically sensitive A delta fibers. When ATP binds to P2X receptors on airway C fibers, this generates an ATP cough signal. Interestingly, P2X receptors are also found on the gustatory nerve endings in the taste buds on the tongue, where ATP serves as a signaling molecule of taste sensations. Jeffapixant is a P2X3 antagonist that prevents ATP from opening the ion channels, thus inhibiting the cough impulse by the C fibers. By inhibiting the ATP cough signal, Jeffapixant reduces cough, leading to the benefit in the clinical studies conducted in patients with RCCUCC, which you'll see later. Chronic cough in adults is defined by the American College of Chest Physicians or CHEST cough guidelines as a cough lasting greater than eight weeks. Chronic cough of any cause has a prevalence of about 5% as demonstrated in population-based studies in the United States. The RCC-UCC population is a subset of patients with chronic cough, representing approximately 5 to 10% of chronic cough patients. The CHEST guidelines also describe the negative impact these conditions have on quality of life and recognize the need for effective treatment options. The clinical approach to RCCUCC has been provided in the guidelines. 
When evaluating a patient with chronic cough, the physician's primary task is to identify and treat potential underlying reversible causes of chronic cough. The paradigm that we physicians have been following for decades is, if you have a patient who's a non-smoker, who's not on medications that cause cough, mainly the ACE inhibitors, has no relevant signs on physical exam, and does not have evidence of active disease on chest x-ray, then it's likely that that patient's chronic cough is due to one or more of three underlying etiologies. The first relates to eosinophilic airway inflammation, which includes asthma and non-asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis. The second is upper airway cough syndrome, previously known as postnasal drip syndrome, often related to nasal or sinus disease. And the third is gastroesophageal reflux. Unfortunately, in some patients, the chronic cough persists despite a thorough evaluation and appropriate empiric treatment trials against the potential underlying causes. These patients are then classified as having refractory chronic cough, RCC, or classified as having unexplained chronic cough, UCC. The 2020 European Respiratory Society guidelines also provide a recommended clinical approach to chronic cough, as well as a description of RCC and UCC. Although RCC UCC patients can be heterogeneous, in practice we see a rather uniform clinical presentation. The cough is invariably either completely dry or minimally productive, and our patients tell us that their cough is caused by triggers that don't make other people cough. For example, chemical fumes, such as household detergents or perfumes, or cigarette smoke. These patients also cough due to triggers that can stress the airway, but don't normally cause cough, such as laughing or singing or talking on the telephone. Very often patients describe a frequent or even continuous feeling of a tickle or a scratch in the throat, or a constant sensation of mucus in the throat causing an urge to cough sensation, as if a cough is always imminent. Patients describe these sensations as being particularly troublesome. The clinical phenotype in these patients raises the concept of dysregulation of the cough reflex. Compared to other respiratory diseases that have been studied, patients with RCC-UCC, as enrolled in the phase three studies, had an extremely high burden of cough with a median of about 500 coughs per day at baseline. Although cough can now be measured objectively with a cough counting system, it remains a research tool that is not used in clinical practice. And it's important to note that it's not just cough frequency, but cough severity that contributes to the burden in these patients. Cough severity incorporates not only cough frequency, but also cough intensity, as well as disruption to daily life. These three components all significantly impact patients suffering from RCC-UCC. You'll hear more about how Jeff Apexant affects these domains from the patient's perspective later in the presentation. RCC-UCC patients are frustrated not only by their condition, but also by their often lengthy diagnostic journey. They feel like they're in the dark as to the cause of their cough. Despite evaluation often by multiple physicians, they're not getting the answers or relief that they so desperately seek. To share their experience, some patients have recorded video testimonials as posted by the European Lung Foundation, a patient advocacy organization. I've seen in my patients what a tremendous burden chronic cough has on quality of life. As you can imagine, the continuous cough is debilitating and stigmatizing, but also burdensome is how it affects the patient's relationship with their spouse, family, and coworkers. Here are some statements that my patients have shared with me. My job is speaking to people on the phone all day long. It's been impacting my work very badly. My constant coughing was so disruptive to my workplace that they put me in a separate corner office furthest away from my coworkers. I appreciate the effort made by my employer, but I feel so isolated. Another patient told me, I've been a home health attendant for many years, but my constant coughing made my employer and my patients afraid of me, thinking that I have something infectious going on. One woman confided, I used to be an active member of my church and sang in the church choir. Now I can't even attend services because I fear one of my terrible coughing attacks occurring. Another woman shared with me, I haven't slept in the same bedroom with my husband for many years now. He's very loving and supportive, but he needs to get up early for work every day and he can't be woken up through the night by my coughing. I feel guilty that my cough has affected our relationship this way. And finally, I was a very active person and enjoy going to the gym several times a week. 
but now a bout of coughing can occur at any time and make me lose my urine. So the fear of this happening has stopped me from going back to the gym. Given these very real patient experiences, it's important that we capture and measure the impact of cough when we evaluate potential cough therapies. The Lester Cough Questionnaire, or LCQ, is a validated instrument developed to measure the impact of chronic cough on quality of life. The LCQ measures three specific domains, which are physical, social, and psychological. Total scores used to measure overall impact of chronic cough, but patients report that the items in each of the individual domains are important as well. Cough-induced stress urinary incontinence is another important consequence of chronic cough, and it affects almost exclusively women. Cough-induced incontinence has been reported in over 60% of women evaluated for chronic cough and is now being understood as a socially debilitating complication of chronic cough, potentially causing multiple episodes of incontinence daily. And clinical trial data suggests that episodes of cough-induced incontinence may be reduced with successful treatment of RCC-UCC. It's important to understand that 100% cough reduction is not the treatment goal. In fact, even a partial reduction in cough frequency or intensity can be meaningful to a patient, significantly improving their quality of life. For example, reducing frequency can make a patient just comfortable enough to go out in public to a restaurant, concert, or church, for example. Likewise, reducing, reducing duration and intensity of coughing bouts could disproportionately reduce or even eliminate episodes of stress urinary incontinence. Because there are no approved therapies for RCC or UCC in the United States, physicians are limited to off-label medications that are often ineffective and or have intolerable side effects. For example, opioids are used, but of course these aren't a satisfactory option for a chronic problem. Also, centrally acting neuromodulators like gabapentin are used in an attempt to reduce the sensitivity in the central nervous system, as opposed to gefepixan, which acts peripherally in the airway. But in my experience, these centrally acting agents are effective for only a small percentage of my patients, and often the dose of the drug that is necessary to achieve cough suppression causes unacceptable side effects, mainly sedation. What we desperately need are safe, effective drugs to treat our patients with RCC, UCC. In conclusion, chronic cough, once it's diagnosed as RCC or UCC following the CHESS guidelines, is a condition in which the normal protective reflex of cough has become dysregulated, leading to a cough that is induced by otherwise innocuous triggers, serves no protective or beneficial effect, and becomes a bothersome disruptive condition. RCC and UCC have a tremendous impact on quality of life, not only for the patient, but for loved ones and coworkers. Currently, we do not have any drugs approved for chronic cough, and certainly what physicians are using off-label are inadequate, often not effective, often not tolerated. The drug class of P2X3 antagonists, now represented by Jefepixant, in my opinion, has great potential to provide a safe, effective, non-narcotic, non-sedating therapeutic option for RCC, UCC, which is very much needed by patients suffering from this very difficult condition. Thank you for your attention. Dr. George Phillip will now present the efficacy data. Thank you, Dr. Dispinagaitis. Good morning. My name is George Phillip. I'm an Executive Director of Medical Affairs at Merck. It's my pleasure to provide an overview of the efficacy data collected in the Phase two and Phase three clinical studies. The Jefepixin development program included over 3,000 patients with RCC UCC in phase two and phase three. The first phase two study, protocol six, provided initial evidence of efficacy in a small crossover study. Protocol 10 explored Jefepixin doses from 7.5 to 200 milligrams and provided data that informed the design of protocol 12, the phase two B dose ranging study. After phase two, Jefepixin progressed into the first ever global phase three program to investigate a novel agent in RCC and UCC. The program comprised two replicative phase three studies, protocols 27 and 30, that included the same patient population and the same clinical endpoints. Two phase three B studies, studying the effect of Jefepixin in recent onset chronic cough and cough-induced urinary incontinence have also been completed. 
The phase three entry criteria defined RCC and UCC according to the CHEST guidelines. RCC is cough for more than eight weeks in the presence of underlying conditions such as asthma, upper airway cough syndrome, or GERD. And this cough persists despite guideline recommended treatments for these conditions. In these protocols, patients needed to be on stable treatment for underlying conditions for at least two months. Most were on therapy much longer than two months at study entry, and all patients continued this therapy for the duration of the study. UCC was defined as chronic cough in which no comorbid conditions were identified despite full evaluation according to CHEST guidelines. A minimum one-year duration of chronic cough was selected for our pivotal trials to ensure time for full and appropriate evaluation of potential causes of cough and thus to allow a high degree of confidence in the diagnosis of RCC-UCC. To ensure patients had sufficient level of disease to require treatment, a minimum score was required on a patient-rated cough severity visual analog scale, VAS. The minimum was 40 millimeters out of 100, a threshold that was recently independently validated as indicating at least moderate severity of chronic cough. Other entry criteria were no smoking, no recent ACE inhibitors, no abnormal chest imaging after the onset of the cough, and no obstruction on spirometry. In the phase three trial designs, both had three arms, 45 milligrams, 15 milligrams, and placebo. In protocol 27, objective cough frequency data were collected over the initial 12 weeks, referred to as the main period because cough frequency was the primary endpoint. Over the additional 40 weeks of blinded therapy, we continued to collect patient reported outcomes, PROs, as well as safety, through the 52-week duration. In Protocol 30, the main period for cough frequency was 24 weeks. During the 28-week blinded extension, PROs were measured and safety for the full trial duration. Here are the key endpoints in the two trials. Coughs were counted over an entire 24-hour period as the primary endpoint and just when the patient was awake during those 24 hours, awake cough frequency. Protocol 30 also included a fully powered analysis of responses on the Lester Cough Questionnaire, LCQ, which measures the impact of cough on patients' lives as described by Dr. Dyspanagaitis. A clinical responder analysis specified the proportion of patients who had an increase from baseline of 1.3 points in the LCQ total score, a threshold validated as clinically meaningful by the developer of the LCQ. As shown, Protocol 30 has a larger sample size than 27 because it was designed with sufficient statistical power to test this LCQ endpoint, whereas Protocol 27 was powered on the primary endpoint. Finally, both studies assessed the proportion of patients with at least a 30% reduction from baseline in 24-hour cough frequency. This threshold is clinically meaningful based on published analyses of the Phase 2b dose ranging data. For treatment and study status at the end of 52 weeks, the top row in green shows that most patients at each arm completed the full treatment period. Discontinuations from treatment most commonly were due to an adverse event, AE, or withdrawal by subject. There was a higher rate of discontinuation due to an AE in the 45 milligram arm, while withdrawal by subject was similar across the three arms. The AEs leading to discontinuation from treatment in the 45 milligram arm were almost entirely non-serious events and often were taste-related AEs. About 60% of these discons in the 45 milligram group were specifically for a taste-related AE, meaning about 40% of these were due to various other AEs not related to taste. Discontinuations will be discussed further in the safety presentation. Here, the phase three population characteristics match the published literature. In the pivotal trials, three quarters of patients were women, similar to the female predominance seen in specialized cough clinics as published globally and specifically in the US. In this literature, age is in the 50s or 60s, as we also see here in the pivotal trials. A bit more than half of the patients were recruited from Europe, a bit less than a quarter of patients from North America. Let's turn now to the baseline data for cough in the pivotal trials. At study entry, these patients were coughing on average for over 11 years 
without effective therapy. The average baseline 24-hour cough frequency was close to 20 coughs per hour, which translates to around 500 coughs daily for years. Awake cough frequency is a bit higher because in RCC, UCC, patients generally cough more while awake. Cough severity was rated by the patient on a visual analog scale. You'll remember that at least 40 millimeters was required to enter the study. What we found was close to 70 millimeters on average at baseline. The average total score on the LCQ measure of cough specific quality of life was around 10. Since the LCQ total score has a scale from 3 to 21, where a lower score shows lower quality of life, an average of 10 reflects burdensome cough. Here are the primary analyses of each trial using the original data set as submitted to FDA at the end of 2020 and shown here as published in The Lancet. In Protocol 27, Jeffapixin 45 milligrams BID demonstrated an 18.5% reduction in 24-hour cough frequency relative to placebo at week 12. In Protocol 30, Jeffapixin 45 milligrams demonstrated a 14.6% reduction relative to placebo at week 24. 15 milligrams did not differentiate from placebo and will not be discussed further in this presentation. What is also evident in these results is a large placebo response, 53% relative to baseline in protocol 27 and 57% in protocol 30. Still, in each trial, the reduction in cough by Jeffapixin statistically exceeded the placebo response, showing 62% reduction relative to baseline in protocol 27 and 63% reduction in protocol 30. The analysis of the primary endpoint in pre-specified subgroups pooled across the pivotal trials shows cough reductions for Jeffapixin relative to placebo for each group. They are generally consistent with the results shown in all patients. The cough counting system for these trials has three steps. Recording of cough sounds for 24 hours, compression of these recordings to remove time periods without cough sounds, and counting of the coughs by a trained analyst. In the original data set for the original submission to FDA, the cough compression methodology, that middle step, was refined by the vendor during phase three. After the CRL, a new validation study assessed a single method of compression that was applied to the recordings in the pivotal trials to generate the recount data set, and the study analyses were redone using the recounted data. The primary analysis methodology, as specified in the protocols, was the longitudinal ANCOVA, also called Mixed Model for Repeated Measures, MMRM. This approach excludes patients without baseline data or post-baseline data. In their review of the original submission, the European Medicines Agency requested us to apply a specific missing data method, multiple imputation followed by ANCOVA or MI-ANCOVA, which imputes missing data to allow the entire efficacy population to contribute to efficacy analyses. In the end, there were two data sets analyzed by two methods based on regulatory requests to us. As you'll see in the next few slides, the analyses were highly consistent. Note these variations across analyses only apply to the cough frequency data. The patient reported outcome data did not change after the CRL. To compare the cough frequencies in the original and recount data sets, we start with the original data set shown here. Then we overlay the results from the recount data set. As you see, the recount results are remarkably similar to the original for the placebo and Jeffapixin treatment groups. Because the recount and original data sets were very similar, the analysis results were also very similar. Here we'll summarize the analyses done prior to the original regulatory submissions and those done after the submissions in response to regulatory requests. We begin with the original data set and the pre-specified analysis method, the LNCOVA. These are the same treatment effects that were shown on the earlier line plot you saw as percent reduction relative to placebo at the primary time point for each study. Next, we add the primary analysis method applied to the recount data set in light green. Then for completeness, we add the MI and COVA method applied to both data sets. 
We see that across the analyses provided in the original submission of Jeff Apixon and those provided to agencies after the original submission, the results show consistency of the treatment effect. Here we have the phase 2B and 3 studies side by side with protocol 12, the phase 2B dose ranging study on the left, next to protocols 27 and 30. For protocol 12, shown our placebo and the 50 milligram dose, similar to the 45 milligram dose in protocols 27 and 30. What is relevant here, the treatment effect of gefapixin, the reduction from baseline, is quite stable across each of these studies. What is different between the studies is the size of the placebo response. Of course, the phase 3 studies are much larger, and these are the first phase 3 studies ever performed in RCC-UCC, as well as the largest ever randomized placebo-controlled trials in cough. Without previous phase 3 experience in RCC-UCC, what placebo response to expect in this setting is open to conjecture. It is consistent with the role of the central nervous system to modulate the cough reflex in RCC-UCC. It could also include components of expectations going into these first ever phase 3 trials and the impact of regression to the mean. In their briefing document, FDA pointed to a potential relationship between taste AE reporting and efficacy measures, asking if this impacts the efficacy of gefapixin. This is important to evaluate, and Merck has looked carefully at the trial data. What we observe is that the data actually do not support that efficacy is driven by the taste AEs. In the phase 2 dose escalation trial protocol 10, we explored doses from 7.5 to 200 milligrams. From a dose of 50 milligrams up through 200 milligrams, these doses showed essentially the same efficacy on cough frequency. But over these same doses, taste AE incidence increased markedly, from just over 40% to almost 90% incidence of taste AEs at 200 milligrams. So marked increases in taste AEs through doses from 50 to 200 milligrams did not drive an increase in efficacy. Remember also that while efficacy is a pharmacologic effect of gefapixin, taste AEs are also a pharmacologic effect. So a relationship between these two effects can be expected in patients on gefapixin, and it could be hard to separate these confounded effects in these patients. To assess the question without such confounding, we have to look in the placebo group, noting that placebo patients did report taste AEs. In the pivotal trials, the data in the placebo group have no confounding pharmacologic effects. The placebo group data on the primary endpoint show that patients with taste AEs did not experience more cough reduction than patients without taste AEs. If there were an impact of experiencing a taste AE on efficacy, we would expect to see greater improvement in the placebo patients with versus without a taste AE, and this was not observed. Having discussed our objective cough frequency data, I'll hand it over to Allison Martin Nguyen to speak about patient reported outcomes. Thank you, Dr. Philip. Good morning. My name is Allison Martin Nguyen, and I'm an executive director in the Patient Centered Endpoints and Strategy Group at Merck. For the Phase 3 Jeff Epixent program, we developed a comprehensive patient focused endpoint strategy. That strategy was based on the extensive literature describing the unmet need in chronic cough, input from both clinicians and patients, and analyses of our phase two data to identify the most relevant concepts to measure. Shown on the left are the concepts we identified to be most important from the patient's perspective and to inform regulatory decision making. These include reducing both cough frequency and the patient relevant endpoints of cough severity, impact, and overall change. On the right are the measures used to capture each of those concepts. The primary endpoint in phase three is based on objective cough frequency captured using the Vitalichak system. To support the primary endpoint, we included four patient reported outcome questionnaires. The Lester cough questionnaire was used to assess the impact of cough on patients' lives. The cough severity diary and the cough severity visual analog scale were included to assess cough severity. And the patient global impression of change was included to capture the patient's overall assessment of change in their cough since the start of treatment. 
The LCQ is a 19 item cough specific measure developed to assess the impact of cough on the physical, psychological, and social aspects of patients' lives. Psychometric validation has shown the LCQ total score to be reliable and responsive to change in cough over time. The total score ranges from three to 21 and is the sum of the three domains with higher scores indicating less impact of cough on patients' lives. Here are three sample items, one from each domain. Note that each item refers to the patient's cough or coughing, has a seven point response option scale and a two week recall. The agency raised three main concerns with the LCQ questionnaire. The first concern, that of content validity, focused on ev evidence that the LCQ items were based on input from patients with RCC and UCC. The original item generation phase and item reduction phase of the LCQ were based on direct patient input in alignment with the FDA guidance. Following several discussions with the agency, we conducted a new qualitative research study which confirmed the content validity of all three domains of the LCQ to patients with RCC and UCC. FDA's second concern is related to the use of the total score to reflect the impact of cough improvement on patients' lives. The agency considers the psychological and social domains to be influ influenced by factors other than the treatment. Therefore, they consider the physical domain more relevant. From what we heard from Dr. Dispengaitis, from the extensive literature describing the debilitating impact of cough on patients, and from our own qualitative research, it is clear that the psychological and social impacts of cough are as, if not more important than the physical impacts to patients. Importantly, in both phase two, where we validated the LCQ for use in the RCC and UCC population, and in phase three, the LCQ total score and all three domains are correlated with and responsive to improvements in cough frequency and support the primary endpoint. Finally, to address the FDA's third concern, I will review the methods we use to estimate the clinically meaningful or responder thresholds for the LCQ total score. Because patients and physicians may be unfamiliar with how to interpret scores from questionnaires like the LCQ, we use a responder analysis because it provides an intuitive result that is easily understood. Consistent with the FDA guidance, we conducted a number of analyses using phase two trial data, which resulted in multiple thresholds that were discussed with the agency. For the LCQ total score endpoint, the thresholds we used were based on first and foremost, the threshold published by the developer, which was estimated by anchoring mean changes in the LCQ total score against patient ratings of change. This threshold has subsequently been used in numerous studies to assess chronic cough. Second, using our phase two trial data, we conducted both distribution and anchor-based analyses, which pointed to LCQ total score changes ranging from 1.3 to 2.3 as meaningful and predictive of ratings of at least minimally improved on the PGIC. Those analyses have been peer reviewed and published, resulting in established thresholds. Finally, after further discussion with the agency, we conducted additional anchor-based analyses of our phase two data to identify the degree of change in the LCQ total score corresponding to patient ratings of much improved and very much improved. The results of those analyses, which were shared and discussed with the agency, points, pointed to the two higher thresholds of 3.3 and 4.1. It should be noted that a change of 1.3 on the LCQ total score, which has a range of 18 points, is consistent with the threshold accepted by the FDA for another patient reported outcome used in the respiratory field, the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire, in which four points on a 100 points total score is considered meaningful. As you will hear, the results across the 1.3, 3.3, and 4.1 thresholds consistently favor Jeffapixin. Shown on the, finally, shown is the PGIC, which is an important measure for clinicians because it provides a quick and easily interpretable metric to assess patients over time. For those purposes, a global rating such as the PGIC should be correlated with a patient's underlying disease. Because objective cough frequency assesses only one dimension of cough, that of frequency, the correlation between the PGIC and cough frequency is expected to be low to moderate. Shown are the correlations observed using the phase two data. 
As you can see, there is a moderately strong correlation between the PGIC and the percent change in 24-hour cough frequency versus a weaker correlation between PGIC and absolute change in cough frequency. This result is not unexpected. For example, a reduction of five coughs per hour will be more impactful to a patient whose baseline is 10 coughs per hour versus a patient whose baseline is 50 coughs per hour. For the PROs included in the phase three studies, again, we see sufficiently strong correlations that provide reassurance that the PGIC is an appropriate anchor for defining meaningful changes and is also in and of itself a measure useful for interpreting meaningful changes in cough frequency from the patient's perspective. I will now present the PR re results from the phase three studies. Presented here are the results of the LCQ responder analysis from the protocol 30, which was powered for this key secondary endpoint. As shown, a greater proportion of patients treated with gefepixent were LCQ responders compared to placebo. The statistical metric used to compare these proportions is the odds ratio, which is statistically significant at 1.41 meaning patients treated with gefepixent were 41% more likely to be a responder than those who received placebo. Shown on this forest plot are the pooled data for the three LCQ total score thresholds used to define a clinically meaningful response. These results demonstrate the superiority of gefepixent over placebo across each threshold and at each time point. Shown here are the results of responder analyses for the cough severity visual analog scale and the cough severity diary displayed alongside the LCQ results at the three time points. While these were not part of the multiplicity control, these supportive PRO analyses provide consistent evidence of the benefit of gefepixent over placebo. This graph shows the LCQ total score for the gefepixent group versus placebo over 52 weeks. Notably, a greater increase in the LCQ total score was evident by week four of treatment, which was maintained over 52 weeks, indicating sustained benefit of gefepixent 45 milligrams over placebo. Similarly, shown here are the three domains of the LCQ, the physical, social, and psychological, which also demonstrate consistent benefit of gefepixent versus placebo over 52 weeks, as observed with the LCQ total score. Shown here are the longitudinal scores for the cough severity visual analog scale and the cough severity diary. Both PROs demonstrate a durable benefit of gefepixent over placebo through 52 weeks. Finally, shown here are the PGIC results for protocol 27 and protocol 30 at weeks 12 and 24. The bars represent the proportion of patients in each group reporting themselves in the top two best categories of the PGIC, much improved or very much improved. The percentages and 95% confidence intervals above the bars show the consistent benefit of gefepixent versus placebo on this patient rating of meaningful improvement in their cough. Across the PROs, we looked first at the LCQ, a, total, a tool that's been validated for use in RCC and UCC. In protocol 30, which was powered for this endpoint, Jeffapixent demonstrated statistically significant and clinically meaningful benefit. Across the LCQ total and domain scores, there were meaningful improvements versus placebo, including on each of the three thresholds for the total score. For the cough severity visual analog scale and the cough severity diary, the likelihood of achieving a clinically meaningful response were higher for Jeffapixent versus placebo at each time point and for each endpoint. For the patient global impression of change, a greater proportion of patients treated with gefepixent reported their cough as much or very much improved versus placebo. These data clearly demonstrate that the efficacy observed is clinically meaningful to the patients treated with gefepixent. And now I'll hand it back to Dr. Philip. Thank you. Thank you. Let's turn now to the phase 3B randomized placebo controlled studies because they support the benefits of gefepixent including the clinical meaningfulness of the treatment effect. Both protocols were two arm studies of gefepixent, 45 milligrams BID versus placebo, with the primary endpoint analyzed at the end of 12 weeks. Protocol 43 is a study of recent onset chronic cough. 
This study enrolled patients who met the definition of RCC UCC as in the pivotal trials, but had a duration of chronic cough for less than one year. Protocol 42 is a study of women with RCC UCC and urinary incontinence in which the primary endpoint analyzed episodes of incontinence reported by the patient as triggered specifically by cough and not by other triggers of SUI. Both trials met their primary endpoints, which were reported by the patient. Both provided additional safety data with no new findings. The improvements in the cough PROs were very consistent with the improvements observed in the pivotal trials. In protocol 42, this improvement in cough caused significant and clinically meaningful reductions in cough-induced SUI episodes. In conclusion, Jeffapixent has demonstrated clinically meaningful and consistent efficacy in each of the seven efficacy studies in the program. In the pivotal trials, the treatment effect was consistent across the original and recount datasets. Reductions in 24-hour cough frequency, the primary endpoint, are clinically meaningful, as substantiated by asking each patient to rate how they felt on therapy compared with before therapy on PRO endpoints that are relevant to them. First, on cough frequency, reductions more than 60% relative to baseline were shown. Percent reduction from baseline is meaningful to patients rather than a reduction of an absolute number of coughs which patients don't have in mind. The PROs show clinically meaningful responses, even when defining a clinical responder using multiple thresholds. And the long-term durability, as reported by the patients, is consistent over 52 weeks. The Phase 3B studies provide supportive efficacy, including in cough-induced incontinence, as a complication of RCC-UCC, at a level of placebo-adjusted efficacy on cough that is very similar across the Phase 3 and Phase 3B studies. All of these data provide substantial evidence of the effectiveness of Jeffapixin for treatment of RCC-UCC. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn to the safety presentation by Dr. Willis. Thank you, Dr. Philip, and good morning. My name is English Willis, and I am the safety physician for the Jeffa Pixin program. Over the course of the development program, including both cough and non-cough trials, more than 3,100 patients have received at least one dose of Jeffa Pixin. The 2019 patients in the phase three trials include the 1,369 patients from the pivotal trials protocols 27 and 30, plus 650 patients from phase three country specific and phase three B studies. The safety findings from these studies were consistent with the safety findings from protocols 27 and 30. This presentation is focused on the safety data from the protocols 27 and 30 pool in which 633 patients were exposed to Jeffapixent for 52 weeks or more. Patients treated with Jeffapixent 45 milligrams BID experienced a higher incidence of adverse events overall and drug-related AEs as assessed by the investigator compared to those treated with Jeffapixent 15 milligrams BID or placebo. Serious AEs were infrequent and balanced across all treatment arms, and no deaths were drug related. Discontinuations due to an AE and discontinuations specifically due to taste related AEs were dose related. Based on the efficacy data and the sponsor's plan to file with only the 45 milligram dose, the remainder of my presentation will focus on Jeffapixin 45 milligrams and placebo doses from the 27 and 30 pool at 52 weeks. Of note, both studies were largely completed prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Within the Jeffapixin group, the five most frequently reported events were dyscusia, often described as metallic, salty, or bitter taste, agusia, hypogusia, nausea, and taste disorder. Aside from the taste-related events, 
there were few AEs with an incidence of 5% or greater, and where the incidence in the Jeffapixin group exceeded that in the placebo group. While taste-related events were more frequent in the Jeffapixin group, these events were also reported by patients in the placebo group. 65% of patients treated with Jeffapixin reported a taste-related AE, with dyskusia reported most frequently. Taste disorder represents events for which the patient was not specific in how they describe their changes or alterations in taste. The incidence of serious adverse events were low and balanced across the, the two treatment arms, and there were no serious taste-related AEs. The majority of patients with taste-related AEs remained on study treatment for 52 weeks. Taste-related AEs experienced by patients treated with Jefepixin resolved in most cases, occurred early in the course of treatment, were mostly mild or moderate in intensity, and had a median duration of 194 days. Taste-related AEs in 96% of patients on Jefepixin resolved while on treatment or after the last dose. Resolution while on treatment occurred at a median of 65 days. For those in whom the event resolved after the last dose and by database lock, the median day of resolution was five days after the last dose. We also evaluated whether taste-related AEs led to any clinical sequelae, and none were found. In comparing patients from the two arms with and without taste-related AEs, the overall frequency of potential clinical sequelae in patients with taste-related AEs was low, as were AEs suggestive of weight loss or dehydration. We also reviewed baseline weight, BUN and creatinine and compared those measurements to measurements obtained at the last dose after discontinuation or at the end of the study, and we found no meaningful changes. Overall, adverse events leading to discontinuation were more frequent in the Jeffapixin group compared to placebo. The most frequently reported events leading to discontinuation were taste-related, with discontinuations likely related to tolerability. To summarize, Jefepixin 45 milligrams BID in adults with RCC or UCC has an acceptable safety and tolerability profile. Comparable to placebo, there were few serious AEs and none were taste-related. Taste-related AEs were the most frequently reported AEs, and these were mostly mild, not associated with clinical sequelae, and most patients tolerated the event and remained on study treatment. And taste-related events were reversible and resolved in 96% of the patients in the Jeffapixin group. Thank you. And Dr. Jackie Smith will now share a clinical perspective on the benefit risk profile for Jeffapixent. So thank you for the introduction, Dr. Willis. My name is Jackie Smith. I'm a pulmonologist and a professor of respiratory medicine at the University of Manchester in the UK. I've been investigating chronic cough and its treatment for approximately 20 years now, and I've led many of the trials in the development of Jefepixent that you've heard about today. I also set up and run a clinic caring for patients with chronic cough in Manchester. I'm a paid consultant to the sponsor, but I've got no financial interest in the outcome of this meeting. And today I'm going to talk about the clinical perspectives on the benefit risk relationship for Jefepixent. So the diagnostic journey for patients with refractory and unexplained chronic cough is burdensome, as you can see from this slide. Each time the patient is evaluated, more tests are performed and treatment trials are administered, and these often get repeated. In my own clinic, chronic cough patients have typically been coughing for about five years at the point of which they're referred. And there are probably a couple of reasons for this. First of all, refractory and unexplained chronic cough are generally under-recognized 
and therefore physicians continue to search for an underlying cause. Secondly, there are just no licensed treatments to address this condition. So it's not unusual for patients to be coughing for more than 10 years. During this time, they suffer chest pain, broken ribs, low work productivity, social isolation, and overall poor quality of life compared to their healthy counterparts. Since the COVID pandemic, they're also stigmatized by their coughing. With the lack of approved therapies, physicians resort to off-label use of treatments such as opioids, neuromodulators, including gabapentin and pregabalin, and sometimes also other antitussives, including over-the-counter over cough medicines. These treatments all have action in the central nervous system, and therefore they tend to be accompanied by significant adverse effects. There's a lack of robust evidence for use of any of them, and the risks of side effects and potential for abuse for both opioids and gabapentinoids is not unsubstantial. And their implementation and use in clinical practice is really quite highly variable. In contrast, Jefferpixan has a specific mode of action at P2X3 ion channels found on sensory nerve fibers in the peripheral nervous system, and it has no action in the central nervous system. The efficacy demonstrated in the Jefferpixan trials is consistent with the notion that refractory and unexplained chronic cough is a specific disorder characterized by excessive activation of P2X3 by ATP, not just a failure on the part of physicians to identify and treat comorbid conditions. Unfortunately, there are no therapies with robust efficacy for this condition. Even medications that are currently widely used to treat cough are unable to show effects above that of placebo in clinical trials performed using modern methods such as objectively measuring cough frequency from audio recordings. In the trial you see here of a single dose of dextromethorphan for cough due to upper respiratory tract infection, there was an obvious reduction in objective cough frequency from baseline with active treatment. However, this treatment did not differ from the large placebo response also observed in that trial. In my own study of codeine for coughing patients with stable COPD, both codeine and placebo showed statistically significant improvements from baseline and objective cough frequency. But when comparing the two treatment arms in this trial, codeine was unable to differentiate from the placebo. Notably, a 60% placebo response has also been observed in a similar population of refractory and unexplained chronic cough patients who were randomized to a study with the P2X3 receptor antagonist, Sevopixant. So the reduction in cough from baseline is remarkably similar across the phase two and phase three studies, as you see here. And it doubles the clinically meaningful change in cough frequency of a 30% reduction from baseline. What appears to change between the studies is the magnitude of the placebo response. Despite the placebo response, we're still observing a statistically significant benefit in the pre-specified analyses, which confirms the true treatment effect of Jefferpixant. Of course, phase three provides the larger, more robust studies, and these are the first phase three studies ever performed in refractory and unexplained chronic cough, as well as the largest ever studies that we've performed in chronic cough. Without previous phase three data, it was difficult to anticipate the magnitude of placebo effect that we might see. But it is consistent with what we know about placebo responses in cough and also in other therapeutic areas. And it's consistent with other data that have been published recently in phase two studies of refractory and unexplained chronic cough. Compared to placebo, the effect of Jefferpixant remains clinically meaningful. But the real benefit is the 60% change from baseline. This is what patients care about, and it's what they will experience. And as a physician, placebo isn't something that I can prescribe. The effect of Jefferpixant in refractory and unexplained chronic cough was also replicated in patients with more recent onset chronic cough. That is patients with a cough duration of less than a year. In this study, the primary endpoint was cough specific quality of life measured by the Lester cough questionnaire rather than cough frequency. But as you can see from the graphs on this slide, the improvement in the LCQ for patients with recent onset chronic cough was very similar at 12 weeks to that observed in the pool data from the phase three studies at 52 weeks. 
So if anything, these recent onset patients improved a little more rapidly. Furthermore, gefepixant has also been demonstrated to impact on one of the common complications of refractory and unexplained chronic cough, stress, urinary incontinence. On the left-hand graph, you can see here that gefepixant, 45 milligrams, reduced cough-induced incontinence episodes by 50%, and this was statistically significantly more than the reduction we saw with placebo. This was accompanied by a reduction in reported cough severity, captured by the cough severity diary, as you can see in the middle. On the far right, one can see that the protocol 42 results are also consistent with what we observed on the cough severity diary for the entire pivotal phase three pool, which also shows continued improvement over 52 weeks. So I've been in the involved in the development of Jefepixan since I led the very first proof of concept study in my clinic in Manchester, which used the Vitalijac cough monitoring system that I led the development of. Patients with refractory and unexplained chronic cough included in the phase three trials had an extremely high burden of cough compared to all the other respiratory diseases that I've studied, with a median of 500 coughs per day at baseline. But it's important to note that it's not just cough frequency that contributes to burden in these patients. Cough severity also incorporates intensity or the harshness of the coughing, as well as the disruption it causes to daily life. Cough severity, um, cough stress urinary incontinence, for example, is very disruptive for patients. These data show that the benefit of Jefepixant goes beyond simply reducing cough frequency. It's also consistently improved the burden of chronic coughing and an important disruptive complication in women, stress, urinary incontinence. Also consistent throughout the studies to date has been the safety of Jefepixant. While there have been no significant safety concerns, from the very first studies, we've noted taste-related disturbances, which is much more about tolerability. As the diagram suggests, I believe that patients will weigh up the burden of their disease in terms of the frequency, intensity, and disruption of their coughing with the benefits that they gain from Jeff of Pixant therapy against the side effects that they might experience. This sort of balance is something that physicians caring for patients with refractory and unexplained chronic cough are already very familiar with. As you're aware, the only treatment options that we have are unlicensed therapies that have shown some benefit in single small trials. And these include therapies such as low-dose morphine and gabapentin, both of which are associated with considerable side effects. So based upon my long-term experience with Jefepixant, I'm confident clinicians can appropriately manage patients' expectations and use shared physician-patient decision-making to provide this therapy where it's most appropriate. Therefore, Jefepixant has the potential to produce significant improvements in cough and the quality of life for patients with refractory and unexplained chronic cough. Thank you, and I will now invite Dr. Bollinger to come to give some closing remarks from the sponsor. Thank you, Dr. Smith. You've heard from Drs. Dispenangaitis and Smith that the reduction in cough counts and improvement in patient-reported outcomes observed in the Jefepixent trials are clinically meaningful for patients. To help illustrate this further, I will use a framework from the Initiative on Methods, Measurement, and Pain Assessment in Clinical Trials, or IMPACT, that appears in, the, in a publication by Dworkin et al. This work was a collaboration between the FDA, academia, and industry to address the challenges of placebo effect with pain trials that parallel those in cough. The clinical importance of group differences can only be established in the broader context of the disease being treated, currently available therapies, and the overall benefit-risk assessment. On the left side of this framework are the factors that inform clinically meaningful efficacy at a group level. The first is the statistical significance of the primary efficacy endpoint. In the Jefepixent trials, the results were statistically sig significant for the original count, and with the recount, the treatment effect was consistent with their original analyses. The magnitude of effect was a decrease in cough frequency of approximately 60%, consistently observed across both Phase two and Phase three studies. 
There are no approved treatments for RCC UCC and no established treatment effect for products used off label. We have conducted multiple responder analyses and they all support the primary efficacy endpoint. We have even looked at increasing thresholds in these analyses, and they consistently show a greater effect for gefepixin over placebo. The onset of cough reduction with gefepixin occurs at least as early as our first assessment at four weeks, with durability shown through 52 weeks. And the analysis of the patient reported outcomes showed consistent improvement for patients and was statistically significant in protocol 30, the trial powered for this key secondary endpoint. The safety of gefepixent is well characterized and tolerated by patients. The majority of patients stayed in the trials despite the taste related adverse events. Jefepixent is a first-in-class, peripherally-acting medication to treat RCC-UCC, offering patients a safe alternative to off-label treatments. Based on the totality of data and applying this framework, we conclude that the group differences are clinically meaningful. As you've heard in today's presentation, RCC, UCC has a unique pathophysiology with dysregulation of the cough reflex, and it can be debilitating for patients. There are no approved or proven treatment options. The totality of data across seven studies provide substantial evidence of effectiveness. Positive data across objective cough frequency and patient reported outcomes including from studies of recent onset cough and cough-induced stress urinary incontinence, demonstrate that the treatment effect is not a chance finding and is meaningful for patients. As discussed, safety is well characterized with no imbalance of serious drug-related adverse events. The taste-related adverse events are mild and reversible and a tolerability consideration. In conclusion, the consistent benefits of gefepixent far outweigh the risks and support approval for RCC UCC. Thank you for your time and consideration, and we look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much to Mark uh, for those those uh, presentations, and now. Um, we're going to take a quick 10 minute break. Uh, so panel members, please remember that there should be no discussion of the meeting topics with other panel members during the break. And we'll resume at 1045.
Recording in progress. Okay, thank you. We'll now proceed with the FDA's presentations, starting with Dr. Rachel Bean. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rachel Bean. I'm a physician and a medical officer in the, um, sorry, in the Division of Pulmonology, Allergy, and Critical Care in the Office of New Drugs. I will begin the FDA presentation, and you will also hear from my colleague, Susan Mayo. Next. Here's an outline of our planned presentation. Next. I will begin with an overview of the clinical program and then provide a focus safety review. Next. Next slide. This timeline lists the major regulatory events during clinical development of gefepixant for chronic cough beginning with milestone meetings that occurred while the applicant was designing the pivotal trials. The NDA was submitted in 2020. FDA reviewed the NDA and issued a complete response in 2022, the reasons for which will be described in the following slides. Following the complete response action, additional meetings focused on resolution of the program's deficiencies were held, and the NDA was resubmitted in June 2023. Today's advisory committee meeting occurs during FDA's review of the NDA resubmission. Next. The initial NDA submission consisted of evidence from two pivotal trials, P30 and P27. This application received a complete response with the primary deficiency being insufficient validation of the cough counting system used to assess the primary endpoint of cough frequency. FDA could not verify that the endpoint results were accurate and reliable. Additional concerns with the program included the primary endpoint results showing a small reduction in cough frequency of unclear clinical meaningfulness. In addition, the secondary endpoint results are not statistically persuasive and are of unclear clinical meaningfulness. Next. This slide describes in blue boxes the key steps of the cough counting system used to produce the original unvalidated cough counts. The white boxes display the deficiencies in the system. Next. In the first step, the Vitalijack device is worn by each subject while it records potential cough sounds. Next. It is important to note that the Vitalijack device holds an FDA 510K clearance as an audio recording device only. This does not include compression or cough counting. Next. In step two, the audio recording is compressed by an algorithm to remove silence and non-cough sounds. Next. For compression, three non-equivalent algorithms which were not validated were used. The assignment of the specific algorithm to compress each sample did not follow a standardized process. These issues led to concern about reliability and reproducibility of the compressed recordings. Next. Moving to the third step, a human cough analyst reviews the compressed recording audio and waveforms and tags the coughs. Tags are counted to produce the cough count. Next. There was no evidence of equivalence in tagging of compressed and uncompressed recordings. Finally, there was not evidence supporting that the human cough analysts have equivalent performance. Next. The boxes on the bottom row display the actions taken to resolve these deficiencies and produce cough counts sufficient for efficacy review. Next. First, the applicant selected a single compression algorithm. This was validated comparing compressed and uncompressed cough counts across the relevant range of frequencies. Then, this single validated algorithm was used to compress all recordings, which were then tagged and counted to produce the recounted validated cough count data. The two additional algorithms used to produce the original cough counts were not validated. Next. 
Finally, an inner rater reliability study demonstrated that the performance of the different human cough analysts was equivalent. Next. The results of these studies support the accuracy and reliability of the system that produced the recounted cough counts only. FDA will present efficacy results based on the validated recounted cough counts. Next. Now I will provide a brief overview of the five clinical trials provided by the applicant with the NDA resubmission. I will discuss how each trial contributes to our evaluation of efficacy and safety for gefepixant. Next. P30 and P27 are the two pivotal trials that were included in the initial NDA submission, and they continue to provide the efficacy and safety data that are the focus of FDA's review. These are 52-week randomized double-blind and placebo-controlled trials in 2044 adults with a diagnosis of chronic cough. Both trials evaluated twice-daily dosing of gefepixant 45 milligrams, gefepixant 15 milligrams, and placebo. The primary endpoint of 24-hour cough frequency was analyzed at week 24 in P30 and at week 12 in P27. Next. In this red box, you can see the three supplementary clinical trials included in the NDA resubmission. FDA has determined that these trials have limited ability to inform the efficacy evaluation. These trials results are not discussed in our presentation and are described in the briefing document for reference. Next. I will now proceed to discuss the endpoints evaluated in the pivotal trials. I will start with the primary endpoint of 24-hour cough frequency. Next. The gefepixent program is one of the first clinical development programs for the treatment of chronic cough, so there is limited experience with efficacy endpoint selection for this indication. Typically, efficacy endpoints to evaluate treatment for a symptomatic condition should measure change in the most impactful symptoms according to patients. Often these are assessed by patient reported outcomes or PROs. In chronic cough, there is limited regulatory experience with PROs, so FDA agreed that 24-hour cough frequency was a reasonable and primary endpoint. The rationale supporting this endpoint includes, first, that it is objectively measured by recording and counting coughs. Second, when the pivotal trials were designed, the available phase two data estimated a 30% relative reduction in geometric mean ratio of cough frequency for gefepixant compared, excuse me, compared to placebo. This endpoint also presents challenges for interpretation. Frequency captures one aspect of cough, but other aspects are also important to patients, such as severity and coughing bouts. Additionally, FDA and the applicant did not prospectively identify the types of within patient change in cough frequency that could be considered clinically meaningful. Having reviewed this background regarding the primary endpoint, I will now discuss the other endpoints investigated in the trials. Next slide. Each trial has two secondary endpoints related to cough frequency, awake cough frequency and 30% or greater reduction from baseline in 24-hour cough frequency. The only multiplicity controlled secondary endpoint based on a PRO is a responder analysis of change in total score on the Lester Cough Questionnaire or LCQ using a threshold of 1.3 points. This endpoint was included in the hierarchy of P30, P30 and not P27. There were additional secondary endpoints as shown here, responder analyses on CSD or cough severity diary and cough severity VAS or visual analog scale. These endpoints were not controlled for multiplicity. As such, these endpoints are considered exploratory in nature. Next. Now I will share some general thoughts about PROs as endpoints for chronic cough. Next. PROs offer several advantages. They provide valuable direct evidence reflecting patients' experiences, and as such, FDA encourages the use of fit-for-purpose PROs to support regulatory decisions. 
Additionally, PROs can provide insight about different aspects of disease control beyond objective cough frequency, such as severity, coughing bouts, and related symptoms. These results could help us understand the impact of a chronic cough therapy in patients' lives. Next. There are also limitations with PROs for chronic cough that must be considered when interpreting endpoint results. As previously noted, there is a lack of regulatory experience with these PROs. Interpreting a PRO is complex. There should be sufficient qualitative and quantitative validity evidence provided to FDA by the drug developer to support interpretation. A given PRO should measure a disease-related concept that is important to patients. The PRO must be shown to provide an accurate and reliable measure of this concept, and the treatment effect on the PRO score should be meaningful and understandable to patients. An important limitation of the PROs used in the gefepixant program is the lack of established thresholds for meaningful within patient change. To understand what a change in PRO score means, the drug developer should provide evidence to inform score interpretation. This information is essential to determine if the observed change will be perceptible to patients. Now I will discuss the PROs in the gefepixant program in more detail. Next. Given the lack of experience with PROs and chronic cough, it was reasonable for the applicant to evaluate various PROs. The responder analysis of the LCQ total score was the only multiplicity-controlled PRO endpoint. This was analyzed only in P30, as noted previously. Other secondary endpoints based on PROs that were assessed include additional analyses of LCQ, such as higher response thresholds for the total score and domain level endpoints, CSD, and cough severity VAS. These were not multiplicity controlled, so they are considered exploratory. Many were post hoc. As such, they have limited ability to contribute substantial evidence towards efficacy evaluation in the gefepixant program. However, we are presenting results from the other PRO endpoints for completeness because this is the first application for chronic cough and we are interested in the committee's input on the PROs in this program. Now, to establish a common background before presenting the trial's results, I'll provide a brief review of these PRO instruments. Next. First, we have the LCQ. This is a 19-item PRO instrument that assesses cough symptoms and impacts over a two-week recall period. Three domains, social, physical, and psychological, contribute to the total score ranging from 3 to 21. Higher scores indicate better health status. The items in each domain reflect concepts covering cough-related symptoms and impacts. As described in our briefing document, FDA has concerns about the interpretation of some items contributing to the total score. As noted previously, a responder analysis of change of at least 1.3 points in the LCQ total score was the only multiplicity-controlled PRO endpoint in P30 only. Next. Here we have the CSD. This is a seven-item PRO instrument completed daily that assesses the frequency, intensity, and disruptiveness of cough. Each item is rated on a scale of 0 to 10, resulting in a mean total score of 0 to 10, with higher scores indicating greater severity. As noted previously, the CSD was used in exploratory analyses only. Next. Finally, we have the cough severity VAS. This is a single item PRO instrument completed each evening. As shown here, the subject is asked to rate the severity of their cough today using a visual analog scale with no cough on the left and extremely severe cough on the right. The subject's response is translated to a number from 0 to 100, though these numbers are not displayed on the scale as you can see. As noted previously, the cough severity VAS was used in exploratory analyses only. Next. Because safety is not a focus of this advisory committee meeting, I will now provide a brief overview of the safety results before we move to efficacy. Next. The main risk with gefepixan administration is the frequent occurrence of taste disturbances, including change, loss, or decrease in taste. 
Although these events are neither serious nor severe, taste disturbances are frequent, occurring in 65% of subjects receiving gefepixant 45 milligrams, compared to 7% of subjects in the placebo arm. Next. This Kaplan-Meier curve shows the time to onset of taste disturbance adverse events for the gefepixant 45 milligram arm in red and the placebo arm in gray. The x-axis shows days since the start of treatment. As you can see, taste disturbance has a rapid onset occurring within days. It generally lasts until discontinuation of therapy, at which point it resolves in at least 96% of subjects. These effects on taste impact the tolerability of gefepixant, leading to discontinuation of treatment in 14% of subjects who receive the 45 milligram dose. Next. In addition to posing tolerability issues, taste disturbances may introduce bias into the efficacy evaluation of gefepixant. Subjects and investigators are, appropriately, made aware of this common side effect upon enrollment or study initiation. Taste disturbances occur frequently, affecting two out of three subjects who receive gefepixant 45 milligrams. Based on these observations, there is concern for inadvertent unblinding of subjects or investigators. In the setting of the small treatment effects on cough frequency and PRO endpoints, this potential bias increases the uncertainty around the evidence for efficacy. Next. Thank you for your attention. I will now call on my statistical colleague, Susan Mayo, to present the efficacy review. Thank you, Dr. Bean. I am Susan Mayo, a senior mathematical statistician in the Division of Biometrics III Office of Biostatistics. I serve as the primary statistical reviewer for this application. We now turn to the statistical review of efficacy. Next. While a common condition, chronic cough, is a novel therapeutic indication that lacks regulatory precedent, particularly regarding endpoint selection, analysis methodology, and interpretation of efficacy results. The primary endpoint for these two pivotal trials was cough frequency measured for 24 hours using the unit of coughs per hour at week 24 for study P30 and week 12 for study P27. The FDA analysis of cough frequency was based on recounted data for the reasons described in Dr. Bean's presentation. There were two multiplicity controlled secondary endpoints based on cough frequency, a weight cough frequency and proportion of patients who achieved at least a 30% reduction from baseline in 24 hour cough frequency. A third multiplicity controlled secondary endpoint in trial P30 was proportion of patients achieving at least a 1.3 point increase from baseline in the LCQ total score. The other secondary endpoints not under multiplicity control are listed here. Next slide. Here is the testing hierarchy in the two pivotal trials. In P30, the primary and secondary endpoints were tested in gefepixent 45 milligrams versus placebo, followed by 15 milligrams. In trial P27, the primary endpoint was tested in 45 milligrams and then 15 milligrams, followed by two secondary endpoints tested by high and low dose, respectively. To illustrate the differences in the hierarchies, the 15 milligram comparisons to placebo have a blue background. Now to the results. Next slide. Here is the subject disposition at the landmark time points of week 24 or week 12 for the main study periods. In these trials, the highest rates for both treatment discontinuation and study discontinuation were in the gefepixent 45 milligram arms. Next. A notable reason for study treatment discontinuation was adverse events. 
The rates were highest in the gefapixin 45 milligram arms, 20 and 16 percent respectively, for P30 and P27, compared to 5 to 8 percent and 3 percent for the other arms respectively. Next. There were no appreciable differences in demographics and baseline characteristics across treatment arms. The study population is consistent with the characteristics of a chronic cough population. Next. Now on to the primary efficacy results. The FDA presentation will be focused on gefapixent 45 milligrams and placebo. Next slide, please. The applicant employed a mixed model with repeated measures for change from baseline in long transformed 24-hour cough frequency. The geometric mean at baseline for P30 was similar for the two treatment arms. In P27, the placebo baseline value was somewhat higher due to an outlier over 1,000 coughs per hour. Next. The geometric mean for the 45 milligram arms in both trials decreased from 19 at baseline to seven coughs per hour at week 24 or 12. The placebo arm in P30 decreased from 20 to nine coughs per hour and in P27 from 24 to 11. The primary summary measure relative reduction in geometric mean ratio between gefapixent 45 milligrams and placebo was 14.6% in P30 and 17.0% in P27. Significance was attained in trial P30, but not in P27. Next. Note the high placebo response, which was not observed in the applicant's phase two trial. The ratio between geometric means at the landmark time point compared to baseline in placebo patients was 0.43 and 0.47 in P30 and P27 respectively. The placebo arms in both trials had a 53 to 57% reduction from baseline. <clears throat> Results for the 45 milligram arms were slightly better with a 61 to 63 point 61 to 63% reduction. Next slide, please. <clears throat> to assess the robustness of the primary analysis results, several sensitivity analyses were conducted. This table shows the primary analysis on the original data in the first row. <clears throat> and for context, the results from the recounted data as described in this last slide on the next row. All remaining analyses in this table were performed on the recounted data. The percent relative reduction to placebo in these analyses was fairly similar. In the recounted data, it ranges from 13 to 15 percent in P30 and 15 to 17 percent in P27. Next slide, please. The applicant provided forest plots that use the primary analysis method to look at various demographic and baseline characteristic subgroups. There was no, identifiable, no identifiable subgroup that demonstrated a stronger trend in gefapixin efficacy for cough frequency consistently for both pivotal trials when considered by gender, region, age group, cough duration, RCC versus UCC diagnosis, baseline cough frequency or cough severity VAS. Next slide. Given the complicated statistical calculation of the primary endpoint, the interpretation of clinical meaning of these results is a challenge. <clears throat> Therefore, we conducted post hoc descriptive analyses of the absolute cough frequency, a more intuitive expression of the primary endpoint. In P30 and P27, the baseline median cough frequencies were 20 to 26 coughs per hour with an upper range of hundreds of coughs per hour. 
looking at the change from baseline at landmark time points, the median values for gefapixent differ from placebo by only one to two coughs per hour. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Here is the box plot that corresponds to the table in the previous slide. Blue denotes placebo, yellow denotes the 15 milligram arm, and red denotes the 45 milligram arm. The boxes contain the 25th to 75th percentile interquartile range with a median marked with the horizontal line. The y-axis was restricted to 250 coughs per hour in, the, or in order to see this level of detail for the majority of data. Examination of the median and 25th and 75th percentiles revealed small differences between treatment groups in cough frequency at the landmark time points as shown by the overlap of the interquartile boxes. Next slide, please. We conducted another descriptive analysis of the cough frequency based on responder thresholds. These figures show the proportion of subjects by varying thresholds for percent reduction from baseline for both trials. The pre-specified thresholds of 30, 50, and 70% reductions from baseline in cough frequency are noted with the faint reference lines on the x-axis to provide context for those thresholds within the continuum of response from 0 to 100%, with the sample size and percent of responders noted below in color-coded text. There is a large proportion of placebo responders that tracks with the gefapixent responders. In most instances, there is a numerical difference in the proportion of responders for a percent reduction in cough frequency between gefapixent 45 milligrams and placebo. The magnitude of those differences is quite small. Next slide, please. To explore whether gefapixent treatment resulted in a benefit that is meaningful to patients, FDA reviewed exploratory anchor-based analysis using PGIC as an anchor. The PGIC asks a patient to describe their cough now as compared to the start of treatment with options from very much worse to very much improved as shown in this image. A patient's response on PGIC could be used to help interpret if their response to treatment resulted in a perceived global improvement in their cough. Anchor scales are used as external criteria to define patients who have experienced a meaningful improvement in their condition. A range of change scores in the endpoint can then be derived from the group of patients who identified as having experienced meaningful improvement based on the anchor. FDA guidance recommends the use of multiple anchors to inform decisions about the, a plausible range of meaningful within patient changes. In the gefapixent program, the PGIC is the only PRO measure administered in the pivotal trials that would be considered reasonable as an anchor to define meaningful change in cough frequency. Next slide, please. These figures plot PGIC response categories on the x-axis with the most favorable values on the left against change in 24-hour cough frequency for the three treatment arms in both trials. There is no clear trend indicating a relationship between the change in cough frequency and PGIC scores. Additionally, there is no treatment separation from the 45 milligram or 15 milligram arms compared to placebo for these improved categories. Next slide, please. To summarize findings from this exploratory anchor-based analysis, we noted that both trials showed a low correlation between change in cough frequency with PGIC score. This poor association of cough frequency with PGIC indicates that the change in cough frequency occurs nearly independently from patient reported improvement in cough, chronic cough as captured by PGIC. In other words, patients who reported feeling better per the PGIC were not necessarily those patients who were coughing less. 
This did not inform meaningfulness of change in cough frequency from the patient's perspective. Next slide. Next, I will discuss the secondary efficacy endpoints under multiplicity control. Next slide. The same mixed effects repeated measures model for the primary endpoint was applied for the log transformed awake cough frequency. Awake cough frequency results mirror 24 hour cough frequency in both trials. Point estimates for percent relative reduction in geometric mean ratio were 15 to 16 percent in awake coughs per hour. The p value was significant for p30, but not for p27. Displayed in the next table, you can see the applicant's selected LCQ total score threshold of greater than or equal to 1.3 points increase and a threshold of 30% reduction in cough frequency, which are the remaining multiplicity controlled endpoints. While they are reported here for completeness, it is important to note there, were not sufficient, there was not sufficient evidence to support these thresholds. Next slide, please. For LCQ total score, the odds ratio of 1.4 95% confidence interval being 1.0 to 2.0 for the proportion of subjects reaching the 1.3 point increase was significant. The difference in proportion of subjects reaching the threshold was 3.3% between the 45 milligram and placebo arms, which was small. This endpoint was not in the testing hierarchy for P27. Next slide. There was a lack of statistical significance for the endpoint of 30% or greater reduction in cough frequency in both trials. Next. And last, I will discuss the other secondary endpoints not under multiplicity control. All these endpoints are PROs. Similar to the thresholds described in the last slide, Upon review, FDA has identified limitations and uncertainties with the responder threshold cutoffs selected for each of these PRO endpoints. Because of these concerns and the lack of multiplicity control in testing for statistical significance, the following results should be interpreted within this context. Next. This forest plot presents the odds ratios of these endpoints for each trial. A key feature of the forest plot is the no difference line, which for an odds ratio is at one. The first odds ratio of 1.4 is for the LCQ total score of greater than or equal to 1.3 points in trial P30 and was previously discussed. The odds ratio for this endpoint in P27 was 1.3 with a confidence interval that includes one. For the cough severity diary CSD score at the thresholds of 1.3 and 2.7 points, the 95% confidence interval for these odds ratios was greater than no difference in P30, but not in P27. For the cough severity VAS score at the threshold of 30 millimeters, the 95% confidence interval for these odds ratios was greater than no difference in both trials. Next slide. Odds ratios can be challenging to interpret clinically. A pre-specified supportive analysis for difference in proportion of responders reaching these thresholds was also conducted. The no difference line of this forest plot is at zero. The treatment difference was small across these secondary endpoints ranging from three to 9%. It is worthwhile to note that the applicant's analysis for odds ratio implicitly imputes missing data based on a statistical model, while the analysis for difference in responders explicitly imputes missing data as non-responders. This difference in how missing data was handled explains the dissimilarity in responder proportions and confidence intervals for these two pre-specified analyses. Next slide.
For the summary of efficacy findings, there was a high placebo response with little added effect from gefapexin across the endpoints. The statistical significance for these multiplicity controlled endpoints were marginal in P30 and were not replicated in P27. The primary 24-hour cough frequency, which resulted in a 15 to 17% improvement relative placebo to placebo was difficult to understand. We also assessed the absolute cough frequency using descriptive statistics, and a small treatment difference was observed there too, of one to two coughs per hour. Treatment effect on secondary endpoints were also modest. There was no established threshold for meaningful within patient change in the threshold specified for these trials for cough frequency or for PROs. The potential unblinding due to taste disturbance in 65% of patients who took gefapixin 45 milligrams compared to 7% of patients who took placebo may have introduced bias from possible knowledge of treatment. This potential for bias is of particular concern when treatment differences are so small. Clinical interpretation of these findings is required. That ends the statistical review of efficacy. Now back to Dr. Bean for her presentation of clinical considerations. Hello again, I'm Rachel Bean, clinical reviewer. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now I will discuss, discuss the clinical considerations on the gefapixant program. Next slide. Today, we are asking for the committee's input on the clinical assessment of efficacy for gefapixant. Numerous considerations, as highlighted here, contribute to the unclear clinical meaningfulness of the results. Starting on the left, there is a large placebo response observed across endpoints. To the placebo response, gefapixant adds a small treatment effect which has marginal statistical significance. The frequent occurrence of taste disturbances has the potential to cause inadvertent unblinding which could affect the PRO endpoints in particular. Additionally, there are not established thresholds for meaningful within patient change in endpoints evaluating cough frequency and PROs. To explore the effects of gefapixant, FDA and the applicant conducted many analyses that are post hoc and not controlled for multiplicity. Typically, our regulatory practice is to employ a pre-specified multiplicity control hierarchy to minimize the observation of seemingly positive results that are actually due to chance. Only those endpoints that are pre-specified and multiplicity controlled are considered to co contribute substantial evidence towards efficacy. In our review of gefapixant, we reviewed the exploratory analyses to provide supportive context for the multiplicity controlled analyses, and we have presented these results to support the scientific discourse by the committee today. In combination, these issues and uncertainties make it difficult to conclude that the treatment effect of gefapixant offers a clinically meaningful benefit to patients. Now I will provide some clinical perspective on the results. Next. I will begin with the clinical discussion of the primary endpoint. Let's pause to consider this table. Next. The geometric mean values for cough frequency are shown in the second and third rows. Regardless of treatment arm, at baseline, subjects cough roughly 20 times per hour. After 12 to 24 weeks on trial, whether a subject is tr treated with gefapixant or placebo, this decreases to 7 to 10 coughs per hour. Next. On the next line, the geometric mean ratio of post-treatment to baseline coughs is displayed. Below that is the corresponding percent reduction from baseline. There is a large placebo response with over 50% reduction in the placebo and gefapixant arms. Gefapixant provides a small additional reduction of 6 to 8% beyond the placebo effect. Next slide. Moving down, we see the primary endpoint measure. 
based on the p-values, the treatment difference from placebo reached statistical significance in p30 but not in p27. Despite this, note that the values for relative reduction at 14.6 and 17 percent differ by less than three percentage points. Therefore, the treatment effect size is rather consistent in both trials. Because it is challenging to understand what these calculations and results mean for chronic cough patients, next we looked at the raw or absolute values for cough frequency. Next. As we saw in these box plots, after treatment, the median cough frequencies and the 25th and 75th percentile values overlap across treatment arms. Next. Median cough frequencies at baseline and post-treatment are shown in blue for placebo and red for gefepixant. In both trials at baseline, the median cough frequencies were 20 to 26 coughs per hour. After treatment, hourly coughs reduced to 11 or 12 for placebo and 8 or 9 for gefepixant. Next. The results for median change from baseline are shown here. Gefepixant yields a, re a reduction beyond the high placebo response of approximately one to two coughs per hour. The clinical meaningfulness of this small change is not self-evident, and the degree of cough frequency reduction that corresponds to meaningful within patient change has not been established. To assist in interpreting these effects on cough frequency, we look to secondary and PRO endpoints. Next. A post-hoc analysis to explore how decreased cough frequency affects the patient experience is shown here. Each patient, patient's response to the question, compared to the start of treatment, how would you describe your cough now, is plotted against change from baseline in cough frequency. In the trials, very few responses fell in the worst categories, as reflected by the wide confidence intervals and absence of data on the right half of these figures. Meanwhile, the red squares highlight subjects whose PGIC response indicated that they feel the same or better. There is overlap of the changes in cough frequency across these response categories. This suggests that patients who feel better based on PGIC are not necessarily those patients who are coughing less frequently. Further, within each response category, there is overlap of the color-coded treatment arms, highlighting the absence of a difference between placebo in blue and gefepixan in red. Now I will review other findings that may help us assess the change in cough frequency. Next. Here you can see the multiplicity control hierarchy of secondary endpoints. From the regulatory perspective, only the secondary endpoints within this hierarchy have sufficient statistical rigor to contribute substantial evidence towards efficacy. The results shown first for awake cough frequency resemble those for 24-hour cough frequency, so this endpoint offers little additional information to help understand the primary endpoint results. Next slide. The responder analysis of LCQ total score using a 1.3 point responder threshold is multiplicity controlled in P30 only. The odds ratio meets statistical significance. However, the applicant has not provided sufficient evidence that a 1.3 point change in score is meaningful to patients. As shown in the last two lines of the red box, roughly 60% of subjects met the threshold of 1.3 points, whether they were treated with gefepixan or placebo. The treatment difference between arms was small at 3%. Thus, it is not clear that the change detected on this endpoint is meaningful. Next. Finally, the responder analysis of 30% reduction in cough frequency showed no treatment difference from placebo, and 56 to 58 percent of subjects met this threshold whether they were on gefepixan or placebo. To examine other thresholds for reduction besides 30 percent, as shown in the statistical presentation, we looked along the continuum from 0 to 100 percent response, comparing the percent of subjects in each treatment arm who met a given threshold, and we saw little to no separation between treatment arms. Next slide. 
Although the secondary endpoints evaluating other PROs were not multiplicity controlled and were therefore considered exploratory, we assessed the data to further our understanding of the results, and we are presenting these results to further today's scientific discussion. For each of the PROs, the applicant chose to conduct responder analyses at various thresholds. However, there is not evidence that these specific thresholds represent a change in score that is meaningful to patients. As we just saw, the only PRO analysis included in the multiplicity hierarchy was the LCQ total score responder analysis reported as an odds ratio. Because odds ratios are challenging to interpret, this figure shows the percent of responders and the difference between treatment arms for the various PROs at the applicant selected thresholds. If we consider the results at face value, next slide. The differences between gefepixan and placebo are small, at less than 10% across these endpoints with most confidence intervals crossing zero. In the context of potential unblinding due to taste disturbances, which could be especially rele relevant for PROs, we question whether these small treatment effects can be considered meaningful. Next. I would like to take this opportunity to summarize the clinical efficacy findings. Across endpoints related to cough frequency or PROs, patients improved whether they were treated with gefepixan or placebo. There was a small reduction in the primary endpoint of cough frequency relative to the large placebo response. The relative reduction in geometric mean ratio achieved marginal statistical significance in only one of the two pivotal trials, though the point estimates of the treatment effect are similar. Because the primary endpoint summary measure is difficult to translate clinically, we assessed the median change in absolute cough frequency and found that gefepixan yields a reduction of one to two coughs per hour beyond the effective placebo. We conducted exploratory analyses to examine these effects on cough frequency. We analyzed correlation between the change in cough frequency and the PGIC score and we found that coughing less often did not correlate with feeling better since the start of treatment. We conducted analyses in search of a subgroup of patients with increased responsiveness to gefepixan whom providers could identify in clinic and target for therapy. No such group was identified on subgroup analyses based on demographics and baseline disease characteristics. Evaluation of thresholds for reduction in cough frequency higher than 30% did not suggest a substantial benefit. Given these results, it is unclear whether the defect detected effect of gefepixant beyond the large placebo response is meaningful or perceptible to patients. Next. This slide summarizes the contribution of PRO results to the understanding of efficacy. First, I will discuss the LCQ specifically, as this was the only PRO instrument that was included in a multiplicity-controlled endpoint. FDA has concerns about the content validity of this instrument, as outlined in the briefing document. These make it challenging to interpret score changes. The applicant did not provide su sufficient evidence to demonstrate that a total score increase of 1.3 points represents a change that is meaningful to patients. Therefore, we question the meaningfulness of the observed change in the total score. If we look at the raw change in total score, the treatment difference was small at less than one point. Especially in the setting of potential unblinding, these small changes in PRO scores are not obviously meaningful, and there is a lack of evidence to assist in rigorous interpretation of these score changes. The results of the other PRO endpoints offer little additional support for efficacy. None of these endpoints were controlled for multiplicity. Like cough frequency and LCQ, there is no evidence to support the selected responder thresholds or to define meaningful within patient change on these PRO scores. If considered at face value, the responder analyses and raw scores on each PRO showed a small treatment difference from placebo. Next slide. Now I will offer some concluding thoughts. FDA recognizes the need for safe and effective therapies for chronic cough. This is a common that can deeply impact patients' lives. 
and there are currently no approved therapies for chronic cough patients in the United States. To demonstrate that a drug is effective, the evidence provided by the drug developer must show that the drug offers clinically meaningful benefit. This benefit should be distinct from the effect of a placebo control, and it should be not only statistically detectable and significant, it should also be clinically meaningful. Due to the many issues and uncertainties identified in the gefapixant program shown here and discussed in our presentation, we cannot readily conclude that the small treatment difference between gefapixant and placebo is clinically meaningful. While one might claim that there is no harm in making a product with uncertain effects available for patients to try for themselves, this approach does not align with FDA's standard for approval. Further, it can in fact harm individual patients and our broader society in ways including negative side effects, missed or delayed diagnosis, missed opportunities to take a more effective therapy, drug-drug interactions, pill burden, and increased health care costs, among others. We ask that the committee keep these considerations in mind as you deliberate and discuss this application today. With that, I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to hearing the committee's thoughts today. This concludes the FDA presentation. Thank you very much to the agency for your presentation. And now we'll take clarifying questions for the presenters. Uh, from Merck Sharpendome LLC and the FDA. So please use the raise hand icon to indicate that you have a question and remember to lower your hand by clicking the raise hand icon again after you've asked your question. When acknowledged, please remember to state your name for the record before you speak and direct your question to a specific presenter if you can. If you wish for a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know the slide number if possible. And finally, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you at the end of your follow-up question with that is all for my questions so that we can move on to the next panel member. And Dr. Kelso. Uh, yes, John Kelso. Uh, I have a question for um, our FDA statistician. Um, we've heard several times that many of these analyses are less robust or reliable or interpretable because of the lack of um, multiplicity correction. Uh, is, is that something that's fixable? In other words, is that just a matter of going back to the computer and in fact doing a, a multiplicity analysis or correction on those uh, parts of the data so that they would generate more robust or usable um, uh, data. Thank you for that question, Dr. Kelso. This is Stacy Chin, FDA. So just to summarize um, your question for the FDA statisticians, it's um, about the lack of multiplicity control for several of the secondary endpoints. And is there anything we could do about it at this point? Correct. This is, this is Susan Mayo, um, the primary statistical reviewer. Um, yes. So. Um, the, the, what multiplicity adjustment does is it preserves the type one error. Um, so when we talk about a cutoff of 0 0.05 for um, statistical significance, that is in, in uh, association with just one comparison. And so if we do um, a number of different statistical tests on a number of different comparisons of different endpoints, then that inflates that type one error and it's no longer at 5%, um, which then um, causes there, there, there's then a higher rate of um, spurious uh, or um, it could just be by chance. 
So the, the one very common way of addressing that is with multiplicity uh, adjustment. And what that means is declaring before the trial is unblinded what the what the um, hierarchy, which I, I um, showed in one of my slides, what the hierarchy is for um, which test will be test, which endpoints will be tested first, and then if those are significant, then go to the next, et cetera. And so um, this cannot be adjusted once the data has been unblinded, because then then the the results are available. And uh, so um, the way to adjust it is to um, declare those in the multiplicity hierarchy prior to the study being unblinded. Okay, so that, yes, I think that does answer the question. So it's, it's sort of unfortunately not fixable after the fact. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kelso. And next is Dr. Garibaldi. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my question is for uh, Dr. Phillips and the, and the Merck team. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about the, um, the large placebo effect that's been seen in both trials. Um, I was wondering, you know, to address the issue of whether or not participants were essentially unblinded by the taste side effects, did you take a look at the, the folks who did not experience taste side effects versus those who did to actually look at the impact of of the drug on their symptoms and how that compared to placebo. That might be one way of at least trying to look at what the additional potential impact of the unblinding uh, impact of the taste uh, side effects might be. Yes, we, we understand your question and we have done several analyses. To your point, it is very difficult to untangle this in the active arm because um, P2X3 receptor antagonist, which is the way our drug works, creates both the taste-related adverse events and a reduction in cough. We have done multiple analyses, and I'll ask Dr. Philip to walk through those analyses with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bollinger. Uh, indeed, we have uh, reviewed the data, uh, which I uh, can summarize from two perspectives. Uh, but to come directly to your question, uh, and in follow-up to what you heard from Dr. Bollinger, uh, we understand that gefapixin has a pharmacologic effect of efficacy, pharmacologic effect of taste AEs. In order to tease apart those effects, the best place to look is in the placebo group. So if we can call up the slide that shows the placebo group comparison with versus without a taste AE, I think that's the, the point of your question, slide up. What we see in the slide is that patients with the taste-related AEs did not have more benefit than patients without. This shows a within-group comparison of those patients with and without taste AEs in the placebo group, where the reduction from baseline at 52% in the patients without taste AEs was larger, actually, numerically, than the reduction in the patients with the taste AEs. So clearly, the hypothesis that somehow reporting a taste AE is driving efficacy is not evident when we look at the data in this uh, comparison that does not have the confounding of the dual pharmacologic effects. Thank you. Thanks for showing that. I know you briefly showed that previously. Uh, I just wanted to go back to it. Thank you, Dr. Giribaldi. And next is Dr. Vicario. All right, thank you. My question, I'll put the question out. I suspect um, Ms. Wynn from the Merck side would be the, the best to respond. But one of the, the clear differences in interpretation of the data we've seen this morning surrounds the, the PRO of, El, of the uh, Lester questionnaire. And if I recall correctly, in the sponsor's presentation, it was um, identified as one that has been validated with clinically um, relevant um, and detectable changes already um, described and published, whereas the FDA's 
perspective was seemingly contrary to that and did not seem to favor that a minimally important or minimally clinically perceptible difference has been described and and therefore the cut points um, that were used in the analyses are um, less uh, uh, clear and, and evidence-based. And I'm really trying to wrap my head around which of those two perspectives is is um, is the most um, accurate to what we understand, because I think it's actually going to be a relatively pivotal point in the decision-making process for the committee. So if Ms. Wynn could, could add anything to that, and if the FDA folks want to um, provide some comment, I would really appreciate it uh, to help clarify my thinking around this. Yes, and you are correct that the LCQ has been validated. I'll ask Allison Martin Nguyen to come to the microphone to provide you with additional information. Thank you. Um, yes, the there there is clearly a, a difference here in, in our presentations. Um, in in the uh, LCQ questionnaire development work, uh, that 1.3 point threshold, as I said, has been published uh, by the developer, uh, and we then subsequently conducted those analyses in our phase two program. I should note that uh, when we conducted those analyses in our phase two program, that was pooling our treatment groups together, which is a common method for uh, conducting anchor-based analyses, and so those uh the threshold that we identified using our phase two data was not uh, essentially cherry picking what would look best for jeff Pixon. it was uh, using pooled analyses perhaps uh what the the fda's concern is that uh, we did not get a chance to talk to them about those thresholds uh, prior to finalizing our phase three protocol however we did have subsequent discussions with the agency wherein uh, we returned to our phase two data, conducted those analyses again, uh, looking at higher anchor-based uh, thresholds of much improved and very much improved um, at their request. And that's where the 3.3 and the 4.1 thresholds uh, were, were uh, discovered or estimated and then applied in our uh, phase three program. The, Original analyses uh, that I, I talked about have been published and are in the peer-reviewed journal, and so um, it is our uh, we consider those to be an established uh, threshold. Thank you. For additional information, I'd like to call Dr. Beering, one of the developers of the LCQ, to the podium. Thank you, Dr. B uh, Dr. Bollinger. It's uh, Surinder Bering, a developer of the LCQ Pulmonologist and uh, Professor of Respiratory Medicine. Uh, the LCQ is a, a validated tool uh, to assess the impact of cough. It's uh, widely used in our field and it's been uh, recommended by the CHEST guidelines for managing cough. Uh, the 1.3 threshold was uh, developed using an anchor based uh, uh, method uh, rate and uh, rated as a uh, rated by patients as being uh, meaningful. It's widely used in the field, in the specialist clinics, also in clinical trials. Uh, we, as you've heard, we looked at uh, higher thresholds for much improved or very much improved, and the results were all consistent, favoring Jepapixan over placebo. Thank you. Dr. Bakari, does that answer your, your uh, questions? Uh, that is that's definitely helpful from the Merck perspective. I would want you know I would politely ask if there's uh, a reaction from the FDA to that additional um, set of comments. And we have Dr. Karimi Shah from the FDA. <clears throat> Oh, yes, this is uh, Stacey Chen from the FDA. So I agree with you, Dr. Vicaria. This seems to be a central point um, of this committee discussion. So I'm going to call on my colleagues from the Division of Clinical Outcome and Assessment Group um, to begin the discussion about the 1.3 threshold for the LCQ. This is Julie. I'm the primary reviewer from Division of Clinical Outcome Assessment, FDA. So I will start. 
and my TL, Dr. Evo, will continue uh, with uh, our additional concerns. So from FDA's regulatory consideration, and there should be sufficient qualitative and quantitative validity evidence to support interpretation that the PROs can support the reflect the concept of interest in the target context of use. So we acknowledge the applicant's qualitative study supports some of the concepts captured in the LCQ are relevant to patient experience. However, some of the concepts are distal. In other words, they are not cardinal to chronic curve and thus more heterogeneous and not well-defined. Also, some of distal concepts, for example, embarrassed or worried about curve, or curve interfered with the enjoyment of life, and feeling curve has annoyed their family, friend, or partner are uh, downstream from chronic curve and may be influenced by many other factors outside of the treatment or condition. Therefore, we conclude the LCQ total score is not fit for purpose. Hi everyone, um, this is Onye Kachuku, team lead in the Division of Clinical Outcome Assessment. And so I would add to what Dr. Um, Lee had said is, first before I talk about the 1.3 threshold and the concerns we have is, we have to be careful with the word um, using the term validated. Um, as from our experience, from a regulatory experience, the term validated doesn't necessarily meet um, regulatory requirement for what is considered to be a fit for purpose um, instrument. From FDA's regulatory perspective, an instrument is fit for purpose when there is um, great conclusion from all of the validity evidence that the instrument can um, help support the derivation of a well-defined and reliable endpoint. And that's not what we've seen with the LCQ total score, given the um, issues we have with you know, the um, distal concept. But setting aside the issue of the distal concept, yes, we did take a look at the 1.3 threshold proposed by Raj et al. Um, in the 2009 publication. And we have um, several, there are several methodologies methodological um, limitations with how that 1.3 threshold was derived. Um, so first, when you derive a threshold, you anchor it to um, a global scale that is inherently meaningful, right? So um, they use the scale called the global, I think it's called the global rating um, of change questionnaire. Um, Raj et al. used the global rating of change questionnaire to sort of anchor the change in the LCQ total score. And one thing we have about the scale is that it's a 15-point scale um, with response option ranging from plus 7 to negative 7. And these response options are not clinically distinct and they are overlapping. Um, another issue with using the um, global rating of change scale um, used in the publication is that we it's not clear what is considered meaningful on that anchor scale. Um, that's paramount to sort of getting a, a good um, threshold. And then most importantly, the way the threshold was derived is that the change in the LCQ total score was um, sort of um, anchored to a small change on the um, anchor skill. And how a small change was defined was that they combined categories um, representing improvement and um, worsening. So what that means is that the, the small change on the, on the um, anchor skill was defined as um, somewhat better, a little better, a little worse, and, a, and somewhat worse. So these are combined categories indicating improvement and um, worsening. And we typically would not recommend this approach. Um, if you are sort of um, deriving an improvement threshold, then you should focus on an improvement response category on that anchor skill. And more so, um, the threshold for meaningful worsening or meaningful improvement is not symmetrical. So that's a methodological um, limitation with how that was derived. And like we said, if we were to look at the improvement um, categories that were used, um, based on our experience and across multiple indications, patients have never endorsed somewhat better as meaningful on an anchor scale. So these are the main issues we'd ha we have with how that 1.3 threshold was derived. Hi, this is Dr. Lily Girard, statistician uh, from FDA. So since the applicant also brought up the um, 
the potential use of higher threshold on the LCQ total score, I do want to offer a clarification that these additional responder analyses uh, were proposed by the applicant, not requested by the FDA. And while FDA had agreed to review these additional responder analyses, um, as Dr. Lee mentioned earlier, we do not consider the LCQ total score to be fit for purpose. And this point was clearly communicated to the applicant uh, in communication during the current review cycle. Um, therefore, any additional responder analyses based on the LCQ total score are viewed as exploratory only. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, move on to the next panel member, but first I'd like to see if the um, uh, if Dr. Karimi Shaw has a comment to make from the FDA, and also uh, the sponsor has a member here that like, I would like to get to as well. Thank, um, this is Stacey Chin, FDA. Um, our team would just like to um, provide our perspective on the high placebo response and the impact that taste may have had on the response. I'll hand this over to the statistical review team. This is Susan Mayo, primary statistical reviewer. Um, could I have slide backup slide 126, please? So here we explored results of taste disturbance on cough frequency. Um, one thing we've discussed um, internally is we're not clear what what a response of placebo patients to um, taste disturbance, we don't really understand what that means. Um, there are concerns um, in, the, in the active arm uh, for unblinding. And uh, this slide um, presents the 24-hour frequency by whether subjects experience taste disturbance. Gefepixent 45 milligram subjects who experienced this had the smallest geometric mean ratio in cough frequency at week 24 in trial P30 or at week 12 in P27. Um, how to interpret this is unclear. The sponsor has their hand raised. Is, is um, Do you have... Um, uh, discussion that's relative to the clarifying question? And if so, please go ahead. Yes, we would like to respond to the patient reported outcome discussion and Dr. Mar Allison Martin Nguyen will come to the podium. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't want to, to to get into a back and forth with the agency on this point around the 3.3 and the 4.1 thresholds. Um, what 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 the issue was, uh, the agency did cons share concerns that the 1.3 threshold uh, did not seem appropriate to them based on the anchored based analysis that were conducted um, and asked, they didn't specifically ask us to look at 3.3 and 4.1. What the agency asked us to do as part of our discussions at the late cycle review were to revisit our phase two data to with those analyses using the higher anchor of much improved and, and very much improved on the PGIC. And from that analysis, uh, the 3.3 and the 4.1 thresholds were identified. And we did share the, those thresholds with the agency and uh, indicated that we would rerun re our analyses using those uh, as a sensitivity analysis to the 1.3 threshold. So I just wanted to clarify that, that one point. Thank you. Yes, and in addition, we would also like to have Dr. Dispengaitis address the questions about the relevance within the other domains. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Bollinger, Peter Dispingaitis, pulmonary critical care physician. Um, I opened my cough center 20 years ago, and since then I've personally evaluated over 2,400 chronic cough patients. And um, the discussion we're having here doesn't really reflect what I see and what I'm told by my patients. The psychological and social aspects of a persistent chronic cough um, are as important and in many cases more important to the patient than the physical domain. Of course, the physical domain, chest pain, urinary incontinence are very important, 
but patients tell me that their their lives are ruined because of by the cop because they've become socially isolated they haven't been to a restaurant or concerts or to church for 10 or 20 years in fact we did a study showing that 53 percent of the patients coming to see us test positive on a clinical depression scale so my experience is that the social and psychological aspects of RCC, UCC are as important, if not more important, than the physical domains. Thank you. And back to the panel members, uh, Dr. Hamlet. Yes, thank you. My question is for Dr. Philip, Nicole Hamlet. Um, my, there was no discussion of adherence to study drug, and in particular among those with taste-related adverse events that did not discontinue study drug. So I was hoping you can um, clarify that. And also the protocol that was provided in the in the Lancet article seemed to pre-specify a per-protocol analysis that presumably would provide an estimate of efficacy among those who tolerated and were fully uh, adherent. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to that as well um, as we consider um, these estimates of efficacy. Yes, Dr. Philip. Thank you, Dr. Bollinger. If I understand correctly, uh, your uh, question begins with, uh, compliance to therapy or adherence to therapy, and what data we have to support numbers uh, of patients who were appropriately taking therapy. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. So, of, of course, in our data, we collected uh, the treatment compliance adherence. Uh, and as commonly seen in well monitored clinical trials, about 95% of the patients were at least 80% compliant. Uh, there were no notable differences between the treatment groups uh, in the extent of exposure to the drug. Uh, and the uh, exposure and treatment compliance in each study individually was consistent with uh, the results that we generally present uh, across the pool data, which again, approximately 95% of the participants were compliant. Um, you acknowledged, uh, and we have discussed, that there are patients who discontinue therapy. Uh, some of those patients do continue in the study uh, so that we can continue to collect efficacy data, uh, maybe across all treatment arms, about a quarter of the patients. But uh, in terms of the patients who were to be on therapy, uh, whether or not they had a taste AE, they were compliant with therapy as long as they were continuously uh, receiving therapy. Thank you. Dr. Hadley, does that answer your question? Uh, sure, the, yes. Did, the, did you, for, by chance, do a per protocol analysis that looked more carefully uh, among those who tolerated and stayed on study drug? Yes, Dr. Hamlet, I'm gonna have Dr. LaRosa answer this question. Carmen LaRosa, clinical research. Uh, we did conduct a per protocol analysis, and the results was, were consistent with the uh, primary analysis. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next uh, panel member, Dr. Poon. Thank you, Cheryl Kuhn here. I appreciate the presentations by the sponsor and the FDA. I think that you did a really great job explaining how COAs are developed, the evidence that's usually needed or requested, and how we then interpret data from COAs. Um, there are a few pieces of information that I'm wondering if those, um, if data on them are available. And so I think that this question is for the sponsors. So first, did you conduct any qualitative interviews with patients to try to understand what would constitute a meaningful change in terms of their cough frequency or in terms of the PGIC? I'll ask Allison Martin Nguyen to speak to this question. 
Thank you, Dr. Kuhn. Uh, we did conduct qualitative research, as I, I noted, to confirm the content validity of the LCQ. As part of that, uh, we also did cognitive debriefing of the LCQ. We did not specifically uh, debrief on the patient global impression of change. Um, and however, through that uh, qualitative work, we did hear from patients uh, through that those interviews around their cough frequency that, um, similar to what Dr. Dispengaitis mentioned, that total you know re reduction to 100% of their cough is not something that they're uh, expecting. Uh, but it, that was uh, qualitative uh, information. It wasn't uh, quantitative per se. I can show um, for those who are interested, if we have slide up, the um, to to support the the LCQ as uh, sorry we were we need to get onto our system so I can show this slide. Uh, in terms of the LCQ, it has gone through a quite rigorous process of development and validation, uh, as, is, as is standard in the scientific community around patient reported uh, development. The, it started with the literature review, uh, ex reviewing what already existed in the literature. As Dr. Burring noted, the qualitative concept elicitation was conducted early on with patients with chronic cough, it was published in 2003. That went through an item reduction phase uh, where it looked at uh, impact factor method with 104 patients. Uh, they also conducted a, a, a psychometric study uh, in that uh, process. Then the psychometric validation that we uh, already had talked about with, with, that was published uh, by Raj. Uh, we conducted the psychometric uh, validation again, specifically in the RCC and UCC population that I noted was published in, in 2022. And then the qualitative uh, interviews that we uh, conducted at the request of the agency, where we uh, interviewed another 20 patients with uh, specifically with RCC and UCC that were uh, representative of the phase three population. Uh, and through that, did the, the concept elicitation and then also cognitive debriefing. Um, and you know, the, the culmination of all of that work, uh, we are highly confident that this is a, a valid measure for assessing the, the full impact of cough on patients' lives. Thank you. Thank you. In terms of additional evidence, do you have cumulative distribution functions that show the change on the different PRO scores by the PGIC categories from your phase 2B study? Yes, we do. I'll have Allison Martin Nguyen return to the podium. <laughs> Yes, we do have, um, actually we have them from uh, phase three. Uh, if I can have a slide up, this is the, uh, the CDF curves of the PGIC, uh, same measure that was used in phase two was used in phase three. Uh, you can see the 1.3 line that's uh, shown here uh, that uh, across all the PGIC categories. We also have, um, these curves um, at week, for just for protocol 30 at week 24, if we can show that slide up, please. Again, here, this is protocol 30 week 24, which was our primary uh, time for, point for analysis. And you know, from this, we we know we we feel confident that the LCQ is tracking those scores are tracking with uh, categories of the PGIC. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have these for cough frequency by chance? We actually do. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> And one second till we pull that slide. Thank you. Can I have the um, cumulative distribution curves, the CDF curves for cough, 24 hour cough frequency in the pooled analysis? Sorry. 
maybe I can maybe I can uh, we do have we do have that analysis let me uh, take a I'll take a, a minute here to find that and I can bring I can bring that back for you thank you thank you and then the last CDF I was curious about is if you do have that for the treatment groups so by the COA score looking at the change in the score over time by treatment arm Allison Martin Nguyen. Sorry, we're still trying to pull that slide. <clears throat> Can I have um, PR 36, please? Thank you. Can you uh, slide up, please? So I think this is uh, what you're looking for, Dr. Kuhn. This is the CDF curve of the LCQ total score by treatment group uh, in the protocol 27 pool at week 24. And uh, on the vertical lines, you can see we have uh, lined in the 4.1, the 3.3, and the 1.3 threshold. Um, and essentially what this shows us is that the difference between Jeffapixin and the placebo group is uh, obvious across a range of thresholds, not uh, only at the 1.3, but also all the way up to the 4.1 threshold. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Carvalho, I do have a couple more questions that I know that we are time sensitive. So should I um, stand down and come back and we have time later? Thank you for asking, Dr. Kuhn, and uh, we'll come back to you. So go ahead and just raise your hand again. Uh, Dr. Kelso, you're back on. Uh, yes, there was a question earlier about uh, trying to assess the effect of the taste disturbance on the outcome, and it was answered once by the sponsor and once by the FDA, but using different metrics. The the response that was given by the sponsor was to show us data in the placebo group about taste disturbance. Do you have that same data for the treatment group? Yes, we do. Dr. Phillip will return to the microphone. So again, remember the Question of interest here is whether reporting of the taste AE is impacting efficacy. And we have the confounding of both of these being pharmacologic effects of Jeffapixent that could travel together. Uh, what I showed previously was that in the non confounded comparison between those with and without a taste AE in the placebo group, uh, there was no evidence of greater efficacy present. In, the, uh, in those with the taste AE. Uh, we could expect, however, these effects to travel together in the Jeffapixin group uh, slide up. And what we see is that the same metric that you saw with the placebo group now in Jeffapixin, improvement from baseline. Uh, uh, if we can bring the slide up for the uh, cough frequency, please. Uh, is numerically greater, uh, slide up please. Uh, for Jeffapixent, 64% uh, improvement from baseline versus 56% without a taste AE. Uh, so as expected, a larger improvement from baseline. But if in fact reporting the taste AEs was having a substantial effect on efficacy, we might have expected perhaps even a larger contrast between these two subgroups. Uh, what we see here clearly is a difference, but one that is easily explained by the activity of the drug. Uh, in the broader context, to understand that what we observed in our uh, clinical program is clinically meaningful is the broader sense of what Jeffapixin versus placebo has generated uh, and stepping back to understand that we see efficacy uh, meeting what we believe is the uh, substantial evidence of effectiveness by looking at active versus placebo, 
um, in cough counts, um, whether the original count or the recount, the data are very similar. Uh, even if the p-value varies a little bit with the small variation in the uh, 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 in, in the actual uh, effect size, broadly speaking, that effect uh, is still present uh, in both counts, and that effect is really the question that has been brought to the committee today. Uh, FDA has mentioned that in the various PROs that we uh, studied in our program, uh, that these were not multiplicity adjusted, uh, which is true, of course, uh, but remember that the standard for approval uh, of substantial evidence of, of effectiveness uh, is not quite the same as the question that's being asked today. The reason why secondary endpoints are included in clinical trials, even if not statistically powered for a p-value, is to provide additional evidence, to provide context for what efficacy is meaningful and inform the interpretation of the primary and key secondary multiplicity adjusted analyses. What we see when looking at the uh, patient reported outcomes where patients are telling us what's important to them on endpoints that have been validated to be relevant to understanding their cough slide up. We see whether or not in the presence of multiplicity adjusted p-values, what the patients are telling us on gefapixent versus placebo shows consistent benefit of gefapixent over placebo. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is not addressing my question. So my specific question you did answer, if you can bring that other slide back up, is that in uh, people who had the taste disturbance did in fact do better than those who did not have the taste disturbance. And there's uh, many possible explanations for that, but it leaves open the possibility that uh, some of the tiny improvement seen overall in the patients receiving the drug could have been affected by this unblinding effect is my interpretation of that. And uh, so, so you've answered my question. Thank you. Uh, it's, I, I, agree, I agree that there are many factors in play here. It can be hard to separate those factors. I, I think it is relevant to look at the data that maybe most cleanly answer this question, which is the data you saw previously in the placebo group, which does not suggest such a, a relationship uh, as being uh, active in this group. Uh, and we believe this supports overall the efficacy that's been demonstrated with Jeff Abixen. Thank you. Dr. Kelso, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, next on the list is Dr. Corey. Mark Corey, ENT. So I, I, I think I'm becoming more confused with the questions, but I, I, that the um, <clears throat> the cough frequency, the absolute cough frequency change, was that compared with your anchor base analysis questions, and um, how does that relate to the you know as I see it, the 64 percent with the placebo with the taste effect had a closer response to the group as a whole than the people without the taste of side effect. So um, <clears throat> it seems to be influencing the results, possibly. Um, you know, what is the proposed mechanism of action? I thought I heard from the Merck pres sponsor presentation that the <clears throat> taste side effect didn't always last. And if the taste side effect went away, how did the, what is the mechanism proposed for the continued response to the medication for cough suppression? I'll ask Dr. Smith to respond to that question. Thank you, Dr. Bollinger. So as someone who uh, recruited patients to these trials and therefore talked to many patients with taste AEs, um, you're absolutely right. Some of these taste AEs did settle down during the conduct of the trial. And I think the um, ongoing efficacy of the drug despite that speaks somewhat to uh, the taste AEs not mediating the effects here. Thank you. Dr. Corey, does that answer your question? 
Well, no, I, I, well, I, I, it answers the question, but I, I might disagree with the response. Any other comments? Or no, questions? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next uh, is Emma D'Agostino. Thank you, Dr. Dar uh, Dr. D'Agostino. Um, I'd like to go back to Dr. Kelso's line of questioning. I'm wondering if either the sponsor or the FDA has that same analysis uh, parsed by who did and didn't experience taste days, but with the PROs, um, could be the LCQ analysis, um, any of the PROs, but if we could see um, any of the analyses by who and did and did not experience taste days. We do have that data, Dr. Philip. Thanks, Dr. Bollinger. Uh, so following the logic that you've heard me discuss before, let me bring up the data you're asking for uh, in the placebo group first. We do have both the objective cough counting as well as the, uh, uh, the subjective measure. In this case, our key subjective measure being uh, the LCQ in the placebo group first, please, uh, so that we can have that comparison uh, unconfounded, and then I will also show you the efficacy in the Jeff Apixent group on the subjective endpoints. Yes, slide up, please. So this uh, slide adds to what you saw previously, uh, already shown, build it please, uh, was the 24-hour cough frequency, and now uh, added is the LCQ total score, here expressed as the proportion of responders. We have both the 24-week and 52-week time point, and what you see is essentially some flip-flop between the proportions, reporting uh, larger proportions of responders uh, with versus without the taste AE, uh, so clearly no uh, clear evidence that having the taste AE somehow is driving efficacy as judged by the patient, even on this subjective endpoint. Uh, we turn now to the Jeff Pixon arm, looking at the LCQ responders again, slide up. Now we're looking at proportions of responders, again, week 24 and week 52. Uh, here with the drug effect present, uh, we see evidence of efficacy. Uh, as well as uh, a large proportion, a relatively large proportion of patients reporting the taste AE. In those with the taste AE, a somewhat higher proportion were responders versus without uh, at both time points. But again, if having a taste AE had a really substantial effect on the patient's perception or even expectation that they're getting active drug that would affect how they complete their subjective uh, scores on the LCQ, we might have expected larger uh, than these uh, essentially single digit differences between proportions. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Um, can I ask one more just quick question on the taste AEs? Can you just tell me a little bit more about how these taste AEs manifested? I know we talked about what they were classified as, but is this while you're eating? Is this experience 24 hours a day? Um, what exactly are these symptoms? I know we talked about how often they resolved and how quickly they resolved, but how is this going to manifest in daily life? Yes, Dr. Augustino, I'll ask Dr. Willis to come to the podium for that description. Thank you. English Willis, Clinical Safety and Risk Management. What we know of the taste-related AEs is that they do appear early and on, on um, soon after taking the drug at about day two. We also know that of the patients who reported a taste-related AE, they reported them as mild. Um, in looking at the duration, the, most of the patients maintain their, ta their taste-related AE for a duration of about an, um, 194 days. We also know that how they describe them. Um, and the description of the taste-related AEs were primarily a salty, bitter, or metallic 
metallic taste. Um, we also know that patients from the data that 25% of the patients resolve their taste-related AE around 65 days into treatment. Um, in terms of the, uh, the information of association with food, that information was not collected during the, during the trials. Thank you. I see that the FDA has their um, hand raised. Are there yes. any doors now? Yes, this is Stacy Chin, FDA. So we just wanted to provide our perspective on the taste disturbance AEs and the potential impact on the interpretation of the efficacy results. So both we and the applicant have looked into it um, and how the both gefapixant group and placebo group who did or did not have taste AEs responded on the various endpoints. And our takeaway is that it it's an unquantifiable uncertainty. We just do not know how that may have impacted um, potential unblinding or bias in this study. And in our mind, it takes on more importance because the treatment effect size is rather small between the placebo and gefapixan groups. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next is Dr. Rank. Hi, Matt Rank. Thanks to all the excellent presenters. Thanks, Dr. Hermalho. My question has to do uh, with another thing related to potentially uncertainty in evidence, and it's related to the dropout rate in the in the trials, the two pivotal trials. I noticed that it looked like the dropout rates exceeded 20% by a little bit in both trials, and that there was differential dropout rates. My question is for the FDA. Did the statistical and various analyses that you performed um, were they sufficient, uh, do you believe, to reduce concerns about this potential impact on the certainty of evidence for these trials? Stacey Chen, FDA. So I'm going to summarize your question. Um, you would like us to comment on whether the relatively high dropout rate of greater than 20% or so um, had any impact, whether that missing data had any impact on the analyses. I will turn this question over to our statistical reviewers. Dr. Chin, that's correct. And also the differential dropout rate of about 10% between okay. the two arms. Thanks. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, thank you for the good question. Uh, I'm Yang Nam Kim, statistical team leader. So would you bring up a slide uh, 66? Back up slide. Uh, back, uh, main slide 60, sorry, main slide 66. Now, while you are waiting for the slide, I'll briefly answer the question. The significant imbalance in three month discontinuation between 45 milligram and placebo uh, um, did not lead to the same degree of imbalance in missingness at the landmark time point, uh, which was. 29% in 45 mg and 15% in placebo. Uh, would you uh, bring up the slide, back up slide 86? So the initial uh, high uh, treatment consequential rate uh, we 29% in percent group was reduced to uh, the 21% uh, in terms of missing needs. So uh, we think uh, this may be, uh, may be due to the continuing of the collection, data collection after three months condition. So uh, the missing needs, uh, imbalance may be reduced and uh, uh, we conducted sensitive analysis uh, and um, this support uh, uh, primary analysis uh, we shown with the set uh, the thirteen point analysis. Did I answer your question? Can you repeat the last thing you said just one more time, please? Yeah, our, our sensitive analysis uh, and applicant sensitive analysis, uh, including. Tipping point analysis supported the primary analysis results. Thank you. Yes, you answered my question. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Rank. And also, um, the sponsor has their hand raised. If you could make a comment. That may have been for follow-up to one of the previous questions. Would you like to proceed with that? Not at this point, thank you. Sounds good. Um, Dr. Kim. Uh, Edwin Kim, Allergy and Immunology at the University of North Carolina. I have a question uh, for the sponsor. Um, so uh, I'm trying to understand the placebo effect. And uh, there was a slide that showed that a strong placebo effect is, is a known thing in trials like this. I think a couple of other trials were shown. And um, just understanding in this, in this study, many patients had these symptoms for over 10 years. Uh, seemingly has been on other therapies without efficacy, and then somehow it, as on placebo or having objective improvement in cough up to 50% decrease. Is there an understanding in the field or uh, with the sponsor of how, what that mechanism might be? Because uh, again, the, the difference between the, the gefapixent and placebo is not very large. And so I do think it's important to try to understand where this placebo effect is coming from. Yes, Dr. Kim, Thanks. Dr. Smith will respond to your question. Thank you, Dr. Barnger. Uh, Jackie Smith, uh, pulmonologist from the University of Manchester. So the way we understand the placebo effects in these studies, um, a great deal of it comes from other therapeutic areas, but there is some evidence in cough as well. Slide up. Slide up, please. Thank you. So the placebo effect, as we understand it, is, is multifactorial. And there are probably three main things to mention. There are, there are some non-specific factors about being in clinical trials that in, improve patient symptoms. But the other two main ones that we think are important here that may have increased between phase two and phase three are the expectations of the patients and regression to the mean. So what we know about the neuronal pathways that uh, mediate cough uh, include the central nervous system, both cortical and subcortical areas. And we have evidence in patients and in healthy controls that there are descending inhibitory pathways present in this patient group and, and, and even in a healthy cough reflex, which are capable of inhibiting cough in response to cognitive processes such as expectation. And I, I understand the concern that these patients have been coughing for 10 years uh, and not responded to previous other treatments. But I think we have to put this in context in that patients were enrolled to these studies uh, with the knowledge that previous trials had shown positive findings in patients just like them who hadn't responded to previous therapies. So I think the level of expectation here that here's the first therapy that is going to work for your refractory and unexplained chronic cough did have an effect here. And then the last thing that I think I should mention is regression to the mean. Uh, the patients recruited into the phase three studies uh, had a greater severity of their cough compared to the phase 2b. So on the cough severity visual analog scale, their severity was approximately uh, scored at approximately 70 millimeters. And so that increases the possibility of some of the placebo, uh, some of the effects we see in the placebo treated arm being due to regression of the mean. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. And uh, I, I bring it up because the 60% reduction that's been showcased uh, is, is exciting. At the same time, uh, in the clinic, if they're not enrolled in clinical trials without these expectations and some of these other factors, I wonder if that's a realistic expectation uh, for those patients. Uh, that's all my questions. Thank you very much. Can we follow up with that, Dr. Kim, please? So if, if I could just respond to that, uh, I mean, I think the way that we expect gifepixent would be used in the clinic would be uh, in the same patient group that have been recruited to these phase three trials. And I wouldn't anticipate that the expectation of these patients out, outside of a clinical trial is uh, going to be any less than it was within these trials uh, with the knowledge that this, this drug has been previously shown to be effective. 
Uh, if it's okay, I'd also like to just take the opportunity to talk a little bit about the effect size. So what patients are experiencing in these studies is, is as you say, this 60% drop in, in their cough frequency. Um, and I note that uh, the agency has some concerns that this is a not, not a large drop over the placebo and have looked at the absolute change in, in cough frequency uh, of just one to two coughs per hour. I think there's two points I'd really like to make about that. First of all, when you talk to patients about their cough and study cough frequency, it becomes apparent that patients don't really think of their cough in terms of one or two or five coughs per hour. They're, they're just not aware of that. They perceive improvements in their cough based on the reduction relative to their baseline. And as we've heard already, the baseline cough frequencies in this patient group are quite variable. And so people with very high cough frequencies may not notice a reduction of, say, five coughs per hour if they've started off at 50 coughs per hour. But if you start off at 10 coughs per hour and reduce by five coughs per hour, you really notice that because it's a 50% improvement. So we would very much support the use of percentage change as opposed to uh, absolute reductions in cough frequency as being the important endpoint or the most important endpoint to look in these studies. And that's corroborated by some of the data that Alison Nguyen showed you earlier, that this has a much stronger correlation with the patient global rating of change than we saw with absolute change. And then the second thing I'd just mentioned that even if we do focus on the one to two costs per hour, I think it's it's really important that we, we don't um, underestimate the impact of that for patients. Patients don't see a reduction of one to two costs per hour. The, the bulk of this coughing is actually occurring during waking hours, so it's concentrated within the day, and they don't cough evenly in that way. The coughs cluster together in bouts that are really unpleasant. And it's those prolonged bouts that lead to people having to leave the room when they're in a meeting or have an episode of urinary incontinence. If you can shorten those bouts by a little bit or knock out some of those bouts, that can just make enough difference to a patient that they're going to appreciate an improvement in their quality of life. Thank you. We have about uh, five minutes left. So first I'd like to ask the FDA if they have any comment uh, to what's been discussed. If not, we'll move on. Uh, this is Stacy Chen, FDA. So um, we recognize that the baseline cough count um, and frequency does have a role in the perceived benefit in the reduction of cough. Um, that being said, what we are seeing is a pretty small difference, um, sort of no matter where you look across the re responder curves and thresholds. And so that's our main question for the committee is we're seeing these small differences across endpoints with this potential unblinding issue, and is that meaningful? So we, we don't want this to get too much in the weeds of a discussion of methodological concerns or content validity issues. It's really, are these small differences meaningful and perceptible to patients? Thank you. We will move on to Dr. Kuhn. Thank you, Cheryl Kuhn here. I think my question actually flows really well from the last question, which is to the sponsor. Can you put into words how a healthcare provider might convey the treatment benefit to a patient when looking at the relative reduction in the geometric mean ratio? I ask that because the primary endpoint is a very complex statistical endpoint, and ultimately that information has to be conveyed to the patients to make treatment decisions with their healthcare providers. Absolutely. I'd like to call Dr. Dispeningaitis to the podium, who has these conversations with patients every day with off-label use of medications. So I'd like for him to share his perspective on how he would talk to patients about Jeffapixin. Thank you, Dr. Bollinger. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, um, patients aren't coming in with the expectation that we'll eliminate all cough. Um, they want their cough just to, if possible, be in the background as opposed to the foreground of every minute uh, or every hour of their waking day. So there's no demand or expectation for 100% reduction. There's just um, enough to change their quality of life. And as we mentioned before, you know, coughing six times an hour versus 12 times an hour may make a patient, a person comfortable enough to go out in public to a restaurant or concert. Um, Urinary incontinence is almost invariably due to a bout of severe coughing. 
you'd only have to minimize the severity or length of that cough to possibly even eliminate urinary incontinence. So patients aren't looking for a complete uh, uh, elimination of cough, but just enough to change their quality of life. And I can say that uh, when we do improve cough by 25, 50% as rated by the patients, that translates often into a significant um, degree of satisfaction by the patient. Thank you. Oh. And we're, we've got only about a minute left, so I'd like to ask Dr. Corey to ask his question. This is to Dr. Smith. Uh, were there any other co-therapies applied simultaneously during the, during the trial period? In other words, we do a lot of cognitive behavioral therapies with our patients, and we have an 85% percentage reduction in cough from that alone. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Dr. Bollinger. Uh, so within these studies, patients weren't receiving other treatments to address their refractory or unexplained chronic cough. Uh, many of the more specialist centers, uh, uh, like yourselves, do um, cough control therapy, uh, which has been shown to be beneficial in a, in a small number of trials. But patients couldn't be included in these studies if that was that couldn't be commenced or uh, couldn't be started within, if I remember correctly, about three months of the start of the trial. So those sorts of therapies uh, were not we're not having an influence on any of the effects seen here. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, uh, to some extent. I mean, you, we never know exactly what about the CBT therapies help the patients. Um, so even just True. the presence. True, exactly. They're, they're complex interventions. And, and whilst we've seen in double-blind randomized control trials that, that they can reduce cough frequency by about sort of 30 to 40%, we, we don't really know what components of those therapies are, are making the difference there, and there are multiple components to them. Is it just being in the room with a clinician who seems to care? So. Probably not, because the control trials have used them, uh, sham therapies, so they have had contact, the same sorts of contact with uh, healthcare services, so it's probably not just that. Mm -hmm. And just one follow-up on the proposed mechanism whereby they, they both work on P2X3 pathway. I, I'm, I'm still confused on how if the taste uh, abnormality goes away, the, continue, the cough suppression continues. I, I just can't. Sure. So, so in terms of the mechanism of action, uh, we believe the antitussive effects uh, at P2X3 ion channels on the sensory nerves present in the airways that are controlling cough. The taste side effects are due to slightly different channels. Based on animal models, we believe they're heteromeric channels. So these channels have a mixture of P2X3 and 2 subunits. So they're a little bit different and they're found on the nerves that are innovating the taste buds. So Jeffapixant's modestly selective for P2X, the, the pure P2X3 ion channels that we think mediate cough over those heteromeric channels. And as I said before, what we saw in the study is yes, uh, a number of our patients uh, had their cough, uh, apologies, had their taste AE settled down during the study. And if that were mediating the treatment effect, what I would expect to see is the effect of Jeffapixant waning over time and coming closer to placebo. But that is not what the data tells us. So it would appear that those patients whose taste for AEs went away maintain the efficacy of the drug. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you to the panel and to the sponsor and to the FDA. Um, we will now break for lunch. We're going to reconvene at 1.30. And panel members, please remember, there should be no discussion of the meeting topics or the other panel members, members during the lunch. And additionally, we should plan to reconvene at around 1.20 p.m. to ensure you're connected before we uh, start the meeting again at 1.30. Thank you, everybody.
everybody. We will now begin the open public hearing session. Both the FDA and the public believe in a transparent process for information, gathering and decision making, <clears throat> excuse me, to ensure such transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee meeting. FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, the FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your written or oral statement, to advise the committee of any financial relationship that you may have with the applicant, its product, and if known, its direct competitors. For example, this financial information may include the applicant's payment of your travel, lodging, or other expenses in connection with your participation in the meeting. Likewise, the FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. The FDA and this committee place great importance in the open public hearing process. The insights and comments provided can help the agency and this committee in their consideration of the issues before them. That said, in many instances and for many topics, there will be a variety of opinions. One of our goals for today is for this open public hearing to be conducted in a fair and open way where every participant is listened to carefully and treated with dignity, courtesy, and respect. Therefore, please speak only when recognized by the chairperson. For today's open public hearing, each presenter has been allotted three minutes for their presentation. And I apologize in advance that I, I may have to stop it at three minutes or just a few seconds beyond because we have a, lo a long number of speakers. Thank you for your cooperation. Speaker number one, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number one begin and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. You have three minutes. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Gloria and I am a patient and have not been compensated for my remarks. I have had a chronic cough for eight to nine years. What I can tell you, it can come on at any time, including in the shower, sitting or driving in the car, when I am preparing food or eating a meal, having a friendly conversation or speaking to someone on the phone. I used to laugh a lot. Now I'm apprehensive to watch a comedy because I may want to laugh and laughing will make me cough. Coughing for four to five minutes rattles my body and my personality. Lately, if I cough, I'm afraid I will move my bowels. When I began coughing, I went to a pulmonologist, an ENT, and gastrointestinologist. I was referred to an allergist and a speech pathologist. I don't have allergies, and the speech pathologist wanted me to increase my pitch. I went to an acupuncturist and a naturalist. I followed a food plan and lost 20 pounds. Still no relief. I had a pH capsule attached to the distal esophagus. There was no significant correlation between cough or reflux. Finally, I changed to a more expensive health insurance plan. So I'm able to see doctors at the cough clinic at Cleveland Clinic. The medication prescribed brought some relief for a few weeks. Then the cough broke through to its usual level. I wanted relief in July and September this year I had injections in both sides of my neck. The shots were worthless. My occupation the last nine years is to assist people. It is a telephone position speaking constantly to customers for seven and a half hours a day. Can you imagine speaking to someone and without warning cough uncontrollably? I can barely ask them to hold while I grasp for a long drink of water, relax my body and regain my composure and continue my conversation. The only thing that helps me is drinking water. And anytime I leave my home, I have to know where a bathroom is located. I am suffering with chronic cough every day. I don't cough once or twice a day, but at least 15 to 20 times a day. Each occurrence can be wrenching, taking away my energy. This affects my spouse, my children, my grandchildren, my family and friends. Plus when I go to the grocery store, I wear a mask. Sometimes I hunch over, 
and cough relentlessly in the stores. I feel people stare as if I were Quasimodo. I can't tolerate the coughing anymore. Sometimes I wonder if coughing will affect my longevity. Please, I need treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Speaker number two, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number two begin and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. And you have three minutes. I'm Anju Peters. I'm an allergist at Northwestern. I actually submitted a PowerPoint if that can come on also. Thank you very much. I take care of lots of patients with chronic cough. My disclosures, Merck has funded some of our research in chronic cough, and I've participated in two advisory boards. Next. So we know what chronic cough is, which is cough present for more than eight weeks. Refractory is if cough is associated with other underlying conditions, but persist despite treatment of those conditions. And then unexplained chronic cough is cough for which we have not found a condition and continues to be present. Next slide. This is a qualitative study that we participated on. Many of my patients uh, reported on this, and this was looking at impact of chronic cough, which is in blue, and unexplained chronic cough, which is in green, and total chronic cough is in orange on daily activities. As you can see, starting from the left, chronic cough has significant impact on patients' daily activities, including their ability to communicate, sleep, including their partners can't often sleep, and has a rela uh, plays a role in their relationships. People feel stigmatized from cough, as we just heard. So it does play a huge role on daily activities. Next slide. In addition, what this study showed that we participated in is patients with chronic cough often are very frustrated. More than half of them will say that they're embarrassed by their chronic cough. They're always afraid. They never know when the cough will come. And it has, again, a significant negative impact on their quality of life. Next slide. This is a study from UK where they did a survey on patients with chronic cough. Chronic cough is in blue. Gray is those individuals who don't have chronic cough. And as you can see by the arrows that I, that I put in this slide, patients with chronic cough are more likely to report having depression compared to those without chronic cough. Next slide. And in this survey, what they also looked at is the impact of chronic cough in people's ability to work, as we just heard. Chronic cough patients are more likely to miss work because of their cough. And even when they're at work, presenteeism, they are impaired because of their chronic cough. And overall, their impairment is higher at work compared to those without chronic cough. Next slide. And finally, this was a study that we did at Northwestern looking at our patients with chronic cough who come to their primary care physicians. And as you can see on that graph, they've had more than four to six visits with their primary care physician and continue to cough. They're often prescribed or by themselves take multiple medications, which can have side effects, including antibiotics, steroids, opiate, et cetera, without benefit to their chronic cough. Next slide. So in conclusion, I've shared with you just a little bit in terms of chronic cough, it has significant negative impact on quality of life. These individuals are more likely to report depression. It leads to work productivity loss. It affects them every day. They try many medications without relief. And so in conclusion, chronic cough has a significant burden on our patients and these patients deserve some treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe that speaker number three is not here. So we'll go on to speaker number four, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number four begin and introduce yourself. Please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record, and you have three minutes. Good afternoon, esteemed FDA advisory panel. My name is Mary Alexuk. I am 61 years young, a patient living with chronic cough. I have no conflict of interest and am not being compensated. I am just delighted to be speaking with you today. 
I had been coughing for a little over four years before I started my 18 month medical journey to being diagnosed with chronic cough. My daily life challenges included coughing uncontrollably, leading to intense chest, rib, and pleura pain. I stopped eating at restaurants as my coughing would cause a scene. I had a hard time keeping conversations with family and friends as I would have horrible coughing fits. I had difficulty completing a Pilates class and it was impossible to go to the gym. In January of 2019, I knew I could no longer ignore my symptoms when I had started coughing so uncontrollably that I would vomit multiple times a day, every day. This uncontrolled cough had an enormous impact on my physical health, mental health, family life, daily professional life, social life, diet, and the ability to travel. At the time, I was an executive the chief human resources officer at a Fortune 100 company. During critical strategy executive team and board meetings, I was told that I was disrupting participants' decision-making skills. My coughing was so completely distracting and derailing meetings that I was asked to continue to participate in the meetings from my office and to just please keep myself on mute. I was mortified because at the time I just couldn't perform and make the professional impact in my role that I knew I could have. Everyone was extremely kind and sympathetic. Everyone had many suggestions on which doctors I should consult for my coughing condition. Just as COVID was starting to get attention, I needed to fly to San Francisco. My cough was completely uncontrollable for the entire flight back. Flight attendants gave me any and as many blankets as they could find and just asked me to please cover up and try to muffle my cough as I was distracting everyone around me. My cough was very hard to diagnose. It took about a year and a half. I needed to take time off from work to seek medical help. Every doctor and specialist I saw were pretty sure I had whatever was their specialty as my cough had spun off many side symptoms that seemed to point to bronchitis, pleuritis, pneumonia, whooping cough, asthma, GERD, and I was prescribed different medications, treatments, protocols that didn't help and sometimes made the coughing much, much worse. I underwent many tests, procedures, and medications before getting an accurate diagnosis of chronic cough and a treatment plan. I learned through careful monitoring that my chronic cough is triggered by so many common everyday items, chocolate, flaky food, very dry conditions, cold temperatures like opening the refrigerator, as well as cold foods, ice cream, ice, drinks, just to name a few. I've learned a lot in my journey and I'm extremely grateful to my doctor at the Cleveland Cough Clinic for helping me and diagnose my chronic cough and helping me get my life back on track. Thank you so much for listening to my story. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And now speaker number five, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number five begin and introduce yourself. Please state your name and any organization you are represent for the record. And you have three minutes. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gary Gross. I'm representing myself and I'm not being compensated for my time. My first clinical trial was done in 1978 was when I was on the full-time faculty at UT Southwestern Medical School in the pulmonary division working with Alan Pierce. When I was not aerosolizing bacteria into mice to investigate mechanisms in pneumonia, I treated and taught about asthma. My first trial looked at terbutylene as a bronchodilator. I have continued to do clinical research, having completed over 400 studies. I'm an adjunct professor of internal medicine at UT Southwestern and continue to teach. My interest in chronic cough began in 2015 when Afferent was looking at the molecule under discussion today. I had a few patients who had chronic cough and had tried everything available suggested by the literature. One of my patients, a dentist whose husband is an MD, had tried multiple cough centers, including UMass, and she continued to cough. The original study we did was a crossover, and it was apparent to the staff and patients when they were on the active crossover period. Patients described those periods of relief as much better or wonderful when comparing their diaries, completing their diaries. VAS scores went from 75 to 48, 51 to 1, and 74 to 2. The patients not only reported improvement, but related that family members, friends, and colleagues also noted improvement in their cough. I've conducted about 13 chronic cough studies, and the P2X3 antagonist molecules have shown the most consistent benefit. I believe that chronic cough is a heterogeneous disease. Some patients with chronic cough may not respond to this molecule, but may respond to other antagonists under investigation. If the population studied in, is heterogeneous and not enriched for the outcome you are measuring, it is harder to see a response in mean data. The outliers at the ends of the distribution curve may be missed. There is no way to enrich this population for P2X3 responders because there are no clinical markers. If anything, the population studied 
was deprived of the good responders because an exclusion criteria of the pivotal trials was prior exposure to the molecule. Centers still had to enroll an average of six patients per trial, potentially using less than ideal patients. Despite this obstacle, the studies met the primary endpoint, and, and even after data manipulation, one study continued to meet statistical significance, while the other was just over the P value of 0.05 for the primary endpoint. I think the body of evidence, including the early studies with this molecule and the two larger studies, clearly show a benefit for some patients with chronic cough and have no other treatments available. The characterization of chronic cough as a symptomatic condition minimizes the suffering of these patients, as pre Peter previously noted. One of our patients cried when we had to reclaim her drugs after the afferent study, the first uh, drug that afforded her relief and a normal life. Another patient is estranged from her daughter because her daughter thinks mom could stop coughing if she really wanted to. We have a patient who delivers cars for his company. He passed out while coughing on a drive from Abilene to Dallas. There are many other patient reports of isolation and removal from social events due to their cough as previously mentioned. In my opinion, not only is this an ideal first drug to be approved for chronic cough because of its efficacy, but also because of the taste effect. I recognize as you do that clinical trials differ from actual practice. The patients who have a significant benefit from gefapixin will continue to take the drug despite the inconvenience of some taste effect, while the patients who did not derive this benefit will discontinue the drug. If it is not approved, not only will patients unnecessarily suffer from cough, but other pharmaceutical companies may redirect their resources to other drugs which have an easier path to approval. This outcome would be harmful to patients and potential future discoveries in the field of chronic cough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, speaker number six, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number six begin and introduce yourself. Please state your name and any organization you're, you are representing for the record. And you have three minutes. It won't start. It says the host has stopped it. Trying to start my video. All right, there we go. Sorry. Hello, sorry about that. Um, my name is Carol and I'm almost 68 years old. I'm a patient and I have not been paid to speak here today. I've had a chronic cough for approximately 35 of my 68 years. This has caused me much embarrassment, frustration, discomfort, fear, and guilt in my work, home, and social lives through those 35 years. I feel terribly for my supportive husband and now grown kids who have had to listen to and worry about me coughing at the slightest irritation, which includes speaking, eating, showering, breathing in, air conditioning, getting up from reclining, etc., or randomly with no known cause. I've always been afraid of getting through meetings, my kids' recitals, weddings, funerals, plays, movies, grocery stores, etc., without coughing and have to had and have had to leave on occasion to get through a coughing fit. I've seen pulmonologists, gastroenterologists, otolaryngologists, speech therapists, and my primary care physicians over the years. I've had numerous diagnostic procedures, including endoscopies, esophageal manometry, asthma spirometry and challenge tests, bar barium swallow tests, chest x-rays, and I'm awaiting another endoscopy to test esophageal strength. None of these tests have found a treatable reason for my cough. Through the years, I've tried gabapentin, amitriptyline, various inhalers, allergy pills and nasal sprays, neti pots, speech therapy, numerous GERD medications, over-the-counter cough medicines, superior laryngeal nerve injections, Tesalon pearls, and recently Lyrica, all to no avail. Gabapentin was the only drug that seemed to work. Unfortunately, my cough crept back in along with some side effects. If the gabapentin had continued to help my cough, I would gladly have chosen to live with the unfortunate but manageable side effects versus the cough. I've had many major surgeries and a widowmaker heart attack with a stent placement for which I was given morphine because tramadol makes me violently ill. Morphine, I found, is the only drug that stops my cough. Two weeks ago, I had anterior cervical discectomy and fusion surgery with an incision in the front of my neck. Once off the morphine, my cough returned, causing increased severe pain near the incision and it irritated my esophagus even further in the following weeks. Unfortunately, morphine is not a sustainable treatment. 
I'm afraid I've nearly exhausted all treatment options and would love to help find an effective treatment for me and, as I've recently discovered, so many others dealing with chronic cough. Until my doctor mentioned this hearing, I thought I was alone. So thank you very much for letting me speak today. Um, and I wish the project good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, speaker number seven, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number seven begin and introduce yourself? Please Hello. Hello, my name is Joan Sachs. And any organization you're representing for the record, and you have three minutes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Joan Sachs. I am a patient and no one is paying me. I'm here to tell you what my journey has been like coughing for 50 years. It's embarrassing. It is exhausting. And when I can't catch my breath in a real coughing fit, it's absolutely scary because I'm afterward try, trying to inhale and gasping for air. The only thing that has helped me after all the tests and as the speakers before me have indicated, I, I've had all those tests, the allergy tests, the cameras down my throat, the endoscopies, the sinus scans. Nobody can find a reason for my cough. The only way I lead a normal life is through codeine cough medicine. And I'm afraid to take it because of all the side effects. And I therefore take it. But you have to if I want to go to the symphony. You're not allowed to cough at the symphony if you get on an airplane. Other than that, you're coughing in a public place. And as I'm choking, I can see people getting up and walking away because they don't want to be near me. At night, I sleep sitting up and cough and cough until I take pity on my husband and go into another room. So if there's a medicine out there that would actually take away my cough that I can live with and not have to cough all the time, that would be a fantasy. My fantasy would be being able to sleep and laying down with just a pillow and going to a concert where I know I've taken cough medicine so I can sit there and not sleeping for the first half hour of that concert because the cough medicine knocks me out. So I thank you for listening to me. And yes, any drug that can help and not be an opioid would be very, very wonderful. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, speaker number eight, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number eight begin and introduce yourself? Yep. Please put your name in any organization. You are representing for the record and you have three minutes. I'm just trying to get the camera. Um, no. Shoot. <laughs> Okay. Hi, I'm Mary Ellen McDonough, and I am a patient with chronic cough. Um, I am not being re you know, compensated for uh, my remarks today. My journey with a chronic cough began about five years ago, and this condition has affected every area of my life. By profession, I'm a registered nurse, recently retired, but I worked in the neonatal intensive care unit and the pediatric intensive care unit. And uh, there were times when I questioned whether my cough would be um, would affect the well-being of these kiddos. It was pretty scary. And I also had colleagues that questioned that since I could not get a diagnosis. Because of my the persistent cough and the resulting sleep deprivation, I was afraid that I might make a medication error or forget to do something important at work. I was prescribed cough medicine with codeine to help me sleep. Obviously, this is not a long-term solution. I had numerous visits with ENT doctors and pulmonologists. These visits included CAT scans, MRIs, multiple laryngoscopies, and endoscopies. I was treated with numerous doses of antibiotics and antifungals. I was frequently on high-dose steroids. The use of steroids is not without its own complications. I had three episodes of aspiration pneumonia due to my coughing. In addition, I made countless visits to my pharmacy, hoping that something, anything would help. And I still have no diagnosis or hope of one. It felt like there was always a lump in my throat and my throat felt like it was on fire. 
People complained of difficulty hearing and understanding me. My voice was extremely hoarse. Because of this, I limited my social activities. The unpredictable nature of my cough in both frequency and severity led to both embarrassment and anxiety. I was not only frustrated, but I was also really, really scared. During the time I was looking for a diagnosis, my brother was in treatment for esophageal cancer and subsequently passed away. The thought that I may have cancer was always in the back of my mind. As a medical professional, I feel confident navigating the medical system. I also live in Boston, a medical mecca, and I'm perseverant. Even so, I was unable to find any help for this problem for five years. I wonder whether or not a layperson would go to such lengths or simply give up. My hope is that in sharing my story with you, other folks will not go through uh, having the costly and debilitating course that I have had. I finally found a wonderful ENT doctor here in Boston who diagnosed my chronic cough. He wasn't surprised by it. He identified a paralyzed vocal cord, which was treated with a silk injection. I worked with a speech um, therapist and I adhere to a reflux diet. Despite this, my cough continues today and I wish there were a medication that could help. Thank you. Thank you very much. And speaker number nine, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number nine begin and introduce yourself? Please state, state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. And you have three minutes. Hello, my name is Marlene Bambrick, and I have been a chronic cough patient for 44 years. I'm a retired nurse, and I worked as a care coordinator and registered nurse first assist assistant with colorectal surgeons for a majority of my career. I am receiving no reimbursement for this um, presentation, and I have no affiliation other than being a patient. When my cough was bad, I would and I would be assisting in surgery, I would have to break scrub because I couldn't stop coughing, have hot herbal tea, cough drop, over-the-counter cough medicine. Once I was scrubbed back into surgery, I would pray that I would not start coughing again until the operation was complete. In the outpatient office, I would have to excuse myself from patient exam rooms to go through my routine of trying to stop coughing. When I was on the phone with patients, I would have to put them on hold. I have had to step out of wedding and funeral ceremonies due to the intense nature and destructiveness of my cough, and it was embarrassing. In the early 80s, I underwent a, a full evaluation, which included ENT, pulmonary, allergy, GI, had multiple tests with others that others have already mentioned. I was finally diagnosed and treated for asthma and reflux. I still had intermittent periods of coughing and would be put on a high steroid taper, which sometimes would last one to three months. A friend suggested I see the Institute for Functional Medicine, which I did, and they suggested a, an elimination diet. I was prescribed multiple supplements so I could stop taking the reflux medication, exercise, stress reduction, yoga, meditation, and counseling, all which some of those I had been doing, and I started doing all of them um, with some minimal help. I also tried acupuncture and FSM, which I found was very, very helpful. I was finally, after another number of years, referred to a pulmonologist who specialized in con chronic cough, who ordered another full evaluation, including a lung biopsy. The lung biopsy showed that I did not have asthma, and I was taken off all my asthma medicine and labeled a hypersensitive cough syndrome patient. There was a, This was during the time when the opioid epidemic persisted precipitated rules and regulations regarding narcotic cough prescription, narcotic medications, including cough medicine. I saw a speech pathologist who gave me breathing and vocal exercises to suppress the cough. And despite all of this and treatment, I still have periods of intense coughing. 
My hope is that this presentation will help you understand the intense challenges of being a chronic cough patient, and you will take this knowledge into consideration in your decision making. Thank you for your attention. And thank you so much. Uh, the next speaker is uh, uh, speaker number 10. Please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number 10 begin and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record, and you have three minutes. Is speaker number 10 available? Yes, I'm trying to find the camera. Okay. Very good. Thank you for this extra time. Good afternoon. My name is Suzanne Bookter, and, I'm a, and I am a retired administrative assistant from a local hospital in Norfolk, Connecticut. I would like to thank you for selecting me to speak at this very important open hearing to share my journey as a chronic cough patient for the past 28 years. I am voluntarily speaking, and I am not getting paid to speak. After reviewing my life with this cough, I have decided to share the most impactful times, not to lessen the other emotions. I have traveled several hours to see doctors from Mr. Mass to the Bronx, New York, while living in New Connecticut. In 2015, I was on a high dose of gabapentin, which led to intestinal bobolus, which required emergency surgery. The doctors had to immediately discontinue the gabapentin, which led to two seizures, and were treated as a code blue, and I was transferred to ICU for several days and developed ICU psychosis. I was recently diagnosed with bronchiectasis, and the doctor said this was caused by my cough. In August of 2023, due to the intensity of the cough, I developed intense headaches due to low spinal fluid pressure. I was evaluated by doctors, and they informed me my severe coughing led to the intense headaches and a spinal fluid leak, which was treated by a blood patch. I have found it hard to function a normal life, which leads to a terrible quality of life for me, my husband, and my family. <laughs> Even after all these years of coughing, I still have a feeling of embarrassment, which I am out in the, when I am out in the public. I find it difficult to attend funerals, grocery stores, movies, church, going out to dinner, driving, etc. With the coughing of, of the fear, with the coughing and the fear of coughing. In the past, I was prescribed many different medications, which did not give me any relief. Therefore, I am not on any medication, and I continue to cough every day. My family and I would be ecstatic if I could find any relief for this cough. In closing, I am grateful to be able to share my journey as a chronic patient, and by me sharing what I have endured will help all the other sufferers of this debilitating disease with the help of the FDA. If by me sharing my journey and help just one person and their family, it would mean the world to me. Thank you for your time. And thank you for speaking to us. And next is uh, speaker number 11. I believe speaker number 11 has some slides as well. Yes. Uh, speaker number 11, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number 11 begin and introduce yourself and please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. And you have three minutes. 
My name is Danielle Stroer, and I'd like to discuss the professional and monetary costs of living with chronic cough. I'm in no way being compensated for this appearance. My career is limited to what I can do with this condition. I'm, I'm unable to take any positions that require a lot of talking, um, like interviews or leading meetings, uh, because the more I speak, the more I cough. It's one of my triggers. I've had to excuse myself from board meetings because I started coughing uncontrollably. Um, and you can imagine your face turns bright red. I start sweating. You're out of breath. Um, I've seen three allergy doctors, two pulmonologists, a gastroenterologist, my PCP, an acupuncturist, a speech therapist, and have been to the world-known clinic. Um, this medication is my final hope to lead a normal life again after 13 years. I've had uh, bilateral steroid injections. I've had Botox injections. I have an umbilical hernia that needs fixed, but there's no sense in getting it fixed. It will just be back until I stop coughing. Um, I fear that I'm going to cough so hard that I'm going to get a brain aneurysm. Um, driving can also be scary as I've had to pull over three times during an event. Um, as all I can see are stars and lights and orbs. Um, so I pull over so I don't, in case I pass out. And then all of this is outside of the normal headaches and ex exhaustion from the coughs. As shown in my PowerPoint, at all times, I have to have cough drops, Kleenex, cough medicine, poise pads, and kids' toothpaste on hand. By the end of the day, every day, my bladder is shot. And that plays a huge role on my behavioral health. I'm always wondering if my pants are wet, if anyone can see it. And this is why I limit my social groups. I keep it close to friends and family. So that way they know my diagnosis. Um, my cough wakes me up in the middle of the night at least once. And it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So we spend millions of dollars on doctors and specialists to rule out, you know, if it's a certain medication, is it asthma, is it GERD, is it allergies? Um, and if there's no other explanations, then it, then it must be chronic cough. Um, awareness needs to be brought to this condition, especially due to the excessive burden it places on your daily living and your quality of life, not, the, not to mention the amount of time and money it involves. Um, next slide, please. I provided a short list of my triggers, and this is in no way inclusive. When I shared this information with two of my physicians, they looked at me like I was nuts. Um, of course, none of it got addressed. As I watch this, I hate to see so many people share my symptoms, but I'm happy that I'm not alone um, and that someone else is sharing my journey with me. And to thank all the physicians who are actually taking us serious and will speak on our behalf. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is speaker number 12. Speaker number 12, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number 12 begin and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. And you have three minutes. I'm not representing anybody except myself and I'm not financially being paid. My name is Susan Coulomb <clears throat> and I'm 74. I've had a chronic, chronic cough since my 20s. Living with a chronic cough is very difficult. I've been to many doctors and a voice therapist, just like everybody else that's spoken. I've had all the tests, et cetera. Nothing has worked. The doctors don't know how to help me. When I'm around people who don't know me and I have a coughing fit, they stare at me I, like I have a disease. I have to explain my situation. If I cough hard enough, it can cause me to vomit. It also causes urine leakage. My husband will turn and stare at me uh, if we're in a room to see if I'm okay. I've tried many over-the-counter medications that excuse me, haven't worked for me at all. Occasionally, an antihistamine will stop, help stop the post-nasal drip. No sprays have never worked. When I'm in a meeting or movie, <laughs> sorry, when I'm in a meeting or movie and have a coughing fit, I sometimes have to leave the room. I get depressed from this condition. Um, 
and sometimes feel hopeless. And again, I'm just hoping for a permanent solution. This just <clears throat> disrupts my sleeping. I did go to a voice therapist and the one thing that I came away with that has helped me is she said, start ch chew gum when you start having a coughing fit. That has helped. <laughs> she wrote down that she thought I had laryngeal hyper-responsiveness, irritable larynx syndrome, vagal neuropathy. <laughs> no, nobody has helped me. Nobody knows what to do. And I just pray that somebody comes up with a solution, whether it's drugs, an inhaler, anything to help. This has just really affected my life. And like I said, it, it causes me depression. Thank you for doing a study, and I hope it works. And I hope the Drug Administration allows the medication <clears throat> to come to market. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker, speaker number 13. Speaker number 13, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number 13 begin and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. And you have three minutes. Good afternoon. I'm Nina Zeldes, a health researcher at Public Citizens Health Research Group. I have no financial conflicts of interest. Public Citizen opposes FDA approval of Drefapixin for the treatment of chronic cough in adults. The small effects of treatment with the drug do not provide substantial evidence of a clinically meaningful benefit for patients. We agree with the FDA's assessment of the evidence supporting this application, which is mainly based on the recount of cough data using a proprietary algorithm. Our concerns include the small treatment difference in cough frequency between groups, the lack of compelling additional data from the secondary endpoints, the large placebo response across all efficacy endpoints, and the potential unblinding of the trials due to taste disturbances. For example, while there was a small reduction in the frequency of cough of 15% in one and 17% in the other among patients taking Jefapixin compared to those in a placebo group, um, these results reach statistical significance only in one of the two trials. Moreover, the difference in the proportion of subjects who had a reduction in cough frequency of 50% or more was only 6% between the two groups. The clinical meaningfulness of these results is further called into question by the FDA's post-hoc analysis, which has suggested that compared to placebo, treatment with Jelkovipixent only resulted in a reduction of one to two coughs per hour. As highlighted by the FDA, the secondary endpoints did not provide additional support of meaningful benefit for patients and, quote, must be interpreted with caution, end quote. For example, different analyses of the data demonstrated that there are generally only small differences between the two groups and only one patient reported outcome measure reached statistical significance. Importantly, the FDA found that there was no clear correlation between patients who reported that they were feeling better and those who were coughing less. These small benefits stand in contrast to the disturbances in taste or loss of taste that lasted an average of 204 days. They occurred in up to 65% of uh, subjects in the treatment group compared to only 7% in the placebo group. Because Jefferpixent is being considered for a novel therapeutic indication, there is limited experience in how to best measure and interpret the clinical meaningfulness of treatment effects. However, based on the available data, there is no compelling evidence of meaningful clinical benefit from Jefferpixent treatment. If the FDA were to approve Jefferpixent based on the very weak evidence of effectiveness, it would also set a concerning precedent um, for the evaluation of future treatments for chronic cough. Patients with chronic cough deserve an effective treatment. Public Citizen therefore urges the committee to vote no on the voting question and strongly recommends that the FDA not approve Jeff Pixent. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And the uh, next speaker, speaker 14. Uh, speaker number 14, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number 14 and begin and introduce yourself. Please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. 
and you have three minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Wendy Smith. I'm a 57-year-old, 14-year chronic cough patient, and I have not been made to make this statement. I don't remember precisely when my coughing started, but my first social media post about it was September 29th, 2010. I wrote, if I cough any harder, my organs are going to pop out. After two years of coughing and many visits to the doctors with what we thought was a lingering cough and trying all of the usual remedies, cough suppressants, lozenges, gargling, throat sprays, nothing worked. My cough was still there. I've been coughing so violently that I was dry heaving, wetting myself, and putting so much pressure on my organs that I developed four hernias. Over the next few years, I've had multiple invasive tests, saw pulmonologists, ENT, gastroenterologists, respiratory therapists, a neurologist, allergists, a general surgeon. Nothing abnormal has ever been discovered. I've also tried acupuncture, hypnosis, silent reflux diet, speech therapy, national, uh, natural remedies, and several medications, including benzonates, opioids, Trelegy, Nexium, albuterol, Botox injections into my vocal cords, and extremely high doses of amitriptyline and gabapentin. The physical effects of constant coughing have resulted in four ventral hernias. When I cough, I have to put my hands over the hernias and hold them in to prevent further damage. I also suffer from headaches, pulled muscles, sore ribs, multiple sne sneezing fits, sleepless nights, and everything that everyone else has already mentioned. The emotional toll that this constant coughing has taken on my personal, family, social and professional life is huge. It's restricted several activities at work. Quality family time is always interrupted. My relationship with my husband is forever changed. If I need to go out, I, need, I must make sure I get an aisle seat and know where the exits and bathroom are so I can escape quickly. Out of town travel, especially on trains or airplanes presents quite a challenge. My eldest daughter's wedding is this December 15th, and I am so afraid that I will ruin the ceremony. And I am exhausted. On September 6th of this year, I had a stress-related heart attack. Me, vivacious, energetic, healthy me. The examinations revealed no heart or arterial disease, only stress from dealing with this incessant coughing. The totality of this cough is immense affecting every aspect of my life. After more than 14 years, I am desperate that something be discovered, created, or approved so that I can live a more viable and effective life. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is speaker number 15. Please unmute and turn on your webcam. Well, speaker number 15, begin and introduce yourself and please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. And you have three minutes. My name is Deb and I am a patient dealing with a chronic cough. I'm not being paid to speak today. I have a, I've, I've had a cough for approximately 30 years. After trying numerous ways to alleviate it with my internist for years, I was referred to an allergist, no allergies found, and an ENT. I started on a low dose of gabapentin, which helped somewhat, so I accepted that a cough was something I had to live with. After move, moving to Florida seven years ago, I again worked with a new internist on ways to alleviate my cough. After trying many things, I went to a pulmonologist and another ENT with no improvement. I was finally referred to a cough specialist. I have been seeing him and his staff for 11 months with some improvement, but I'm still dealing with coughing episodes. After trying different medications, gabapentin was increased to 600 milligrams a day, which caused brain zaps, a weird tingling feeling that lasted for a brief second. When the dosage was lowered, these went away. The cough can be triggered by smells, tastes, choking on food, water, but mainly on mucousy saliva that gathers in the back of my throat. A coughing episode can last from 30 seconds to a minute and includes many hard coughs and several big sneezes with a significant amount of mucus. I have these several times a day with no warning on when they will happen. 
Additionally, these episodes have caused um, urinary incontinence. <clears throat> this cough has affected talking on the phone, public speaking, attending worship services, singing in the choir, leading a small group and attending meetings, all of which have had an impact on my life. It has given me a hoarse voice. My family and friends have learned to deal with me excusing myself during dinners and family gatherings. My husband used to be concerned over bad episodes, but now he's numbed to the situation. It sometimes interrupts our conversations, which over time has had a negative effect on our re relationship. A friend who I meet with weekly shared these thoughts. Deb's coughing fits are relentless when they begin. They are so intense, I feel compassion for her. It is hard to listen to, and I know she is frustrated and embarrassed. Deb deserves to have the privilege of being rid of this for the remainder of her days. This cough has taken away my freedom to live a normal life. My hope is that improvement or even a cure can return me to a place so I can look forward to important events, events in my life and the lives of loved ones without the fear of embarrassment and disruption. Thank you for allowing me to share my journey. Thank you. The next speaker is speaker number 16. Please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number 16 begin and introduce yourself. Please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. And you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Karen. I'm a patient. I'd like to state that I've not been paid to speak at this meeting. I've had a chronic cough for almost 20 years. You have heard the same from all the speakers today. How many more out there are living with a chronic cough and hoping for a new option for treatment? I too have seen many local doctors over time, primary care, allergists, ENT, speech therapists, gastroenterologists, chiropractor, even a hypnotist. Many treatments were tried and all that have been mentioned today, nothing helped. Some doctors thought my cough was emotional and wanted to prescribe meds to calm me. In 2013, after 10 years of coughing, I went to the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Several diagnostic tests were completed and several medications tried. Also, steroid shots were injected into my superior laryngeal nerve endings twice, and Botox was injected into my vocal cords twice. Nothing worked. The Botox injections caused me to lose my voice for 10 weeks each time and caused painful coughing and difficulty breathing for most of those 10 weeks. However, Cleveland Clinic hasn't given up. As, as the other doctors did. I coughed many brief and several hard coughs lasting from seconds to about 45 minutes. And I don't mean once or twice or five or 10 times a day. I mean constantly throughout a day. My cough has increased over the years, started as a throat clearing to a quick cough up to what it is now. <laughs> is there a pattern to when or how I cough? I thought about it over the years, but I don't think so. It can come out of nowhere. I cough when I talk, walk, sit, drive a car, when I stand, lay down, when I exercise, brush my teeth, eat, go to the grocery shopping, you name it, and it's probably when I cough. I had to retire early from my job I love, school superintendent, because of my cough. It interfered with meetings and interactions with students, staff, parents, and others. I was an outgoing person before, loved joining groups, Jim, now I'm not that same person. I've had people refuse to shake my hand even before COVID, afraid I have something contagious. Their reactions are very bothersome, but, but I do understand. Coughing is very tiring and can be depressing. I feel alone at times, but I'm very lucky. I have a wonderful guy and extended family and friends who stand beside me. Even phone calls with them or anyone are difficult. I'm tired of feeling I have to leave a store or restaurant because I'm coughing so much. I will be 77 in three weeks, and it would be great to be relieved of coughing or at least less coughing before I leave this world. I don't want to be remembered as the grandma who coughed all the time. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I hope this information helps the FDA understand the struggles of a chronic cough patient and in turn can give doctors another option to treat chronic cough patients so they have better care and a better life. Thank you for listening. Thank you. The next speaker, speaker number 17, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Uh, speaker uh, number 17, please begin to introduce yourself. Please state your name and any organization you, you are representing for the record. And you have three minutes. 
Hey, uh, I'm Dave. I've had a chronic cough for about 25 years. I'm a creative director at a company that does work with Merck, uh, which is how I learned of the hearing. But that said, I haven't worked on any accounts related to cough, and I'm not being compensated for sharing my story. Um, sometime in my mid-20s, I first noticed my cough, and I'm 48 now, so half my life. Um, my cough kind of oscillates between this minor nuisance <laughs> minor nuisance and uh, extreme disruption. Like at its worst, it kind of builds through the day, gets worse and worse as the hours go by. Uh, by the evening, like my head will be pounding from all the rattling. And I often wonder jokingly if I've ever given myself a minor concussion, but I wonder if there's some truth to that one. Um, I've tried to address this off and on with my doctors over the years, but we've never solved it. Uh, I kind of give up trying at this point. I'm just accepting it, you know? Uh, so cough might seem minor to a lot of folks and temporary, but a way to prevent this really would be nothing less than life-changing. Um, when I get home, my six-year-old meets me at the door. She doesn't hear me pull in the driveway, but she does hear me cough when I'm outside. She's worried when I have these coughing fits. She puts her hand on my chest. She tries to calm things down. Um, sometimes she does these impressions of, impressions of me, <laughs> which are a riot, but uh, it'd be really nice if the cough wasn't part of that routine. Um, even though much of the world has kind of moved on uh, from the COVID precautions, like I'm still a masker. And that's really a super understatement because I haven't gone into a public space without an N95 since February 2020. And the cough is my reason why. It's a big part of it. It's not just because I want to get not sick or prevent co spreading COVID, but it's because when you cough this much, you get super self-conscious. And every single cough, you feel eyes on you. Sometimes people are glaring like you know people around you are thinking about it. And this whole thing that you see other folks around in New York City wearing masks outdoors. There are so many people that have compromised immune systems and it's like, I'm so aware of that. Uh, you know, any cough near them is a potential health risk. So this mask is the only way that I can kind of show that I respect their concerns, even though I've got this cough I've had for 25 years. So, you know, on the train the other day, I had three people that back to back left the seat next to me. So. You know, if you ever want to row to yourself, just start a coughing fit and throw on a mask and people stay away from you. Um, at work, like constantly, I'm thinking about my colleagues that are sitting next to this nonstop cough and we joke about it, but it's like, who's coughing in the background? Can you meet your mic? Is this kind of common refrain that it's just part of work when I'm at the office? Uh, and when I'm handling my family, like that's when I'm most aware of it. Like, you know, my wife comes home after a long day. Last thing I want to do is add my jarring cough to her evening. Um, it's not just patients that have to deal with these coughs that won't go away. But uh, but the worst thing is every time my daughter gets sick, I worry that her new cough is the same cough I've had since my 20s. So I've had this so long now, I just assume it's kind of with me for life. Uh, I can tell you that a chronic cough is not just a huge burden on people like me, but it's also a burden on the people around them. So I don't know if the stuff you're working on at the moment is going to be the answer for me, but I can absolutely tell you that um, a remedy would be life-changing. So that's my story. Thanks for your time. And thanks for all the work you guys are doing. Hope you're onto something. Thank you. The next speaker is speaker number 18. Please unmute and turn on your webcam. Uh, speaker number 18, please begin to introduce yourself, state your name, and any organization you are representing for the record, and you have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, all. My name is April, and I'm a patient, and I'm not compensated for my time. My cough started approximately 17, half, 17 years ago. I'm 43 years old. I've seen pulmonologists, allergists, ENT, GI, speech therapist, and endocrinology. My cough can be triggered by anything. I can be sitting, standing, walking, nothing. Um, it, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. It's just triggered at any time. My cough has limited me to social interaction. I'm isolated. I don't like to travel. If I have to travel, I will have to, you know, like sit by a window so I can at least like turn away, have a mask, try to contain it as much as possible. If I go into a store, I try to make sure I know what I want, make it, you know, go in, go out, or I'll have to send somebody on my behalf. It's very frustrating, it's stressful, um, seems like no one understands. It was to a point where I used to carry a doctor's note around. That's how bad it was. I've seen, um, I had various testing such as um, CT sinus scan, I had GIs, chest x-rays, pulmonary function tests. I've been on various medications, just to name a few, triology. Um, I've been on prednisone, hydromate, 
Photonics, Flonase, Gabapentin, and Tripoline. I've been diagnosed with rhinitis, sinusitis, scurv, asthma, COPD, enlarged thyroid, pulmonary um, nodules, also um, vocal dysfunction. Last but not least, um, I did go see a cough specialist. He's been wonderful about a year ago, and I was finally um, diagnosed with neurogenic cough. This has been very um, hard to deal with. Um, I do work for the Department of Veteran Affairs. It was so bad to the point where I asked if I can work permanently from home. I, if, you know, if anybody can, um, whatever drugs or whatever you're, you're working on, I pray that it can be um, some help or give some type of relief because I'm just to the point now that I don't even know if there's anything, I'm just gonna be stuck with it you know, until the day I leave. Thank you for listening and everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. The last speaker, speaker uh, number 19, please unmute and turn on your webcam. The speaker number 19, begin to introduce yourself and please state your name and any organization you are re representing for the record and you have three minutes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rebecca Carger and I am a chronic cough patient and I have not been compensated for any of my comments. I am a retired public health nurse from a small county in Illinois, and I have suffered from chronic cough for about um, 23 years. Imagine having your nurse having coughing fits while she's treating you. It was very embarrassing for me and very offsetting for my patients, I'm sure. Over the years, I have seen numerous pulmonologists, all of whom told me that I probably had adult onset asthma, even though all the, the breathing tests I had did not indicate any form of asthma at all. I was prescribed numerous and very expensive inhalers, all of which did absolutely nothing, except some of them made me cough even more. Finally, I was referred to Vanderbilt Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee, and that was a good hope of mine that I would find help. But they were no help either. Sometimes I thought the physicians were thinking that I was exaggerating or even making it up. That was humiliating. I even had a Nissen fund duplication, which eliminated my reflux, but here I am still coughing. I knew I was experiencing real symptoms and I had suffered much rib pain and numerous pulled muscles along the way. Unfortunately, I found it necessary to do my own research to find a possible answer, and I hoped some relief. After a number of weeks, I found some medical references to something called a chronic cough of neurogenic origin. The description sounded just like me, but now I had to find a doctor who knew about it and could treat it. Again, more research. I finally found a physician who not only knew what it was, but specialized in it. So I wasted no time making an appointment, even though I would have to travel two states away from my home. Since that time, I have been treated with existing drugs, mostly gabapentin and amitriptyline, which have given me some relief, but I also suffer from the side effects of these drugs, which unfortunately includes weight gain and finding the right combination of dosages, up, down, in between, you never know. Those of us with this condition need a medication to treat chronic cough without dealing with the side effects of several different drugs combined and always trying to find a therapeutic dosage. I certainly hope that we can find some relief soon and I really honestly did not know that there were so many people suffering the same way I am. So I'm very grateful to have been here today and heard their stories also. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you very much. And that concludes uh, the open public forum. Uh, we do not have um, uh, additional questions at this point, but we do have a couple of, of issues that we were still discussing and wondered if Dr. Kuhn and Kelso would like to go back to uh, some of the follow-up questions that they had because um, the sponsor is now ready with slides.
Yes, we, we do have the slides available. Dr. Spinner Kelso, would you like those um, brought up for discussion? This is Cheryl Kuhn, and I would love to see those slides if we have time for them. Thank you. Thank you. Allison Martin Nguyen. Thank you. Just to, to remind um, the committee, the uh, what Cheryl, Dr. Kuhn had uh, requested were the cumulative distribution curves for the change in cough frequency by the uh, PGIC slide up. Shown here are the uh, different categories of the PGIC by the uh, percent reduction in 24 hour cough frequency, uh, where we can see that the uh, PGIC does distinguish between uh, de the degree of change in cough frequency. And the second was the cumulative distribution curves of the change in cough frequency by treatment group. And slide up, please. Uh, again, here are the those curves uh, showing uh, in the blue line uh, the MK45 uh, milligram group. Sorry, <laughs> we have it there, the MK number. Uh, Jeff Epixon, 45 milligram group, and then in red, the uh, placebo. And as we've noted before, there is a change across a range of, of percent change in cough frequency where Jeff Epixon does show a significant benefit over placebo. Thank you. And I wanted to um, turn it over to Dr. Barry, who will respond to uh, the comment from Dr. Kelso. Hello, Scott Barry, statistical scientist, consultant uh, to the sponsor, but no other financial interest in the outcome. Uh, slide up, please. Dr. Kelso asked about a comparison of those with taste AE in the two different treatment arms. We showed this on two different slides, but this slide shows them uh, uh, next to each other. So on the left side of this, this shows the population that had a taste AE in each of the treatment arms. So everybody on the left had a taste AE. Those on the placebo group saw a 47% reduction in cough. Those in Jeffapixant saw a 64% reduction in cough with the constant of all of those patients having taste AEs for that comparison. So for, for, for that group, if taste AEs were driving different responses, those would look similar. And Jeffapixan has more taste AEs, but that group stratified by taste AEs would look similar, but you see a large treatment benefit for those, those patients with taste AEs. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now uh, we've got, uh, we're at the se section now that we've got the charge the committee. And we'll now proceed with the charge the committee from Dr. Stacy Chin. Excuse me. Hello, this is Takia speaking. Um, Dr. Cavallo, I, I see that the FDA has their hand raised. Oh, okay. Um, then, we'll, then we'll pause and we'll have the FDA um, make their comments or answer a question. Hi, this is Dr. Lily Javar, statistician from FDA. I would like to uh, make some comments uh, based on the data presented by the applicant just now on the percent change from baseline in the cough frequency. So first of all, um, you know, also to help answer Dr. Kuhn's question, uh, first of all, uh, we consider comparing treatments using percent change from baseline uh, has undesirable statistical properties, so including its sensitivity to influence by the magnitude of baseline value, which is undesirable for clinical interpretation reasons also. So in, for this reason, uh, we consider the absolute change in cough frequency as a better way to look at the cough frequency data. So if we could please bring up backup slide number 99 in the FDA deck. And this is also uh, included as figure five in the FDA background document. So if we look at this uh, ECDF plot, 
uh, we can say that the cumulative distribution function curves display this continuous view of the change in 24-hour call frequency from baseline on the x-axis and the cumulative percent of patients reporting up to that level of change at week 24 or week, 20, week 12 on the y-axis. So looking at these curves, there is overlapping curves that we can observe and minimum separation between them. And in addition, just the comment on the applicant's uh, way of looking at the ECDF curves by the PGIC response categories, one important consideration is that it is not appropriate to just focus on one point estimate, which is done uh, was done by the applicant just looking at the mean change in the minimally improved category. It is important to look at the entire distribution of all the response categories and also maintain a balance of trying to maximize the amount of patients, the number of patients who truly experience a meaningful change compared to those who did not experience meaningful change, for example, no change or worsening. And in addition, FDA has been clear in our guidance for years that it is important to triangulate information from multiple anchors so that we can derive a plausible range of changes that may be considered meaningful to patients. And this also needs to take into consideration of the patient's baseline status. So with that, I hope to clarify um, some of the questions that uh, the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. And so now we'll proceed to the chairs of the committee and uh, Dr. Stacy Chin. Good afternoon. I wanted to thank the patients who provided their perspectives during the open public hearing today. I will now provide the charge to the committee. Next. As you have heard, gefapixant is a new molecular entity proposed for the treatment of refractory or unexplained chronic cough, which is a common symptomatic condition with no approved therapies. This is a novel indication with no precedent for optimal study design or efficacy endpoints. Gefapixant is the first application to be reviewed by the FDA for this indication. As such, there's no prior experience with the clinical interpretation of results for these efficacy endpoints. However, given stakeholder interest in this therapeutic area, your input is quite valuable, not only for the application before us, but also for informing the guidance we will provide to other development programs moving forward. Next. As a reminder, the key findings observed in the pivotal trials were a wide variability in the baseline cough, a high placebo response across endpoints. This led to a small reduction in the primary endpoint of cough frequency relative to placebo with statistically significant results in one of the two trials. There was a small effect on some PRO endpoints and the safety profile is notable for frequent but reversible disturbances in taste. Next. We acknowledge that in the absence of approved therapies, one might say that any improvement in cough is automatically meaningful. However, we must balance speeding patient access to new therapies with having reasonable certainty about a drug's benefit. As noted in the FDA presentations, there are numerous issues and uncertainties that make it challenging to interpret the results and difficult to definitively conclude that the results are clinically meaningful, particularly when patients experienced similar improvements, whether they received placebo or gefapixant. Next. As mentioned in the opening remarks, in the benefit risk framework, the benefit must be clinically meaningful to outweigh both the risks and uncertainties in order to conclude that the benefit risk assessment is favorable on a patient population level. If there is not a clinically meaningful benefit, the product only confers risks, no matter how mild those risks might be. 
It is for this reason that the main question before the committee is whether gefepixant has demonstrated a compelling, clinically meaningful benefit over placebo for the treatment of refractory or unexplained chronic cough. I will now turn to the discussion points and voting question. Next. Discussion point one. Discuss the evidence of effectiveness for gefepixant for the treatment of refractory or unexplained chronic cough in adults. Specifically address the following. The small reduction in cough frequency compared to placebo and the clinical meaningfulness of the reduction in cough frequency. The observed results from PROs and whether these results provide compelling evidence to inform the clinical meaningfulness of the reduction in cough frequency. Potential unblinding of patients due to taste disturbance and its impact on interpretation of cough frequency and PRO results. Next. The second discussion point, we'd like you to discuss the overall benefit risk assessment of gefepixant for the treatment of adults with refractory or unexplained chronic cough, a symptomatic condition. Next. Our final and only voting question. We'd like you to um, determine whether the evidence demonstrates that gefepixant provides a clinically meaningful benefit to adult patients with refractory or unexplained chronic cough, given the small reduction in cough frequency and results from PROs. We ask that you provide a rationale for your vote. If you conclude that there is insufficient evidence of a clinically meaningful benefit, please describe the evidence that could be collected to show a benefit that is clinically meaningful. I will now turn the meeting back over to the chair, Dr. Carvalho. Thank you, Dr. Chen. And the committee will now turn its attention to address the task at hand, the careful consideration of the data before the committee, as well as the public comments. So we will now proceed with the questions to the committee and panel discussions. I would like to remind uh, public observers that while this meeting is open for public observation, the public attendees may not participate except at the specific request of the panel. After I read, read each question, we will pause for any questions or comments concerning its wording. Then we will open the question to, for, for discussion. And so slide two, please. Discussion point number one for question one. Discuss the evidence of effectiveness for Je Jeffapixant for the treatment of refractory or unexplained chronic cough in adults. Specifically address the following. A, the small reduction in cough frequency compared to placebo and the clinical meaningfulness of the reduction in cough frequency. B, the observed results from patient-reported outcomes, PROs, and whether these results provide compelling evidence to inform the clinical meaningfulness of the reduction in cough frequency. C, potential unblinding of patients due to taste disturbance and its impact on interpretation of cough frequency and PRO results. So are there any questions or uh, about the wording of the question? Seeing none, if there are no further questions or comments concerning the wording of the question, we will now open the question for discussion. Dr. Kelso. So um, I think that the analysis of looking at this in mean or median coughs for out per hour and the absolute reduction in that is the easiest to grasp and perhaps the most clinically relevant. And so if we look at the data that says, instead of coughing on average 20 times per hour, you're, you know, 18 or 19 times per hour, that seems not, not meaningful or not relevant. Um, uh, and then you say, well, you know, there, there's a broad range in that and people have coughing spasms and there's other ways that that, even though it's a tiny absolute difference in, in, you know, certain patients, it might be of more consequence. So the other way is to ask the patients, but if you look at the data on the PGIC, the 
um, you know, where they're asked if their cough is, you know, a little better, a lot better, et cetera. Um, and the data that, that just absolutely does not pass the eyeball test. There, there's just no difference in patient's perception of if their cough it decide, however, they want to decide that it's up to the patient to incorporate all those other factors and say if their cough is better or not. And there's just absolutely no difference in the percentage of patients who said their cough was a little better or a lot better uh, relative to whether they were getting the placebo or either dose of the medication. So, um, you know, the fact that the only one of the two studies showed a statistically significant uh, achievement of the pre-specified endpoint is already makes it a little suspect. Then the, the tiny absolute difference with the drug and the apparent no difference to the perception of the patients about whether or not it was effective. Um, I, I think it's pretty clear to me anyway, that, um, that this, this doesn't, has not shown any perceivable, uh, effectiveness. Thank you, Dr. Kelso. And now, uh, Dr. Hunsberger. Yes, uh, Sally Hunsberger. Uh, so I found the public speakers very, very helpful while thinking about this, um, because what I heard them stressing was that it was the episodes and the clusters of coughing that was really affecting their lives. And so this endpoint doesn't seem to capture uh, any reduction in episodes. I think the 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 number that they're looking at isn't isn't really a good measure of that. Um, and so I you know I don't know with the method that they are using to to collect this data if it's at all possible to to look at clusters and is there a reduction in clusters. But my concern with you know if this was approved is that that would kind of establish the, these endpoints as, as the ones that future research would need to. Um, would be allowed to look at. And I still don't think we've quite captured what the good endpoint is um, because clearly, you know, there really is a minimal effect going on. Um, so, so my, my concern is, is just that we haven't, we don't really have the right endpoint to, to establish whether, whether this is a beneficial uh, drug or not. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Kuhn. Hi, Cheryl Kuhn. I appreciate um, the last panelist's uh, very pragmatic approach to discussing the endpoints. And at the risk of getting a little bit into the weeds, I wanted to provide the perspective of, a, of somebody who develops and um, interprets QAs for um, my, my day job. And regarding the first, the, um, the primary endpoint of cough frequency, it does seem like it is a relevant concept to people experiencing chronic cough, at least according to the literature, um, you know, with qualitative studies that have been done, including those that have been done by the sponsor. And it does seem like the sponsor um, did, a, a, you know, did their job in terms of validating the recount approach that was requested. Um, and although the primary cough frequency endpoint did reach statistical significance in one of the two studies, the empirical cumulative distribution functions for the raw change in the 24-hour cough frequency that I saw, they barely separate between placebo and jessifixin. When the raw change was converted to percent change, the groups separate more. Um, but the separation is consist consistently small, and um, the use of percent change certainly has its own interpretation issues because it becomes a, a different number depending on where you are at baseline. Um, so setting aside the fact that there are some questions about how much change would be meaningful, we don't, don't have... Um, even if we don't have the confidence in that, there isn't actually a place on the cough fre frequency scale where the groups separate enough to be able to say it would be meaningful. Um, and just to the point about where the, I think it was a secondary endpoint that was alpha controlled for the 30% uh, reduction in cough frequency, um, that 30% reduction was based on a minimal change on the PGIC anchor. And so I would not consider that an appropriate endpoint. And it would have been better if they, if it had been increased to 50 or 70% based on um, the PGIC anchoring work that was done. Um, and I certainly agree with the agency that 
more anchors and more analysis methods are really needed to, to gain confidence in terms of the of where that threshold gets set. I also do want to speak to the, the secondary endpoints, the other PROs, um, and I'm not, Dr. Caraballo, is that the, the B part of this question? Can we speak to that now, or do you want to do it separately? I think you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. So the concepts of physical symptoms, social impacts, and psychological impacts that are included in the, the Lester Cough questionnaire certainly do appear to be relevant according to the people experiencing chronic cough, and we heard much of that today. But the concern was with the use of the LCQ total score as an alpha-controlled secondary endpoint because social and psychological impacts that are components of that total score they can actually be impacted by things beyond the medication that's actually being evaluated here. So while those data are certainly relevant for evaluating the, um, the efficacy overall and painting that picture, uh, having those rolled into a secondary endpoint seems um, inappropriate and out of order. It should, it, perhaps that should have been secondary endpoint, whereas the physical symptom score would have been better to be an alpha controlled secondary. Uh, further, res the responder definition that was used for the LCQ total score that was discussed at length today, and um, from my judgment, it was indeed set too low at 1.3 because it was based on the minimal improvement group on that PGIC anchor. So it would have been preferable if that responder endpoint that was, again, alpha controlled would have used a higher threshold. So. Um, my judgment of that of that endpoint, even though it did reach significance, uh, it was not something that we should be able to rely upon. Instead, we need to look at the supplementary peer analyses for the exploratory endpoints. And again, they can certainly be used to paint that picture of what's happening um, from the patient's perspective, which is really ultimately what we're trying to do here. Um, if we consider the LCQ total score, because that was what much of the data were presented on, um, thinking about it as kind of the total overall patient experience, if we use those higher responder threshold locations, there does seem to be some separation between treatment arms in P30, but not necessarily in P27. Uh, for the cost severity diary, which didn't have much discussion today, likely because it was an exploratory non-alpha controlled endpoint, um, it does seem to be like it was well developed. Um, they worked with, with patients to develop it and um, has psychometric evidence to support it but it shows modest separation between those treatment arms at the, the threshold of 2.7, which is the one that I would judge to be the, uh, the appropriate one given the data at hand. And then the final PRO in the endpoint hierarchy was uh, cough severity visual annual analog scale. And that scale itself raises some concerns because of the use of a visual analog scale. It's often discouraged because they can be difficult to reliably interpret or to use, especially ones like this one without anchors along the scale. So looking at the entire body of PIRO evidence from these studies, um, the supplementary PIRO information uh, is generally consistent with that trend of a very small benefit with Jeffafix and beyond placebo, but I don't see convincing evidence, however, that these small benefits would be considered meaningful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kuhn. Um, Dr. Evans? Hi, uh, this is Scott Evans uh, from uh, MD Anderson in Houston. So um, a lot of the things I was going to say have been said over the course of the last uh, few uh, uh, commenters. Um, I, uh, I, I share the concern about the small effect size um, and and especially uh, the, the lack of correlation between reduction in cough frequency uh, and the PROs. Um, uh, that said, I also anticipate that there is uh, enough heterogeneity between uh, patients in this population. Uh, the, 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 the groups were balanced, it seems, uh, but there's a very wide range of, of cough frequency um, within each group. Uh, uh, so much so that I anticipate that detecting a statistically significant difference, uh, at least in, in the one trial, uh, is likely uh, to reflect a real and genuine difference. Um, 
I uh, unfortunately do not in any way anticipate that this agent will have the kind of clinical effects that were hoped for in, by the individuals who were presented in the open, in the open public hearing who were, were, were hoping for elimination of their cough. Um, but, um, but on balance, I do think it's likely that we could expect um, at least a, a modest effect uh, in, uh, in, in patients on this agent. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. And Dr. Kim. Uh, Edwin Kim, University of North Carolina. Um, so uh, first of all, I will say that the, the background shared as well as the patient testimony, so the testimonial shared by the sponsor as well as the actual patients themselves uh, are quite compelling. Um, I've also seen these patients in my own clinic and um, I think there's no doubt that uh, there is a need for a treatment for patients uh, with chronic uh, cough as been described. Uh, for this particular case, I'm, I go back to sort of what the sponsor shared as far as the mechanism of the medication itself. So it seems that it, it, it um, uh, is able to stop the actual cough itself by the ATP cough signal, uh, thereby reducing the frequency of the, of the cough. And so, uh, again, we have this gigantic placebo effect here that's not that. So the sponsor shows a small improvement compared to placebo, which in my mind is the drug effect. Uh, so not the 60%, but the difference there might be the drug effect. Uh, at least it seems that way to me. Uh, but giving them the benefit of the doubt that there is this drug effect, um, again, going back to those compelling stories, many of these stories are discussing disturbances with uh, their daily activities and life and, and these other factors. And I would like to think that the uh, the way that the drug works, decreasing the frequency of coughs should correlate with those. And so to not see that correlation uh, is worrisome to me that um, the medication, at least the way it's supposed to be working, is not effective in actually improving those PROs. And so any improvement seen may be coming from some other factors other than the medication itself. Uh, so it's just some of the concerns that I have. And then the potential unblinding, the taste disturbance there, again, when there's such a small effect, uh, as the FDA um, said, it's uh, not that it's necessarily unblinded, but it just creates some uncertainty around it. And if there were a large treatment effect, I think that might be uh, easier to let go. But when the, the treatment effect seems to be on the smaller side, I think any uncertainty just um, is noteworthy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. And Dr. Hamlet? Thank you. Yes. Um, in terms of the cough frequency data and the original primary analysis, I did find it striking that the confidence interval uh, for that estimate, particularly for the 24-week trial, actually excluded uh, the effect size that was seen in the phase to study. And so that to me was important. Um, again, that doesn't mean that there's, you know, not effect there, but um, it was meaningful to me that there was sort of an upper bound on that efficacy effect. And I agree with uh, Dr. Hunsberger's comments about finding the right endpoint. And to me, the lack of um, not even just a PRO data, but another sort of objective measure, I heard a lot in the public um, comment about incontinence. And I know there was another study that we're not reviewing today, um, but you know the potential to refine endpoints, you know, um, along that line would also be very, very helpful in this setting to more directly capture, um, you know, those events uh, that seem to be most meaningful to how patients feel, function, and survive. Thank you. And a comment from from the sponsor. We have Merck, Alicia Halsey. Yes, we're going to have Dr. Philip come to the microphone to share some data on different thresholds. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, George Philip, uh, Medical Affairs. Uh, we've uh, heard interest in different levels of defining a responder. In addition to the 30% reduction from baseline in cough frequency, to also see what it may have looked like or what it did look like at 50% reduction and 70% reduction as other thresholds to define a responder. Uh, we have performed those analyses, uh, which I'd like to share with you now when this slide is available. Uh, what you will see uh, when the slide comes up is that 
by setting a more rigorous level of response required, we see relatively less placebo response and relatively more active response in relation to the placebo response. Um, slide up. So this is looking at the pool. Uh, yeah. When the slide is available, you'll see the pooled analysis on the primary endpoint uh, at week 12 uh, at the 30 percent, uh, followed by 50 percent and 7 percent uh, reductions. Uh, if we can see the slide. Hello, this is Takiya speaking to BFO. Um, Dr. Corvallo, just wanted to just uh, um, make sure that um, that your um, that their the sponsors permitted to show their slides. This is the um, committee discussion, so we just want to make sure that it's okay with the committee with you, Dr. Corvallo, to show um, for sponsors to show the chair their, their slide. Yeah, let, let's go ahead and see the slide because it directly affects the questions being asked. Thank you. So when we bring the slide up, you'll see placebo and gefapixent bars at each uh, level of threshold to define a responder. You'll see gefapixent is consistently higher than placebo at each level. Uh, but at the bottom of the slide, you'll see the odds ratios, uh, in addition to the estimated differences between those proportions of responders, where with the uh, higher levels of defining a responder, we see greater odds ratios uh, associated with the more rigorous definition. And uh, all three of these cut points support the benefit of gefapixin over uh, placebo in cough frequency reduction uh, at different levels that are each meaningful for what patients can perceive as an improvement from baseline. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Corey. Thank you. I, I really appreciate seeing that last slide, um, particularly on the, the um, changes or the separations of the groups um, with higher frequency of reduction. It, it was very interesting. However, though, the small reduction in cough frequency is very concerning especially because a uh, majority of patients can tell when they're on medication. Uh, PROs are all very subjective and they <clears throat> are influenced by the day the patient takes them, the situation in which the patient takes them. And then we always talk about their subdomains. And what we saw here is that the subdomains all varied very much together, really meaning they're measuring the same thing, not something different as intended. So the fact that the taste disturbance was so present in two thirds of the patients, when you have a minimal response, um, and much of that is judged on PRO, it, it's very concerning to me. So um, I think that answers or states where I feel on the question. Thank you. And uh, the FDA uh, has a comment. Hi, this is Dr. Lily Gerard, statistician from the FDA. I need to make a comment, a couple comments regarding um, the applicant's uh, exploratory responder analysis that they just showed. First of all, um, we know that the, the exploratory analysis was based on pool data from P37 and P27. We have made it very clear in our background, uh, background there that we need to review each investigation on its own merits. And second of all, uh, regarding responder thresholds, uh, those should not be based on arbitrary selection. Those responder thresholds need to be pre-specified and with sufficient justification that the selected thresholds represent clinically meaningful change from the patient's perspective. So I would interpret those exploratory uh, analysis with extreme caution. Thank you. Thank you. And next is uh, Dr. Uh, Schwarzoff. I can't get the, there's the cameras on. Um, I am your patient representative, so I have a different viewpoint than most doctors would have. Um, as someone who's lived with a chronic cough for a very long time, um, I understand the need that these patients have. Um, what we would consider or what you consider a small reduction to us might be um, 
extended quality of life um, and be meaningful enough for us that we would take the risk. Um, simple treatments can make a difference in our quality of life, whether that be the social, um, the physical, you know, work-related, home-related, um, because everything is affected by a chronic cough. Any improvement is something to a patient um, that has a chronic, like a severe cough. Um, of course, we want better results. We want something that lasts longer. We want something that, um, you know, totally stops it. But this is a start. So I'm, you know, tending towards um, leaning, um, you know, in the fact that there are so few adverse events, leaning towards, um, you know, questioning if this is the way we should go. Because um, the if if it doesn't work, they can stop taking it. There are adverse events. I've had taste disturbances, severe taste disturbances, and they are brutal. But if the taste disturb disturbance is only minor, then to me, the um, reduction in cough, even if it's a small one, might be worth it. So if the patient takes the medication and it works for them, that's wonderful. If they take the medication and it doesn't work, they can just stop it. If they take the medication and get those adverse events, um, they can decide whether or not it's worth it to them. But the fact that there's no major safety issues, um, a patient is going to be more inclined to um, go with something that may not be perfect, but at least is something in the short term. And hopefully companies like this can continue to work, um, develop more treatments that do have more um, data and do have more treatment. But this is a start. So I want to make sure that you, um, when you're looking at all the data, which some of it I understand, some of it is a bit confusing, um, the fact that there are few safety issues leads me towards um, really questioning, you know, or thinking we should move forward with this. So, and as, I mean, let's see, I've lost my train of thought, sorry. Um, that's, that's the way I'm feeling towards this. So keep in mind the patient outcomes for sure. Thank you. And are there any additional comments from the panel? Oh, uh, and D'Agostino. Thank you. Um, just one final thought on the end point. I agree the reductions in frequency are small and point absolutely taken from our patient representative as well. Um, I had the same thought as you were listening to all of our public speakers that the end point really doesn't seem to exactly capture what the patients seem to be experiencing. Um, and I would love to hear, if possible, from the sponsor of the FDA on whether it is possible at all to capture from the existing data, whether the uh, recordings that we have from this trial um, actually do see that the coughs are happening in fits and whether there is any way that we could analyze that data or whether there has been an analysis on whether the, there's a reduction in coughing fits or bouts of coughing, um, because that seems to be very important to the patients. And then if it's not possible for this trial, I think that's something, as others have noted, that would be very important for future trials. Um, but absolutely agree that the if this is happening, if the coughs are happening in a more steady cadence, that one to two coughs an hour does not seem particularly meaningful to me. Um, and the lack of correlation to PROs is also concerning. Thank you. And Dr. Corey? This is an otolaryngologist who sees uh, three to five patients with chronic um, uh, refractory cough per week in my office. Um, I really very much appreciate Dr. Schwarzsoft's uh, uh, experience and opinions. 
and um, cough as a behavior that if it's non-productive can be suppressed. So the fact that the patients could know when they were on medication would allow them to change their behavior to even suppress the number of coughs. And that's our primary mode of treatment right now for these patients is to change their behavior in response to the sensation. So now they have the sensation that they're on the medication, they can reduce their cough frequency while they're awake. Um, and that's another reason the data doesn't correlate with the PROs because the patients want to get better. So then the unintended harm from this or consequence is that every patient with a chronic cough goes to their PMD and they get this medication. And then we know it takes 24 weeks to know if you're going to really respond, even though you can see by four weeks they're going to respond or not. But patients are stuck on the medication for 24 weeks. I'm very concerned about the unintended harm that could happen from that sort of an approach. Are there any additional questions? We would really like the opportunity to comment. Granted. Thank you. Dr. Smith? Thank you, Dr. Bollinger. Um, there, are, there are a number of things I, I would like to comment on there. I'll perhaps work backwards. Um, first of all, if you look at the graphs on the cough frequency and the patient reported outcomes, nobody had to wait 24 weeks to respond. These patients got most of the efficacy at just four weeks. In some of the phase two trials, we saw efficacy after just four days. So there is, there is not a long wait. Also, I'm hearing repeatedly it said that the PROs do not correlate with the cough frequency. That is absolutely true if you try and correlate the PROs with absolute changes in cough. Patient don't, patients do not appreciate absolute changes in cough. It is not relevant to them, so of course it doesn't correlate. But the sponsor's data shows that the minute you try and correlate those things with percentage change, so the relative change from the patient's baseline, you see correlation coefficients of greater than 0.6. So I just don't think the data suggests that that's the case. And then the third and I think final thing um, I'd like to comment on is this question about cough bouts and clusters of coughing. Um, so we can absolutely um, appreciate the way coughs cluster in these sound recordings. The difficulty that we have is there is no agreed um, definition of a cough cluster or how you decide where a cluster, cluster starts and finishes. That's a substantial piece of work in itself to derive that endpoint. It's something in my own academic group we've been looking at. There are many different ways of approaching it. And the work we've done so far, looking at different ways of clustering coughs and correlating them with patient reported outcomes, we're struggling to find definitions that perform better or correlate better with the PROs than the simple cough frequency. And I'll finish by saying, as I said already, the simple cough frequency and its change relative to baseline does correlate with the PROs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Kelson? Yes, yeah, uh, uh, Can I make a, a further comment? Uh, it says, uh, Surinder Bering. Uh, is uh, the FDA okay with um, industry making a comment at this point? Safety Chin FDA, um, as long as it's pertinent to answering one of the questions that the committee has posed. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to further elaborate on uh, uh, the discussion around the correlation uh, between objective cough frequency and uh, PROs and patients' perception. So, uh, so slide up, please. Um, uh, this is. Um, uh, data from one of the Jeff Pixan trials uh, uh, correlating 24-hour uh, uh, cough frequency and a range of PROs. Uh, at the top is LCQ, the, the total score, and all its domains, and then uh, some of the other uh, secondary endpoints, CSD and MAS. And as you can see, uh, uh, there was a, 
uh, a, a moderate correlation uh, uh, between the two, as we would expect, uh, because uh, uh, cough frequency is just one domain, as we've just heard from uh, uh, listening to our patients, but they also suffer from intensity and impact, uh, that is, uh, and the broader impacts of cough, which is captured uh, by the PROs. Uh, but, but, there is, um, uh, but, but there is this uh, association. Um, and uh, and uh, we could f f further look at this association in a, in another way. Slide up, please, um, um, by uh, by by looking at the uh, different categories uh, at baseline for the LCQ score. Um, and uh, um, uh, the, the first column on the left is uh, is a severe uh, health status impairment as measured by the LCQ. Um, and uh, and uh, and, what, and what we see is a, a stepwise uh, a, a progression in cough frequency scores. Um, and then one final point, uh, uh, slide up, please. Uh, uh, there were greater improvements in LCQ total scores among cough frequency responders. So if I may uh, take you through this uh, uh, slide, uh, on the left is the change in LCQ score. And, uh, and we have, uh, uh, this is pool data uh, uh, from phase two. Uh, we have uh, three categories of cough frequency responders uh, and uh, a 30% threshold, uh, much larger 50% uh, threshold and a massive 70% reduction uh, threshold. And uh, the first point to, uh, to make is, uh, is, uh, is the LCQ improvement was much higher in uh, in those responding uh, with a cough frequency response versus those who did not have a cough frequency response as we can see uh, on the left but then we look across this chart uh, the more the cough frequency the greater the patient perceived uh, uh, improvements in their cough so i i i, I would suggest that there is a a very good link uh, between objective cough frequency measures uh, and uh, patient uh, perception that support uh, the efficacy of Chefepixant uh, when compared with placebo. Thank you. And I'm going to call on the FDA. Thanks for coming. Hi, thank you. This is Rachel Bean, clinical reviewer. Um, I, I just wanted to um, make sure that everyone um, recognizes those uh, the analyses that are being shown about the correlation um, by the sponsor there um, are based on the phase two study, P12. Um, so the cough frequency data that was used um, in those that, sorry, that resulted from those studies um, was not captured by the validated cough counting method. Um, and so we have not um, reviewed these correlations and they're considered exploratory um, as well. And so, you know, I, I think more central to the question that we're looking for the committee to discuss would be um, the, the pivotal trial data based on the validated cough counts. And, um, and again, coming back to what can we make of that data as it um, can inform whether there's a clinically meaningful benefit in these trials. Thank you. Thank you very much, FDA. In the interest of time, we're going to go to Dr. Kelso, and then we'll summarize. So uh, can you tell from the recording device when the patient is asleep? And if so, do we have data on cough frequency during sleep, or at least during sleep hours? Would you like us to respond to that, Dr. Carvalho? FDA, do you have time? Um, yes, yeah, so we, uh, we could also respond to the question if needed. It needs to be quick. All right, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Dr. Bollinger. So you can estimate from the recordings when the patients go to sleep. It's a 24 hour recording of somebody's life. Um, you can't be absolutely certain. It's, it's not the same as a sleep study. Um, what you see is that there's a great deal less coughing when patients uh, are during the night. And the coughing appears to tend to occur during more wakeful periods, which has been corroborated in a much older study in a different patient group, that these small amounts of coughing occur during periods of arousal. 
So the result of that is you see few amounts of coughing. It's very variable. And so it has very little power to um, detect differences, unlike coughing during waking periods. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, try to do a summary of what we've just been discussing. And uh, I, I think everybody agrees that, that this is a huge unmet need and everybody understands the uh, complete discomfort that these patients have and how this can be so detrimental and life-changing for them. Uh, we, again, we're, we're a little bit of um, uncharted territory because we don't have prior experience with the interpretation of these kinds of results. We don't have a good precedent for endpoints. And we are hearing loud and clear that endpoints uh, do need to be rethought and reconsidered. There is concern about the small effect on the cough reduction, and there's been quite a bit of discussion back and forth about the PROs and the, the uh, cough reduction, but that is an issue. Um, again, finding the right endpoint does need to be reconsidered. Uh, there's a very small absolute difference in the, the mean median coughs per hour. Um, asking patients of course, we, we want to ask patients, we want to get the patient's feedback on how they feel and try to corroborate it with, with a standard evidence that, that is, is tight. Um, there's been discussion about how to count these coughs. Should we do the clusters? And uh, we've had some discussion just recently on how, how these can be done. Clusters periods versus individual coughs or coughs that are more widely spaced, coughs that occur at different times of the day or night. Um, the, um, the PGIC uh, anchoring work where we look at the, the data at 30, 50, and 70% uh, probably does need a little bit more explanation. And again, we, we don't really know how to assess meaningfulness when we have this placebo response that essentially mirrored um, in, in the studies, in the graphs, the, the effects of placebo versus uh, gefapixent. Uh, um, the LCQ of 1.3 was thought to be set too low. Perhaps a higher threshold uh, could be considered. A cost severity analog scale may be unreliable. And again, uh, because there are no anchors along the scale and getting something else that has better anchoring to be able to pinpoint uh, effects a little bit tighter would be beneficial. Again, uh, a lot of the panelists did reiterate a lot of the points that were the same. Small effect size, reduction cost and frequency of the PROs and the discordance between them. Um, a modest effect only, but uh, again, the correlation, uh, there's discomfort with the cor the lack of correlation with the effect and with the PROs. And then and the uncertainty. When we're looking at question one, uh, part C, the, the, the uncertainty about the effect about the, the taste alteration. So uh, that is kind of a nutshell of the discussion here for question one. So... Uh, Shall we go ahead and uh, it's about time. We're a couple of minutes uh, for a break, if that is okay. And uh, Takia, you can confirm if that is something that's a good time for, for um, a break at this point, which is on the schedule. Oh, Dr. Carvalho, this is Takia speaking. Yes, it is a good time to take a break. Thank you. We can take a quick 10 minute break. Panel members, please remember that there should be no discussion of the meeting topics to let the panel members during the break. And we'll reconvene in 10 minutes at um, 3.40 Eastern Time.
Okay, thank you everybody and uh, welcome back from a short break. Uh, we now have question two of three and the, the question is a discussion question. And it reads as follows. Discuss the overall benefit risk assessment of Gifaxent for the treatment of adults with refractory or unexplained chronic cough, a symptomatic condition. So we'll open this up for the panel for discussion. Dr. Hamlet. Yes, I had a question, clarifying question, um, just about the question itself uh, for Dr. Chin. And in the charge to the committee, um, I believe there was a slide about uh, discussing the benefit versus the risk and uncertainty of the drug. And so I just wanted to clarify that this question is focused more specifically on benefit versus risk. Um, thanks. Hi, this is Stacy Chin, FDA. It is more focused on the clinically meaningful benefit. However, uh, you know, we do have a question focused solely on clinically meaningfulness. So I think you can consider the, the risk and uncertainties in this question and your discussion of it. Um, because I think the uncertainties about the treatment benefit certainly factor in. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you, and, and Dr. Bakirian? Yeah, thanks. So I, I find it interesting that in the, in the wording of the question, there's the qualifier, a symptomatic condition. And I think that's probably intended to remind us that this is not a directly life-threatening um, condition, but um, I hope it doesn't in any way lead to a trivialization of the the severity of the syndrome that we're that we're discussing because I think we've been very clearly um, informed and we've had many folks highlight the true burden of disease that this offers. But as I think about the the concept of benefit to risk, um, the risk I. Th I assess is really pretty low. The taste disturbance is um, probably tolerable to the vast majority of patients who find their cough intolerable. Um, maybe it's trading one small um, issue for a much larger life compromising issue. Um, I think we saw in the data presented that there was a a percentage of folks who discontinued the medication because of it, but the vast majority of folks with um, reported disturbance um, soldiered through that effect, um, presumably because of um, a perceived benefit. So I think, you know, the risk side of it, I think, is actually quite low. The uncertainty, if we add uncertainty to risk, it, it ups the, you know, that denominator element um, but I think that's it's a really important factor to keep in mind um, as we as we weigh whether the magnitude of benefit um, is meaningful enough to offset what little um, patient level risk there is. There's interpretive risk, but I don't know that that's the the risk that's really being um, highlighted here. So I, I think it's really important we we try to balance these um, as as we work through it. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Kim? Edwin Kim, University of North Carolina. Um, so speaking to this question, like Dr. Picario just mentioned, I think the personal risk of this taste disturbance that's been reported, as well as some of the other AEs that were in the slides. Uh, I would agree. I mean, everything seemed to be reported as uh, mostly mild, maybe some moderate. Uh, so the personal risk seems to be low. Um, again, trying to think about it as a risk to benefit. Uh, we've already discussed in the previous questions um, the benefit that's there, uh, that there seemed to be a benefit, again, questionable about how big of a benefit. I did want to take a second here just to bring up, though, again, I come back to this idea of these testimonials, uh, how difficult it is to live with this 10 plus years of disease for some, maybe even 30, 40 years. Um, assuming many have entered this trial looking for help, 
and then having a 28% dropout rate, um, suggesting there's something maybe off with this benefit risk ratio if up to almost a, a third of these patients don't stay on. Dr. McCarrier mentioned the term soldiering on, which again, if there were a stronger benefit to risk ratio, I would hope that, or I would expect to see sort of a higher uh, number there. Um, and then again, 14% of patients dropping out from this, specifically from this taste uh, side effect. This is a chronic disease. This is not curative in any way that I think has been described to us. So it would be anticipated patients would stay on this for quite a while. So this uh, risk benefit ratio, we're assessing it all for a shorter amount of time for the trial, but I think it might be important for us to also be thinking about it in a slightly longer term. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Any other comments from the panel? Dr. Rank. Thinking about it similar, similarly to the way Dr. Kim is thinking about it, um, the small but uncertain benefit balanced with a mild to probably mild to moderate side effect that seems reversible in just about everybody. If we think about the average person who would enter the study that has a terrible cough that people we've heard from would most likely be experiencing the benefit. Um, placebo. So the, 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 the placebo group had a huge response, and there's a small response relative to that placebo group. Of those people who are receiving that benefit directly from the drug as opposed to the placebo, there's a large number of people who are potentially having a placebo effect or having this adverse effect. And I think that speaks to the importance of having a placebo-controlled study and comparing this, com comparing this outcome to placebo. It would be really unfortunate for somebody who has a terrible cough, who, who, who really built up a lot of hope to take a medicine that has a, a very small effect and may have mostly a placebo effect and at the same time then experience a side effect from something that um, is probably not providing something much more than placebo. So that's may, maybe some adverse effects in the, in, the, in the people who are experiencing placebo effects kind of is another way to think about risk benefit. Thank you. And Emma Dagostino? Thank you. Um, I think I'm thinking similarly to how others have commented. Um, I just want to reiterate uh, the, what we heard a few minutes ago about the, the little bit of pushback on this just being a symptomatic condition. Um, on the one hand, it's it's true that these patients aren't dying of of cough exactly, but we heard the severe burden and the secondary conditions um, that develop. And so I am I do want to make sure it's really coming through to the agency that, um, that we're not kind of dismissing uh, the burden of disease here. Um, and, you know, the, the pain, the secondary effects that can develop hernias, uh, broken ribs, pulled muscle, the so social stigma. Um, I don't want to brush that aside in any way. Um, but also given how severe we heard the effects are, um, I absolutely agree that I would hate to build up hope for a drug that appears to have such, uh, a minimal effect. Um, I also have been thinking about the taste side effects a little bit differently. I feel like a 20-ish percent dropout rate um, due to that AE is quite high. Um, it's true that I don't think there's really a safety concern, but if that many patients are dropping out in the trial, one, if they were feeling so much benefit, um, would they have dropped out? And two, if that's how many are dropping out in the trial, I would expect to see a bigger dropout rate in real world. So um, that has been really in the back of my mind as I've been going through and thinking through this data. Um, I would really worry about what the drop-off rate would be and whether people would really stay on drug um, if this were to go on to market. Thank you, Dr. D'Agostino. And Ms. Schwartz up. Um, I've also been thinking uh, about um, other recent medications that are um, have been in and out of market. Um, so there's the risk 
of the medication, but there's also a risk about um, with the FDA, whether or not to put through certain drugs that are on the bubble of whether or not they have efficacy. Um, some recently have been suggested to remove them. And so we have to be mindful of that. For this particular drug, um, I do not see a major risk. Um, I think we need to also weigh the risk um, for the patients who continue to go without treatment. Um, they're at risk just for not getting treatment. And if this is just a small amount of treatment and also a psychological treatment, then it's something. But I think it's very important to continue to follow this medication, um, follow trials. Um, if it goes right to market, follow the patients and determine whether or not it should stay on the market. Um, and I also think that um, the companies need to find a better solution that does have better outcomes and figure out what those outcomes are. Um, but the risk itself to the patient, I think it should be up to the patients um, because um, it's something that's not permanently damaging. And if they find benefit, they should be able to have their chance at that benefit. And if they find out it doesn't work, then they can easily remove it from their treatments. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Kelso. So uh, I just want to say that I also was very moved by the uh, thoughtful and articulate uh, uh, patients who commented during the public comment period and, and in and no way minimizing the seriousness uh, and the life changing impact of this condition. But I think that having said that, that just makes it even more important that we're careful to only offer people a medication that has a real chance of making a real improvement in their condition. And uh, so I, I, I absolutely appreciate the the seriousness of the condition and the absolute need for an effective treatment. I just don't think that this has been demonstrated to be such a treatment. Thank you, Dr. Pelso and Dr. Hensberger. Yes, yeah, Sally Hensberger. Um, what I've heard is that um, people could go on the, the drug and then if they don't have an improvement, then they could, and they have the taste effect, they could drop off. But my concern is if you look at the curves, the placebo curves go down in the first four weeks, just like the treatment does. And so you won't know if, it, if you're having a placebo effect or if you're having a treatment effect. And so then people would continue on this drug just because that they're having a placebo effect. So I think that huge placebo effect is a real problem given the very small uh, drug effect. And, and I don't think we'll be able to say, oh, they're, they're not getting an effect, so they'll just stop. So I do think this um, this benefit risk is is a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the panel? Hearing none, I'm going to, to attempt to summarize what's been said over here. Again, uh, everybody is in agreement, complete concordance that this is uh, actually a pretty terrible condition. And the uh, situation where it's not just a symptom, but it has a severe burden of disease, other repercussions with other conditions and really affects a person's quality of life. Not to mention just even the social stigma that may go along with this. Uh, yet we want to do right by these patients and we want to make sure that what is recommended is something that we are quite convinced that it's going to help them. So um, there is also the flip side of the coin that we have to weigh the risk for patients who remain untreated they too will have a risk that is ongoing. And uh, the um, there is a small but uncertain benefit balanced with mild to moderate reversible side effect. Uh, uh, a panelist made a comment that a longer period could be considered to watch these patients. And um, again, the concern about the mirroring of the placebo effect in the curve with the drug effect. And are these patients having a placebo effect that is at periods of time more significant than the drug effect? 
Any other comments from the panel? And if not, we'll go on to question three. And question three is a voting question. And the question three is, does the evidence demonstrate that Jafaxant provides a clinically meaningful benefit to adult patients with refractory or unexplained chronic cough, given the small reduction in cough frequency and results from PROs? Also, once you vote, please provide a rationale for your vote. If you conclude that there is insufficient evidence of a clinically meaningful benefit, describe the evidence that could be collected to show a benefit that is clinically meaningful. And we'll open it up for panel discussion. Hello, Dr. Pravala, this is Sophia speaking. Before we go into the discussion on the wording of the question, I'm just going to read the voting instructions to the panel. Oh, please. Uh, thank, you, Dr. thank you, Dr. Carvalho. Question three is a voting question. Voting members will use the Zoom platform to submit their vote for this meeting. If you are not a voting member, you will be moved to, the, to a breakout room while we conduct the vote. After the chairperson reads the voting question to the record and all questions and discussion regarding the wording of the vote question are complete, we will announce that voting will begin. A voting window will appear where you can submit your vote. There will be no discussion during the voting session. You should select the button in the window that corresponds to your vote, yes, no, or abstain. Please note that once you click the submit button, you will not be able to change your vote. Once all voting members have selected their vote, I will announce that the vote is closed. Please note there will be a momentary pause as we tally the vote results and return non-voting members to the meeting room. Next, the vote results will be displayed on the screen. I will read the vote result from the screen into the record. Thereafter, the chairperson will go down a list and each voting member will state their name and their vote into the record. Voting members should also address any subparts of the voting question, including the rationale for their vote. Are there any questions about the voting process before we begin? Since there are no questions, I will hand it back to Dr. Carvalho and we can begin. Okay, and the voting question has been read. And if there's uh, questions about the wording of the question, we can open it up for discussion. If not, then we can go ahead and begin voting. Dr. Stevenson, you're muted. Sorry, if there's no questions, if there's no questions about the wording, we will now move non-voting participants to the breakout room.
Voting has closed and is now complete. The voting results will be displayed. There is one yes, 12 no's, and zero abstentions. I will hand it back to the chair. Thank you. We will now go down the list and have everyone who voted state their name and vote into the record. You may also state the rationale for your vote. And we'll start with the first person on the list, and that is uh, Dr. Corey. Hello. I wish I could have voted yes, but um, <clears throat> the uh, balance of the literature suggests that patients with chronic nonspecific cough will have a response to treatment up to 50%, regardless of the type of treatment you give them. You have a group of motivated patients who want to participate in a, stu in a study trial, and they go through all of the pains. I don't think and, and fit, uh, you have a 57 percent response rate among patients on placebo, the subjects on placebo, and a 63 percent response rate in the patients on drugs. I don't um, think that is a significantly uh, big change over what's to be expected. In addition, two thirds of the patients on medication had some sense that they were on the medication. So that would affect their expression of cough symptom severity or in, uh, frequency. Um, it, it's, uh, and their reports on the uh, patient reported outcome measures. Given all of that, I don't think the, the level of evidence supports that the drug makes a significant difference. It's unfortunate. Um, I am concerned that if the drug is readily available, it could lead to a delay in diagnosis of other things, other illnesses, because cough is, while it can be very debilitating, is a symptom, not a disease in and of itself. And so I think this would uh, uh, delay the, the um, evaluation of the patients for other diseases and could be potentially harmful that way. We need a more objective measure of cough frequency and severity if there's a way of objectifying urinary incontinence and starting with a severe group of patients who have urinary incontinence, perhaps we could use that. If there is a way using the recordings that we could judge cough severity based on volume or intensity of the sound, as well as length of the coughing episode, that might be a way or direct observations of the patients before and then three or four weeks after being on medication or placebo, as long as we could give them a placebo that created a similar taste disturbance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Corey. And I'm next. I also voted no, and I very much had wanted to vote yes. And uh, I agree with uh, other comments the panel members have made, including how huge of a burden of disease this is and how really we do need to Keep trying. Um, getting some endpoints, uh, getting getting perhaps uh, different timings, perhaps tying tying the result of different symptoms, as Dr. Corey mentioned, with cough and urinary incontinence, and um, keeping on with trying to find a, a solution for these patients because this is going to be hugely important. Thank you. And Dr. Bacarier? Yeah, Leonard Bacarier. I similarly voted no, despite my wish to have been more um, positive. You know, I was, I was largely influenced by the inconsistency in the primary outcome after the validation of the primary outcome capture system led the second trial to not meet nominal significance. Um, I think we're really at a loss for what an outcome really would compel us that, that an agent in this condition made our patients meaningfully and predictably better. 
Um, as mentioned earlier, I think the 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 risk profile on the patient level is actually pretty low. I think the I, I wasn't terribly concerned about the risk of unblinding because um, I don't think that was the driver here. I think the driver of all we saw here was a very robust placebo effect amongst a group of highly motivated patients, um, more so than anything else. You know, I think that the issue here really is studying these not quite orphan conditions, but these conditions that don't have robust uh, um, pre-established uh, outcomes. And I applaud the sponsors for doing their very best to, to try to get at this. But I think we um, we need a better outcome measure that I think more completely captures what we've heard throughout the day about the various aspects of this disease. Um, and I, I'm not sure I know what that is, but I do have a sense that this discussion should have um, shined some light on where the sort of clinically meaningful aspects might be. And I think further work to further um, refine those and then study those is important. You know, my heart goes out to this patient population who remain in uh, hopeful for a therapy that would make a difference. But I, I am just concerned that um, we don't want to be providing just hope. We want to be providing predictably effective pharmacologics that um, are likely to make meaningful differences. And I am, like many of the group, concerned that the magnitude of effect, um, in given all the uh, other uh, factors was just less than uh, would have been um, uh, more compelling. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bacarrier. And next is Dr. Garibaldi. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Brian Garibaldi. I, too, voted no. Um, and I think really what it came down to for me was you know, there is a small benefit with some uncertainty as to the cause of that benefit. Um, I think we've we've recognized that the PRO tools in particular we have are, are imperfect and and probably need to have better anchors. Um, I, I think as as Dr. Bercaria and Dr. Curry mentioned, you know, we 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 do need to have better markers of eff efficacy just beyond median or mean cough per hour or percent change in frequency of cough. Um, and I think my hope is from from the data that's already been presented and from the validation of of being able to quantify cough that some of that data may already be available to try to you know better align with pros and really come up with a better assessment of what's what's actually happening in terms of changes in not just frequency of cough but character duration severity in ways that may be quantifiable that that can get around the placebo effect that that we saw um i struggled also with you know the the fact that almost 70 percent of patients um you know, probably knew they were they were having a side effect that happens very commonly in patients on on drug that happens with, in, in many patients within two days of taking the drug, and I think that makes it really hard to to know exactly what's driving that small uh, difference between the placebo group and the and the the folks who got drug. Um, you know, and again, I, I when we were thinking about risk benefit, yeah, you know, I think we would all agree that. This is if you set out to design a drug that was going to be efficacious in this disease, you'd want to have you'd, you'd hope for a much more robust effect um, in a, you know above and beyond what you get from the placebo effect. And and I know we didn't get that here. And and trying to kind of manage that disappointment and and really balance what the true effect is versus the the small risk profile. Um, I think that was really challenging. So this. I wanted to vote yes um, for a number of reasons that have already been discussed, but I think right now the the data is not where where I feel that this should be something widely available and used for patients with this um, chronic and debilitating condition. Thank you, Dr. Carapaldi. And next is Dr. Hamblet. Thank you. I also voted no um, for three primary reasons. One being the overall small clinically or small meaningful effect. Um, 
with the cough frequency. Second was the um, lack of consensus between the sponsor and the agency regarding the meaningful of the PROs. And then third, just the inability to conclude that um, the small differences aren't due to the unblinding. I think when we think ahead in terms of, you know, what data do we need? I think as long as we have a, a, a study drug that, um, you know, is at risk for potentially unblinding, then we need designs and we need endpoints that are robust to that. Um, you know, it, maybe it's taste matching. Um, if that's not feasible, then we really do need to invest in more objective endpoints. I think the PROs are extremely important, but um, when there's that risk of unblinding, we're also going to need to invest in those um, objective endpoints. I think Dr. Curry mentioned, um, you know, is there an objective measure of incontinence and so forth? And I'd also like to see, you know, moving towards consensus on uh, the meaningfulness of the PROs. Um, if it's not these PROs, you know, is there another fit for purpose PRO that needs to be developed uh, specifically for this population? But lastly, I just want to conclude in that um, I, it is very disappointing to vote no. However, I just want to speak to the value of these trials and to everyone who participated in them, because I do feel like they um, provide a roadmap for how we are going to develop these therapies um, moving forward. So thank you to um, our community that, you know, participated in these trials. Thank you, Dr. Hamblett and Dr. Kuhn. Hi, Cheryl Kuhn. I wish that these trials showed that this is the therapy that patients are desperately waiting for, but I also had to vote no. Only one of the two adequate and well-controlled trials achieved statistical significance on its primary endpoint, and the effects appear to be small. Small effects can certainly be meaningful, but there is an absence of data indicating so. I appreciate what the committee's patient representative said in the discussion around question number one, that a small benefit can make a big difference in the quality of life to patients. I absolutely agree with that, and unfortunately, that's where the evidence is lacking. So regarding the evidence that could be collected to show a benefit is clinically meaningful, in an ideal world, I'd like to see interviews done with the individuals who have the experience on the therapy to understand if the changes that they experienced in the cough frequency and in other outcomes were meaningful to them and how so, putting it into kind of that metric of how is this impacting your, your daily life? You're able to get back to the things that you've had to give up um, given your chronic cough condition. In these interviews, uh, you could also gain an understanding of what changes are meaningful on the PGIS and PGIC to inform anchor-based analyses and to, to help inform that discussion in the future between the sponsors and FDA. And then there could also be a gaining and understanding the impact of, in this case, taste-related disturbances and how tolerable the treatment would be considered uh, in a long-term setting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kuhn and Ms. Schwartzut. Well, I voted yes, um, but I will admit I was greatly on the fence um, and I was really wishing there were other options. Um, I am a patient, so I have a different viewpoint than everyone else, um, but I've been debating to myself what level of effectiveness um, does should a medication have um, to recommend it to go to market? Um, with this drug, any reduction of cough symptoms for many patients would be worthwhile to them, as long as the risk is low, which I felt that it was. Um, so um, I wanted to give the patients a chance um, to have give them something that could um, potentially work at least a little bit until the perfect drug comes along, which hopefully won't be that far from now. Um, but I also felt that the medication would need much further study, which is why I was on the fence about voting yes. Um, and it needs follow-up. It needs, um, the protocols need de more definition as we've discussed. I hope that the company and other companies are going to see the benefit of this and see the need and continue to work um, to help these patients because they deserve a cure or at least a treatment and you know sooner rather than later. Thank you very much for everybody who's put thought into this. And yeah, thank you, Ms. Ms. Schwartzot. 
And next is Dr. Kim. I'm so sorry to interrupt Dr. Carvalho. This is Tiki yes. speaking. Just a friendly reminder to the panel to please state your full name and your vote for the record. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. Dr. Kim. Edwin Kim, University of North Carolina, and I voted no. Um, it seemed that particip my rationale is it seemed that participating in the clinical trial provided a benefit, but specifically reading the question of does the evidence demonstrate that Jeffapixent provides the benefit, and that's where I get stuck. With the large placebo effect, it's hard to differentiate how much effect that the medication itself provided. Similarly, the PROs, there might be some benefit, but it seemed to be similar in the placebo as well as in the actual treatment group. Um, and so not being able to differentiate a, a compelling um, difference from the treatment from placebo is, is why I voted no. Moving forward, um, that would be sort of the recommendation is, is there a way to separate out the placebo effect from the treatment itself? Whether that might be in a clinical trial design, I'm not sure if some sort of crossover design or something like that might be able to tease out uh, placebo versus an actual medication effect. Or specifically, there's been discussion about outcomes. And in my mind, I do wonder if going back to actually how the medication is supposed to work. So it's supposed to suppress cough. And so I wonder if outcomes be more built around that. And so perhaps could there be a, a type of study or outcome that is actually measuring response uh, to triggers? So um, many of the patients describe certain situations, triggers, uh, whether it's perfume, dust, things along those lines that would reliably um, trigger cough. And so perhaps that would be a way to really demonstrate that the medication itself, more than a placebo effect, the medication itself is actually making a difference in, in decreasing that frequency of cough. And then perhaps there could be further correlates to sort of the other quality of life type metrics. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim and Dr. Rank. Uh, Matt Rank, I voted no. Um, I I want to thank everybody for excellent presentations, uh, particularly the, the patient uh, patients who spoke at the open uh, public forum. My, my my vote is driven by the small and uncertain um, benefit of the intervention relative to the placebo, the overall small effect size, the uncertainty and consistency across both the primary outcomes across pivotal trials, as well as the uncertainty about the PROs. Moving forward, I had similar thoughts that um, uh, similar thoughts to what Dr. Kim had articulated just before me. That very, very large placebo response, I think, is something that needs to be understood. And I think study design, perhaps run in, perhaps cross over, there may be some ways to uh, either exclude people who are likely to have a large placebo effect and then narrow down the patient selection where you're getting people who have. Um, potentially the benefit from a drug like this or other future drugs and be able to measure that more clearly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rank. And next is Dr. D'Agostino. Thank you. I'm Ed D'Agostino. I voted no um, for all the reasons that we've heard. The small decrease in uh, both the objective and subjective measures were really what drove my vote. Um, particularly when considering the responses paired with a high placebo response um, just were not enough to me to demonstrate clinical meaningfulness. Um, I also was really thinking about the two-thirds or so of patients that experience taste aids, and even though I absolutely agree that this drug would be safe, um, with a 20% dropout rate, in the trial, I'm not sure how that would really translate to use in the clinic if you have a drug with a pretty small benefit and what appears to be a real tolerability issue. Um, and then moving forward, um, as we've heard from others, I think really thinking about uh, rethinking the endpoints uh, to capture what's most meaningful to patients. So rethinking that cough frequency Maybe instead of instead of looking at overall frequency uh, through twenty four hours, looking at cough clusters, um, something to really capture the most meaningful um, manifestations of cough. And then um, I agree that taking a closer look at urinary incontinence. Um, I think in the sponsor document, the sponsor briefing that we had, um, 
sorry, in the FDA briefing that we had, we saw um, language that there was a little bit of skepticism in the use of urinary incontinence as an outcome specific to cough. But I do want to just put it out there that as someone with a different cough condition, um, I would assert that if we saw a reduction in cough specifically, I would absolutely expect to see a reduction in, um, in urinary incontinence. So I would put that as a highly meaningful endpoint, especially given what we heard from the patients today. Um, and then one other piece that we didn't talk about at all today, but that I was struck by just reading all the data was we had 52 week endpoints for all of the PROs, but not any of the objective endpoints. So it would have been nice, especially for the 027 study to see objective data beyond 12 weeks, which of course we can't go back and redo, but, um, I would have loved to have seen some durability beyond 12 weeks. Um, I think that was everything that I was thinking about. Thank you, Dr. D'Agostino. And next is Dr. Evans. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Scott Evans, uh, MD Anderson. I uh, voted no. Um, I uh, am surprised at the, uh, the the outcome of the vote, you know, how dramatic it is considering how much I uh, struggled with this vote. Um, I do think that uh, the, the count data uh, is likely valid. And I do think this agent likely does something. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I struggled with the small effect size relative to the placebo effect and the apparent lack of correlation, at least clear correlation, um, uh, with the PROs. Um, and that's what drove my vote. Uh, I am a, a Pulmonary clinician, I see patients with chronic cough. I understand the need. I am sympathetic uh, to the folks that uh, presented today. Um, but I do want to be careful and resist my own urge to, to think that something is better than nothing, uh, because I think we are establishing precedents here. And if, if we uh, adopt the wrong um, uh, markers and, and outcomes, I, I think we actually may limit our ability to identify the best drug. Um, and that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Next is Dr. Hunsberger. Uh, Sally Hunsberger. So I, I everything that's been said, I, I totally agree with. So I, I will just go rapidly through. I, I just want to thank the sponsor for uh, doing this study. I think you know all of them were were really well designed studies. Unfortunately, the placebo effect was so large that it made it difficult to to really be able to interpret the data. I appreciate the speakers and and it really helped me to to understand the problem. So and the FDA's report I think was really helpful. So so I think you know the science here is really strong. I I hope that this no vote doesn't discourage the um the continued search for for treatments for this population. So I and I do think that what we need is is better endpoints that that better match what the uh, the the public speakers said were, were the issues, and maybe then we will be able to see it an effect. Um, so th that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hensberger. And last is Dr. Kelso. So uh, John Kelso at Scripps Clinic, uh, I voted no uh, because the uh, pre-specified uh, primary endpoint was achieved in only one of the two studies uh, because the absolute uh, treatment effect, the, the difference in cough counts was so small that it is likely not of clinical significance and in terms of trying to assess that clinical significance, I found the uh, patient global impression of change data to be um, most relevant where there was a virtual overlap between treatment and placebo. So it, it appeared that the patient's assessment was in fact that, they, that, that you know, there really was no difference in getting the drug versus the placebo about whether their impression was if, if they had had an improvement in their cough which then casts doubt on that tiny uh, absolute uh, measured difference. Um, the, I, I think that the comments that have been made about other parameters that might be studied going forward are all appropriate, but I also think that had this drug been more effective, 
we would have seen it in the data that was collected. So I, I think the right kind of data is being collected in terms of counting coughs and um, uh, patient cough, uh, you know, the, the patient reported outcomes in terms of these cough scales and whatnot. So I, I think if this medication had been more effective, it would have also been more apparent even in the data that was collected in this uh, study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelso, and thank you so much to the FDA uh, and to the sponsor and to the, the panelists who were very thoughtful. They did a lot of due diligence. And all in all, we all agree that this needs to be something that we continue to need to pursue because we all know that these patients are highly uncomfortable and that their quality of life could be improved. Thank you very much. And before we adjourn, are there any last comments from the FDA? Yes, thank you, Dr. Carvalho. This is Stacey Chin, FDA. I just wanna take a moment to thank everyone for their participation today. We recognize that chronic cough, refractory cough has incredible burden on patients and we share everyone's goal of wanting to make safe and effective therapies available. And it's always disappointing when the results don't quite turn out as you would like. Um, but we know it takes a lot of time and um, attention to participate in these advisory committee meetings. We really appreciate the thoughtful questions and discussions today. And we will take that into consideration in our review of this application and those going forward. Um, and we, we also found the um, open public hearing comments from the patients incredibly informative for our uh, review of this application, and other applications going forward as well. So thank you again for your participation. We will now adjourn the meeting. Thank you.